Come to order. Roll call. Hansen? Here. Meek? Here. Myers? Here. Peterson here. Ray? Here. Williams? Here. Weininger? Here. And before we do the Pledge of Allegiance, if we can have everyone just stand for a short moment of silence. Uh, our next board meeting will not be until the 10th of May, so in recognition of the third anniversary of the STEM shooting on May 7, 2019, uh, I'd like to have a moment of science, silence for our brave hero that day, Kendrick Castillo, who was protecting the students and the staff at that school. Thank you all. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Over to our superintendent for the DCSD spotlight. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have some really special recognitions tonight. We will be celebrating the 2022 Daniels Fund Scholars. In order to, yeah, let's give a round of applause for that. This is a very serious scholarship. The Daniels Fund Scholarship provides a four-year college scholarship to students who demonstrate strength of character, leadership potential, a commitment to serving their communities, academic performance or promise, a well-rounded personality, and emotional maturity and stability. So it's a high bar, and these kids have met that bar, and we are so proud of them. So I'm going to call each of you up. Um, if you could come up with your principal and your executive director of schools, if they're available, um, and have you come up, we'll give you certificates. We'll get everyone up here, and then I'm going to interview you. I know. It won't be scary or anything, I promise. All right. Um, so first, our first scholar is from Castleview High School. Samantha Wendell, will you come up here, please? What an accomplishment, Samantha. Thank you, Samantha. And Samantha is joined by her principal, Rex Kaur. So Rex, why don't you stand right behind her? Fantastic. OK, our next, uh, our next scholar is from Chaparral High School. Jade Gromer, come on up. Dave, we are so proud of you. Congratulations. And President Peterson has your certificate here. Jade is joined by Greg Gochi, her principal, and Danny Windsor, the EDOS over that area. All right, next we have from Highlands Ranch High School, Hannah Becker. She was not able to join us this evening. However, um, she will be, uh, her assistant principal, Julia Cayley, is here to accept it on her behalf and to say a couple of words about Hannah. So let's just hear a little bit about Hannah and then we'll give her a quick round of applause. Thank you. I am so proud to be here tonight to accept this award for Hannah. Uh, she's very involved with all things at Highlands Ranch High School. She has taken a challenging four-year curriculum at, high, at our high school, and currently this semester, she's taking four AP classes, which, as most of you know, as a senior and you're getting ready to leave to go to college, that can sometimes be very challenging. Um, she's involved with our student government, FBLA, um, National Honor Society, and Mu Alpha Theta. She right now has logged 658 community service hours, and we are so proud to have her be part of our Falcon family. For Hannah. Thank you. And our fourth recipient is from Mountain Vista High School, Tabitha Reading. Congratulations. <laughs> Tabitha, congratulations. Here, yeah, why don't you head over there? And she is here with her principal, Mike Weaver. 
Okay, first of all, ladies, we are so proud of you. What an incredible accomplishment. So I wanna know a couple of things. One, what are you going to do with your four-year scholarship? And what does it mean to you to have won the scholarship? Thank you. First of all, I'm so incredibly honored to be here today and recognized as a Daniels Fund Scholarship. But more importantly, this scholarship is an opportunity for me hopefully in the future to give back to other kids just like me. I am hopeful to oh. study and continue to do philanthropy um, as I grow, get my education, but I am more just honored that I would have an opportunity to meet so many incredible people and further give back to that and my community with that time. Thank you. Before we, I don't know which one to use, before we move on, Mr. Gochi, do you have anything you would like to say? Uh, wow, when you read off the list of attributes that a Daniel Fun, Daniels Fund scholar has. Jade came to my mind as a picture of that. She, uh, she has an incredible number of community service hours, like 250 some community service hours. She's uh, a member of our cheerleading team. She's student body president and just does an amazing stuff around our school, 4.1 GPA. So she's the epitome of what we hope to have at CHAP and I'm so thankful for you, thank you. Another round of applause for Jane. Thank you, Greg. Okay, Samantha's turn. Why don't you tell us what this means to you and what you're going to do with your scholarship? Um, it really means a lot to me to be able to um, go to college and um, be able to um, not be in as much debt as I would originally have been in. <laughs> um, but I plan to um, go to school for chemical engineering, and I would really like to eventually be able to help other girls in STEM um, go on the same path. That's awesome. As a former girl in STEM, way to represent. Rex. I'll just throw in a tremendous leader, outstanding character, and, and Samantha demonstrates a tremendous commitment to her community. 4.29 GPA, multiple AP classes, concurrent enrollment classes, just an outstanding kid, and we've certainly enjoyed having her as a part of the Castleview community. Congratulations, Samantha. Okay, Tabitha, it's your turn. So what does this mean to you, and where will you be going? Well, this means absolutely everything, and I'm so excited to be a part of the Daniels Fun community and just give back and meet you know, really powerful people. Um, so I'm so excited. I will be attending Belmont University to study um, business marketing and possibly majoring again in uh, fashion design. Um, I would like to thank a few people who've just helped me and got me here. Um, Platte River Academy, Miss Bonner, Mr. Weave, uh, Miss Bonner, and Miss um, Miss Bonner, Dr. Stephen, sorry. Dr. And then, of course, my Vista family, Mr. Weaver, uh, Miss Jaffe, Miss Bachman, and um, Miss Thorin, of course, the best counselor ever. And really, my family, they're my everything. My mom, my dad, you know, watching over me in heaven. Tatum, my older sister, Talia, Tavia, TJ, and Tag. Um, and happy birthday to my mom. So thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. And Principal she, Weaver. Yeah, thank you. She covered it there. Um, I've known the readings for a long, long time, and they have uh, certainly traveled an interesting path to get to this point. And, uh, you know, you read the things about scholarships coming up. I think T could get all of them. Give her, give her the Missy Martin. Give her the Perseverance. Give her this one, whatever. Give her the greatest person in the world scholarship, and <laughs> she's deserving. So love this family, and I'm so proud of her. Thank you. not working. All right, we are going to take some pictures before I let you guys go, but we are just so very proud of you. Parents, feel free to jump in. You know what, and congratulations to the parents too. It takes a lot to raise amazing kids. Thank you girls, really amazing, thank you. Congratulations, sweetheart.
Oh, thank you. Congratulations. And that concludes our student recognitions. President Peterson, thank you. Okay, moving on to item number four, acceptance of agenda. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the agenda as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Williams, second by Ray. We'll now take the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Okay, and on to the superintendent reports, uh, turning it back over to Superintendent Kane. Okay, I just want to provide a couple of quick updates before introducing um, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt. Um, we got a lot done over the last couple of weeks, so we have done our um, organization where we have our organization chart finished and our open positions posted and we've communicated with our system about that. So we're very excited. I also wanted to let you know that a letter went out today to our um, families with students with special needs as well as to our educators working with our special needs students. And that letter um, talked about the hiring process for the executive director of special education. It was from myself and Deputy Superintendent Hyatt and how we are asking for their um, feedback in the process and, and how our families and our staff will be involved in the process. And I'd love to thank uh, Deputy Superintendent Danelle Hyatt for putting all that together. So those are a couple of quick updates. And with that, um, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt, you wanna take over for the NARCON update. Good evening, directors, Superintendent Kane. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kelly Smith and her team uh, to please come forward to provide the board an update in regards to Narcan. I want to introduce the, the wisdom behind me here. We have Celia Flanagan, who is our nursing coordinator, who is retiring in just a month, and we're so sad. And then we have Mary Evanson, who is going to be our new nurse coordinator, and they're going to help with this very short presentation today. So, yay. All right, we wanted to do a quick rationale as to why we wanted to um, have the process of naloxone in our schools, commonly known as Narcan. So we know that this is a reversal drug to help with opioid overdose, and we know that that is something that's happening within our communities and an increase right now, especially with fentanyl. We do have our Healthy Kids Colorado survey from 2019. We don't have the current data in. It is coming in at the end of the month, and we'll be looking at that too. But we do know that our school-age kids do take non-prescription medication, and there is a chance of an unintended overdose. And we know that our schools are the hubs of our community, and we would like to provide that um, opioid antigen to our community if that were to happen in one of our schools or on one of our school properties and have that available. And we also know that naloxone is 100% safe. There are no side effects to that. And if it's given and it's not needed, there are still no side effects to that. So I'm going to turn it over to Celia, who's going to talk about the timeline and then the process to get it into our schools. Thank you for letting us speak tonight on this really, really important topic. So we're just gonna go over this quickly. So the first step obviously is the board approval of um, what the policy change on our um, JLCD policy. So once we obtain that, then I'm going to go ahead and get a, a standing order for naloxone and that comes from CDPHE because Douglas County School District, we don't have our own physician on our board to give us that. So um, that's a process that I've um, started and I have all the applications once we get the go ahead for this. Um, so we'll put in our application um, as soon as we get the approval to go ahead and then CDPHE will confirm the eligibility of our district and our schools um, to receive this free um, naloxone. And then I will go ahead and put in the order and then it will be delivered to our schools. And then this would be our implementation plan if we go forward with this. So 
August of 2022, it will be stocked. We um, are asking for it to be in all of our schools, including our charter schools. Um, and it is gonna be stored in our EpiPen lockers, which we have in all of our schools. So it will be an, another emergency medication that will be stored in the same place. And then um, we will be providing training to all of our staff at all of the schools on what to watch for, how to give this medication. Um, in the first quarter of 2022, and that will be done by the school nurses. We'll be doing that at all other buildings. So that's basically it. Um, any questions? Another question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Director Ray. Um, do our SROs carry uh, right now? The SROs do have um, Narcan. Um, a lot of them keep it in their cars. Um, we look, looked into that, um, so it isn't as readily available, and they're not always at the school at all times, so, but they do have it available to them. And in our current situation, are police officers able to administer that? Superintendent Kane, um, without our updated policy, is that still allowable? Yes, as I understand it, our school resource officers under their own jurisdiction are able to um, administer the medication in an emergency. Right, right. And I just, uh, off comment, Celia Flanagan, how long have you been in our district? <laughs> I mean. 22 years. We owe yeah. this individual a boatload <laughs> of gratitude, appreciation. She navigated <laughs> through some of the hardest times Thank through you. our COVID, so you will be missed. So Thank I just you. wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. Okay. Other directors, Director Hanson. Um, I just have nothing but gratitude as well to our community and as well um, to, to each of you who have been working on this. I was not aware, um, perhaps naively, but I've learned so much over the last few months when feedback from our community started pouring in. And um, just as a, a parent, I've learned so much. Um, we've added Narcan to our first aid kits. Um, and I'm just wondering, I know our students are learning about this in um, health classes, but I do feel like there is an enormous opportunity to educate parents. I was one that definitely needed more information. Um, so thank you for all of your works and just an idea to possibly continue with some other learning opportunities. Superintendent Kane. There is, um, there is actually an opportunity next week. Uh, Douglas County is hosting, um, they are hosting um, an event around fentanyl and the uh, effects of that. And so I think um, us and working with the county, we will continue to make sure that we're educating our community and, and getting the word out there. Thank you for that. And superintendent stole my thunder, but that event is a town hall, both live and virtual. It'll be May 3rd at 6 p.m. It'll include our county commissioners, our sheriff, and our DA. And it is really awareness of the larger issue with fentanyl going on in Douglas County, which extends beyond our school district. One other quick comment. This is a great case of uh, parents. This was a very bipartisan issue. We had a lot of parents write in about the concerns very politely for the board and asked us if we could do something. We expedited this through the superintendent. And this is a great example of, of parents engaging the board and the board being, being able to react. So thank you to all the parents and community members who wrote in about this issue. Any other directors? Director Meek. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for moving so quickly and um, updating the policy for us to take a look at and everything. Um, and I'd just like to say, I think we should say nonpartisan as opposed to bipartisan. So just words matter sometimes, so thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith and company. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, next up we have um, financial well-being. So our 2022-23 budget updates. As a reminder, you will get yet another budget update in May. Um, CFO Kataska will introduce this and get it kicked off. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so again, this continues our series of, of budget conversations. Um, our goal throughout the process is really to sort of give this information in more digestible chunks rather than the marathon of going line by line, department by department, um, as, as we have done in the past. So 
Tonight we will continue that journey. Uh, Ms. Doan should be with us remote. That was our compromise. She's not feeling well. Uh, and so the only thing I could get her to do was join remotely instead of joining us uh, in the boardroom here tonight. So, Mark, is she there? She is online. Yes, I am here. <laughs> All righty. So tonight we're going to go through, again, sort of keeping it high level before we really uh, dive into the weeds over the next couple of sessions. Um, Colleen will give an overview of our available resources and our current budget assumptions heading into next year, um, looking at discretionary versus non-discretionary budget requests and talking a little bit about that on the DBB side. Um, uh, looking at our budget increases to schools. So we've got some, some changes there as well. Uh, and then as we started uh, last year, we, we embarked on what is more of a priority-based budget process as opposed to truly a zero-based process. Um, and we're sort of still in that hybrid mode where we are you know, really um, scrutinizing each and every line in a budget. But um, rather than only tying the new request to strategic plan theme, we have asked for um, just about the entirety of the non-personnel um, related requests uh, or budgets to be tied to our strategic plan theme. So Colleen will talk about that as well. Uh, going through the overall increases that are being requested for our departments. Again, not going to dive into department by department and line by line for tonight. Uh, and then wrap us up with a little bit of a brief timeline about where we're headed. So with that, I will turn it over to Colleen. Colleen, if at any point a coughing fit hits you, I can take over. I promise. All right. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure what slide you're on in, in the boardroom, but we should be on slide three. Um, if I can... Um, can't see that, but um, this, what you have in front of you should be an overview of the available resources and budget assumptions. Thank you. Um, and so the first thing to highlight here is the per people revenue. So when I presented increases to revenue to you two weeks ago on the 12th, we were looking at a PPR of 9110 at that point in time. So the School Finance Act, uh, fortunately, was introduced um, in the period of the last two weeks. And it was introduced with a unique PPR for DCSD of $9,192. So this change in two weeks represents an increase of $4.9 million to be retained by DCSD after the pass through the charters. And this is due to a statewide budget stabilization uh, factor of now $321 million, which is only 3.7%. And overall, DCSD has seen um, from final 21-22 PPR to proposed 22-23 PPR, an increase of 6%. So, um, you know, obviously inflation is, is high, so there's costs associated with that that we will all experience, um, but that is a, a hefty increase from a percentage standpoint. The information related to enrollment and funded pupil count is the same as what uh, we discussed two weeks ago, um, so I'm not going to go through those details again, but happy to address any questions on them. And then as we talk about compensation, I want to highlight a few key areas of our budget where we are really um, emphasizing additional resources and looking at that side by side compared to where we were a year ago uh, when the board adopted the budget back in um, June. So on compensation, um, the Board of Education has approved the new license compensation schedules back in March, and that has an estimated implementation cost of about $24 million. Plus, we've set aside a pool for non-license that totals about $10 million. Still have a bit of work to do to um, finesse those amounts, um, you know, by employee group out of our non-license. It's a lot of different position types, but you can see there... Um, combined about $35 million dedicated towards increased compensation to our existing staff. So we're not talking about new positions there. Compared to last year, we gave the equivalent of a 4% minimum for a total of a little under 16 million. So we have more than doubled what we're putting into um, increased compensation for our existing staff. When we go to our benefits, um, in March, the Board of Education also approved um, adding the Colorado Doctors Plan with the switch from Cigna to United Healthcare. So um, that has been identified there. And again, emphasizing that um, both of these years um, presented here, $0 increase to the employee portion of premium. So yes, employees may choose to select a new plan 
but the plans themselves will not see any increases to the employee paid portion. Any increases are absorbed by the school district. Para um, is having both a employer and employee percent increase. This is not within DCSD's control. This is set by the state. This is in law. So a half a percent applied to each of those rates, while last year only the employee rate increased. Um, this is important because that um, does, absent other changes, affect that take-home pay and then what the district is responsible for paying. And then the final thing I wanted to provide as a driver is those available unassigned reserves. So we talked at length about the reserves two weeks ago, but just wanted to draw this again to your attention because we are in our unique situation this year of having ample reserves. And you can see that difference year over year of we'll have 75 million estimated carrying over from the prior year, while last year um, we were estimated only carrying over 23 million. Next slide, please. So as we go into the expenses, and the rest of this presentation is going to focus on the expenses, I want to first set the stage of explaining the different types of expenses we have in terms of the restricted uses of expenses. So before we get into whose budget it's in, whether it's a school budget, a department budget, or something centrally managed, we first have to determine whether it's discretionary or non-discretionary. So non-discretionary um, may refer to pre-negotiated finalized contract renewals or other items that the district is obligated or committed to pay. And it, that could include prescribed staffing allocations or per pupil dollars that align with federal, state, or local regulations. So there's varying reasons for something to be non-discretionary, but the general rule of thumb is once that's budgeted, it's not something that can be flexible to change subject changes to the reasons that made it non-discretionary. So um, we actually, as we look here, um, have more increases to non-discretionary overall than we do to discretionary. And the main reason why is because we've categorized the license compensation schedule implementation as non-discretionary. Ongoing, this wouldn't be a non-discretionary increase, but I've labeled it here because the Board of Education has already made the commitment that we are implementing the new um, license salary schedules. And this is the estimate of what that will cost for the implementation on our existing staff. So that fits into the category of a um, district commitment to pay, um, while that otherwise wouldn't have been considered non-discretionary. So within these other categories, um, with, I'll, I'll talk more to our school budgets, but that first line set based budget, um, their increases were distributed between the two categories there. So um, I'll speak to that more in a later slide. Um, the para rate, this is the district's share of the half a percent increase that is going into effect. And the medical benefits, those are considered to be non-discretionary because um, that commitment has already been made to switching carriers and open enrollment for medical um, benefits starts um, in the beginning of May. So it's right around the corner there. And then um, the non-license, that is in the discretionary because no decision has been made yet and no formal recommendation provided on pay increases for our non-licensed. And then we get into uh, the department items. So out of our department items, and again, more detail um, can be provided on later slides, we have a mix of discretionary and non-discretionary. So examples of department non-discretionary would be items like our SPED out of district tuition, our SRO contracts, or any other contracts such as custodial that have already been signed and those rates locked in with the vendors. And then everything else kind of fits into the discretionary bucket. Any FTE on a department side is always categorized as discretionary, so any staff. And then our district-wide, those are areas that um, may be department managed um, in terms of the actual contracts themselves, however, are centrally funded and not considered to be part of the department's budget. And that is areas that will benefit the entire school district. For example, utilities. Our utility budget is managed by O&M, but it is not purely to the benefit of the O&M department as every single physical building has its own utility spend that's recorded at each site. So the major um, contributors there are all 
non-discretionary. So that's utility rates increasing. And then some of our software that's district-wide, like Google, Microsoft, Workday, Infinite Campus are um, seeing increases. And then the final line is Schedule A. So a partial restoration of the middle and high school positions, as well as adding for the first time a Schedule A to support some of our elementary schools. Um, and so can um, answer any questions related to more specifics of the discretionary versus non-discretionary. But before doing that, I wanted to walk through some more details on schools on the next slide. So our schools are seeing an increase to their SPB next year, both in terms of um, increasing the allocations themselves to have greater FTE in some areas, greater flexibility um, in terms of how some allocations can be used, but also to maintain that purchasing power for just what our annual pay increases. So before we get into those details, I want to first emphasize that a year ago, we were talking about implementing a brand new formula for our school budgets. We implemented that and have lived through it through the entire 21-22 um, school year. We've continued to meet as a budget steering committee throughout this fall and revise and adjust the formula based upon steering committee and other school feedback. So the revisions made for the second year, which were implemented in January, were based directly upon feedback from the sites, um, principals, um, department staff, et cetera. And so the enhancements we made focus in a few key areas. First, we redesigned the small school factor in order to benefit more schools. So we really started from scratch with this allocation and determined that in order to provide an allocation that made more sense to our schools and reached a greater number of schools that we considered small, we needed to increase that allocation. So we added about 375,000 into that allocation. Next, we returned our certified substitutes to be a non-discretionary allocation, meaning that schools wouldn't be penalized um, unresponsible for the exact cost of their subs. It was given to them as part of a non-discretionary allocation. And so they wouldn't have to plan for that. And so that was um, a big feedback from um, many schools around the district. So that was about $3 million that was put back into non-discretionary. Um, so again, it's restricted dollars, but it at least um, provides that kind of safety net for our schools when it comes to certified substitutes. I talked about purchasing power earlier. So what that means is that when we have our pay increases annually, that affects the average salaries of those positions. And so we look to see how much will it cost us in order for schools to be able to staff the same number of staff, all else held equal, same size schools, same demographics with those higher salaries. So we pushed almost $10 million into the SPB in order to hold that purchasing power flat. And I wanna keep in mind, this is retroactive. So schools budget on average salaries, not actual. So they're not, um, they're, it doesn't contribute to their carryover. They're not penalized for someone making more or less than the average. Um, however, since it's retroactive, these were the pay increases um, that went into effect last July. It is not looking forward to the new license compensation. We will see that get caught up in the SVB this upcoming year for um, the 23-24 budget development. Our next one is a great celebration is we've been able to increase our mental health allocation for all schools so that um, at a minimum, our schools receive a 1.0 full-time equivalent mental health allocation. This is gonna be funded through ESSER. These are some of our federal funds related to COVID, um, which means that is a one year only allocation for that increase, but uh, desiring to find a permanent source of funding for that in order to continue it. And that's a little under $900,000 to implement that increase to our mental health staffing. And then finally, our alternative schools. So these are district run schools that do not budget off of a site-based budget saw an increase of approximately 1.4 million um, for a combination of positions, pay, and minor operational increases. So overall, our site-based budget is uh, the largest single chunk of our general fund. It is proposed to be 373 million this upcoming year. 
So this would represent a 2% increase from the current year, despite the fact that we have 837 students projected to decline in enrollment. So um, that 837 students relates, um, is directly related to a 4.9 million drop in um, just the base for the SVB. So you can see that we've more than accommodated um, with that decline in enrollment overall as a bucket of SB <coughs> excuse me, SVB funds, um, meaning that while schools may have less kids, we are still putting more into the SVB. Now, I just do want to um, say that it may not mean that every single school is getting an increase because in some situations, if their de enrollment decline is greater than the amount by which the factors are increasing, they may see a net decrease year over year. But um, overall, this is a 2% increase to schools. Um, I can keep going or we can pause and we can talk about um, any of the first um, set of slides about halfway through the presentation. Any questions so far by directors? Director Ray. I have a question about the um, small school funding and I didn't quite hear, I know you probably explained this Colleen and I just wasn't catching it, but are we um, looking at a, kind of a standard staffing model for our smaller schools so that we know that they will have full-time specials, for instance, regardless of their size? Um, I know we're doing that certainly for the mental health, but how are we figuring that 375,000? Is that still just based on need or are we getting more formulaic with it, I guess mm -hmm. is my question. Yeah, so the 375,000 is an increase to the existing allocation. That isn't the total amount of the allocation. The total allocation is about 1.8 million. Um, we do not prescribe discretionary staffing ratios. Within the site-based management of the SBB, schools have the discretion to decide how they're gonna staff their building. However, when we determine the threshold to be considered small, how we um, determined that is we looked at the average staffing across different levels and considered at the elementary school that the average elementary school should have at a minimum a half of a special teacher across three specials. And so um, regardless of their size, that, that was con considered a minimum. And so that was built into determining where those cutoffs would be um, for a school to be considered small. So actually the majority of our elementary schools are now considered small and they receive um, a portion of this, but it again is just a additional weight in our weighted funding formula. And so the smaller you are, the greater the amount you will get because you get additional funding for every student kind of above, excuse me, below that cutoff to be considered small. Um, Thank you. Um, and I'm just wondering, if, is that something we're going to look at? I mean, I, as Colleen said, the majority of our schools now are considered small school. And I don't know that we've had a lot of conversation in just um, making a commitment that we want to maintain and sustain our neighborhood schools. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's a conversation we'll have in the future to really look at do we need to look at some additional funding so that we can sustain them? And I, and I appreciate that no matter what the size, you have a half-time specials, but the reality in today's job market is that's a pretty tough position to fill. Um, we do the 0.5s and the 0.8s. So, and, and, and I, having done a lot of school visits these last couple of weeks, I think there's some real concern about how do we sustain a quality experience for all our students regardless of the size of their schools. So I'm just wondering what, the future looks like for that. Yeah, we, we will continue to work on the SBB steering committee, but certainly we have a lot of hard choices in front of us um, because as our schools become smaller and we wanna provide that minimum amount of programming for our kids, that's less money that we can invest in salaries or money that has to come from somewhere else. So there, there are definitely some challenging decisions, but we are trying to work towards minimum programming for 
um, for our schools because we do want to make sure that our kids all have access to the same opportunities. Um, we don't want to see a kiddo going to an elementary school that doesn't have access to music. We want to make sure um, we continue to have access to all of those communities. It's actually one of the reasons that we're recommending um, or that we decided to fund Schedule A stipends also at the elementary level um, to allow for that additional funding so that kids do have access to instrumental music, et cetera, at the elementary school level. So it's a slow um, progression, but we are working our way towards that. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thanks. Director Meek. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question really is around the increased mental health allocation. And I see that it's being funded through ESSER. And are those the ESSER dollars that will last through 2024, but we're still pushing to expend those in the next school year, right? So it's a one-year allocation. Yep. And <laughs> then given how difficult it is to hire recently, um, is the plan that if we're not able to hire, the funds would then carry over to the next year, or is there a plan B for mental health supports that we would push that money into? So you are correct on the source of funding uh, and the timeline. Um, currently setting this up as a, a one-year commitment, uh, but can certainly evaluate as, you know, either we see uh, vacancy savings start to, to creep up, or um, as we start to make that plan for next year. Um, I think as we think about all of our different federal funding and knowing that there is that, you know, the timeline attached to all of them, very, very important that we're monitoring to, to make sure that we're getting the most out of every single dollar. And one thing to add there is when we've had difficulty filling our mental health positions, we utilize outsourced outsource contract agencies uh, to fill some of those positions. So that has been current practice in the current school year and we are intending to continue that next year. And so instead of a district employed person, there may be a contractor who is fully qualified um, as a social worker or psychologist serving in that capacity because we were unable to fill the position internally. And just to add um, one more thing, this will also give us an opportunity to look at impact. Um, and, and what impact this has had on our on our kids, so that as we are looking at our revenue sources for the following school year, we're considering if that eight hundred and fifty five um, thousand dollar investment is something that we want to invest in on an ongoing basis. Again, understanding that there are some something else might have to give, but um, I think it'll, it's a great opportunity to see impact. Okay, Ms. Stone, uh, please continue. All right, so we should be on slide six, please. So um, this slide presents um, a high-level timeline of the changes we've made to departments throughout the course of the review process this spring. So our departments first start with their requests. They align it to the priority-based budget, as Kate described earlier. And that first comes to my team and their budget analysts. So we had over $17 million of department requests um, that we then would uh, work down to what is being presented today in front of you. So then throughout the month of March, I met with each and every department to review their initial requests and then presented those requests to cabinet for their initial review and approval. So what was brought before cabinet was approximately 15 million or $2 million reduced through the initial meetings. And then cabinet over the course of probably four or five um, different weeks reviewed all of those recommended um, increases and made their formal approvals or denials for any new items. Again, everything's aligned with the priority based budgeting with our strategic plan, but um, looking at anything that was going to cost a greater amount for this upcoming year. So what's being presented in front of you today, which has um, been reviewed by Superintendent Kane, totals $11.1 million of increases to our departments. So this number, um, you may notice if you um, or I add it up, is slightly lower than the individual lines on the um, discretionary versus non-discretionary that are referenced as departments. And that is intentional. The reason why is this is the net increase 
after subtracting out any increases to dedicated revenue that we wouldn't have without those expenses or planned use of assigned reserves specific to those department requests. So this is truly that net increase that we're um, talking about that we will be um, bringing forward in the proposed budget next month. So as we go to the next slide, get into um, a little bit more detail there. And this is that summary of the department non-personnel budget by strategic plan theme. So this is not a representation of the increases. This is a representation of everything, with the exception of our staff. Uh, we didn't align our staff um, to the strategic themes as we felt staff could support all six themes. Staff, it wasn't a good indication, but we could support kind of the work we're doing directly into these uh, themes. And so our total non-personnel budget within our departments is 45.6 million. And 66% of that is aligned with the health, safety, and social emotional supports um, of our students. And this is a self-reported by department directors, not determined by the budget office. So the other categories, um, in case this is um, hard for, for you to read, that blue, largest section um, is theme one, which is the health, safety, and social emotional support of students. The second theme, which is in orange, is the post-graduation guidance and preparation. That was about 9% of the total requests. Theme three is 1%, and that is for the positive and supportive culture. Theme four is 4%, and that's the aligned curriculum with flexible instructional delivery. Theme five is 12%, which is equitable distribution of resources. And finally, theme six is 8%, which is the recruitment, retention, and development of high quality employees. So um, that is, again, a self-reported um, how all of our department budgets align with our current strategic plan. Next slide, please. So now just focusing on the increases, this is a representation of everything outside of the schools. So departments plus district wide, staff and operations. And so we're just looking at the net increases overall and what that is as a percent of the budget. So we've highlighted it here by um, cabinet level. And this um, does not take into consideration any of the reorganization that Superintendent Kane uh, released this week. This is the um, previous um, organization structure. And so um, I'm, I'm not planning, unless you'd like me to, to go into the detail of every line, but I'd happy to address any questions here related to the $14.5 million increase here over your departments, which is the equivalent of 39.7 FTE, or about 9.5% increase to our department budgets. I'd just like to highlight a couple of things for you guys, if I may. Um, the, inc the decrease that you see in uh, BOE slash superintendent, that decrease is actually just moving um, an FTE out of the superintendent's budget and into school leadership. Um, so it's moving a, a deputy soup out and into school leadership. Um, the increase in school leadership, FTE, is primarily related to um, the operations of the new uh, or the former Wildlife Experience Campus as well as the Alt-Ed Campus. So that increase in FTE is us getting um, those two schools ready to serve students. And let's see if there's any other ones that I really would like to highlight. Um, our student support services, of course, those FTEs are related to our students with special educational needs. And um, because our, our centrally, we hold a lot of the staff that go out and serve our schools as itinerant or um, in another support capacity for our schools. Those are the big ones I wanted to highlight. Um, so the last, actually the last one I'll highlight is operations. The increase in FTE. Um, is around trying to instate a student um, apprenticeship program for 18 year olds and up so that we can start to um, incorporate that as well. Thank you. So we can continue with the presentation. Was there any particular questions on those slides? 
Just one question on the allocation. Mm -hmm. We've got two thirds of our budget going to one of the six strategic themes. Uh, were those percentage allocations fairly typical of previous years or was there any big movement one way up or down in each of the six areas of the strategic framework? Uh, that's a good question. This is actually our, only our second year of aligning it that way, but it's still not um, a truly apples to apples comparison because last year when we did this analysis, we only did it of the increases. We still had last year the um, health, safety, and social emotional support of students being the largest category. Um, it wasn't that as large, though. It didn't make up more than half. We had a larger amount also concentrated in the equitable distribution of resources. But again, it wasn't a even comparison because last year when we did this, when we were still under the zero-based budgeting and we weren't focusing our budget on our priorities um, from a reporting perspective, obviously our budget was built to our priorities we didn't go through this exact same analysis. Okay, thank you. Any other directors? Director Ray. I'm on that same slide. And, and first of all, I want to say I love this slide. I, I love being able to hear the words strategic plan again. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm, I'm a little confused because you said that this 29.8 million that's in the strategic uh, theme around social emotional does not include personnel. Is that right? Correct. That is correct. So, All so, of these dollars are just reporting our non-personnel budgets. So like what would be some examples of non-personnel that would be significant in this $29.8 million? Sure. So a lot of that could be contracted services. So for example, <coughs> in special education, not everything can be served in-house through um, our staff. So we might have um, contractors, like I mentioned for mental health earlier, we would have our special education out of district support. We may have entire categories of um, purchasing licenses and professional development, all related to um, health, safety, social, emotional supports. Some entire departments, like I'll take health wellness prevention, everything in their department is directly related to one theme, for example. And so um, if you'd like to know, you know, some specific highlights, I'd be happy to, to walk through some of them, but um, no, that's, that's just kind of some very high level example. Yeah. Any other directors? Okay, thank you, Ms. Stone, keep going. All right, so we're on slide nine now. Um, and so this, I, I realize it's a, a bit of detail on one slide, so I'll try to speak high level to it. This is the annual provided one-time versus ongoing sources and uses. So we want to make sure for ongoing long-term financial sustainability that we align our ongoing expenses with an ongoing dedicated source of revenue and then align our one-time with our one-time uses. So we are, um, again, to reiterate, in the unique situation of having more one-time dollars than ongoing for this upcoming year. So we don't have quite that balance this year, but walking through how we will still have um, a surplus of available dollars. Again, it's not all revenue, so it's not um, an increase to fund balance, but of available dollars. We won't be using all of our reserves with this um, provided proposal. On the revenue side, which is up at the top, most of this you've already seen in your last presentation. The ongoing um, ones have been slightly adjusted. The first one that's been adjusted is that PPR increase. So that's the first ongoing that has been increased due to the Introduced School Finance Act. And then I've added in um, a few uses of reserves for transportation Millevy override, and then we are actually expecting a decrease to our ongoing Medicaid revenue next year as well. And then the last one to highlight that you don't see a change on here, but it is a change um, in what will be brought before you for the proposed budget is a special education state categorical revenue increase. So yesterday afternoon, CDE released their preliminary number runs on that introduced legislation and um, on CDE's calculation. And again, it has not passed yet, um, they have increased that up to 6.2 million from the 4.7 million represented on the screen. Um, 
And that is because the amount that they've settled on in their number runs for the tier B was greater than what I was um, anticipating when I did my own internal calculation last month. So then on the expense side, um, most of these have already been discussed. So we have discussed the compensation related ones. Um, so para medical benefits and HSA can be um, combined with the benefits piece. That is our health savings account um, district contribution to employees who are on a high deductible health plan. We talked about the increases to our schools. So we break out the neighborhood um, school discretionary versus non-discretionary <coughs> discretionary and alternative. All of those would be contemplated as ongoing versus one-time only increases. Uh, we've already discussed the license compensation and the non-license. Those would both be ongoing because um, the intention is that goes into base pay, not as stipends. And then um, of the DBB items, I um, put the non-personnel items into one time um, to be evaluated with our priorities-based budgeting on an annual basis. Um, but the FTE I put into ongoing as the vast majority of the positions uh, were approved to be regular um, full-time um, equivalent positions and not posted um, to be one-year only positions. And then um, our schedule A increase would again um, recommend it to be ongoing and then same thing with the district-wide. Uh, we won't be seeing, for example, Google who is charging us more next year is not going to come and give us a discount the year after. I'd be very surprised if they did. And so that's been um, planned into the ongoing as well. So on the next slide, as we look to those additional considerations, while our sources exceed our uses, um, like I mentioned, we will be um, still have available fund balance left over. There is that imbalance between our one-time and ongoing that the Board of Education needs to be aware of in a long range um, perspective. So while this is very favorable for the proposed budget for 22-23, as you think about our long-term sustainability, um, in order to maintain many of these ongoing expenses long-term, we will require additional ongoing revenue. And then just a reminder, um, with the new license compensation schedules, year two, which will be the 23-24 school year, will cost $27.8 million before any schedule enhancements or cost of living adjustments provided to the schedule. And the reason why that is more than the 24.5 for year one is that every year more employees will be placed on the schedule as their cell designation um, becomes um, equal to wherever their salary would be with those um, pay increases. And so as we place more people on the schedule, that will become more expensive as well. So to wrap up on, in terms of the next steps before we open up for further questions. Um, so on the next slide, please. We'll be back to you on May 10th. This will be the full proposed budget. So this means that um, in addition to just the highlight of the slides, you will have the full executive summary with all of the fund financials. You will have a, a detail of each school. It'll not be as detailed as are adopted, but it'll at least have a budget for each school um, and each department within um, our general fund. And we'll have details on the charter school. So all of that is presented um, on the 10th. The public will have the opportunity to provide feedback um, throughout the month of May. Um, and by May 31st, we're legally obligated to submit a public notice on the proposed budget. On June 21st, we'll be back before you for a formal vote for adoption of the budget. And so there is a little over a month for you to um, have questions, request other changes, et cetera. Um, that gives us <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of cushion before the legal deadline for budget adoption which is June 30th, we cannot legally start the next fiscal year without an adopted budget by the Board of Education. And so um, that fiscal year again begins on July 1st. And so with that, that wraps up um, this presentation, but happy to take any questions. If you'd like more detail on schools, departments, et cetera, I'm happy to provide any of that information. Any final comments or questions by directors? 
Director Ray. The 0.5 increase for para for employees, what, how long will that continue? Is, is that, how many years will that go on before they can say they're not anticipating a, a half percent increase? Colleen? The, the years depends on para's funding status. So um, SB 200 um, kind of redefined the auto adjustment or in, instituted an auto adjustment to redefine the contributions to para. And so it's not a particular year, it's a percentage of being fully funded for the school district division of para. Thank you. And then one more question. Um, does this timeline ensure that when we send out teacher contracts that their compensation um, will be on that contract. I know we've had issues in the past where we sent out a blank contract and because we're waiting for final numbers from the state house, so will we be able to send out contracts with their compensation or, or not? Yes, um, and especially since the board has already voted for the teacher schedules, that absolutely helps to, to keep in line with that um, time frame. Um, and also remembering that because of the use of some of our one-time funds, we're less dependent on that final, final, final number uh, from, the, uh, from the state. Good. So contracts will have compensation on them. Yes. Amanda's looking at me and shaking her head. Uh -oh. Ms. Thompson, did you have a comment? Um, sorry about that. In terms of licensed contracts, the contracts themselves will not have the, for example, step, lane, and compensation within it. That will be stored in Workday and paired at the same time with their licensed contract. Is that the question that you were asking? But they can still go in and see. Absolutely. Yep. At any time, they'll be able to see all of that information all together in the same notification. So they'll see. So they'll be able to reference their work day. They'll have this blank contract, and they'll assume that whatever is in work day is what they're signing off on in terms of acknowledging the contract? So the contract is licensed contract language and their, their rights under as a licensed employee, and, um, and then their compensation, their step, their lane, uh, will also be in workday all at the same time for review and acknowledgement at Very the good. same time. Very good. So thank you. Perfect. Any other, Any other questions or comments from directors? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gataska. Thank you, Ms. Stone. Moving on to items number seven through 10, the work study session. We have a presentation by the Mill Bond Exploratory Ad Hoc Committee, which I believe will be Ms. Brownrigg. Now we're good. <laughs> I, they may. Do y'all want a handout? No. Okay. So Norman Vincent Peale said, change your thoughts and you change your world. And that's what we've been working on uh, since February 24th on the MBAC committee. Next slide, please. Um, before I revisit the charter, I'd like to introduce the people behind me. We have Josh. Latterman, who is the senior co-president of the student advisory group. Brad Geiger is a longtime LRPC and MBEC member. I know you know him. Krista Gilstrap is our MBEC communication co-chair. And then Eric Waldite is a, an MBEC member. In addition, in the audience, we have Joe Robinson, who's the MBEC vice chair, Julie Gooden, who's the communication co-chair, Tanya Stewart, who's FOC and MBEC, and we have John Freeman, who is the MBOC chair and an MBEC member. So we're well represented. We can take any questions when we're done. So first, I wanted to start with a brief summary of our, of our charter, just to revisit what we do and do not do. We've been working with the superintendent 
to study the, the financial needs of the district in the context of the capital needs in the context of the budgetary constraints. We've been assisting and maintaining trust and confidence through frequent MLO and bond communications, and we will deliver a comprehensive presentation on June 7th. Next slide, please. So, um, this really is bottom line up front. We've met with every single one of your advisory committees. We've met repeatedly with staff. We have met with consultants and we've met with Douglas County officials. And the demonstrated financial needs and commitments of the district are so significant that seeking additional funds from the voters in the near future is vital. It's essential to the success of the current staff and students and to the future. And Brad Geiger will speak more to that in just a second. So with that in mind, next slide, please. I'd like to hand it over to Josh for the student perspective. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh. I'm the co-president of SAG. And it's been an honor to be a part of the MBAC for the past few weeks. As a high school senior, I see the need for an MLO and bond in almost every day, and not just on paper, as you'll see tonight. Um, some of the buildings in our district are in desperate need of an upgrade or of an improvement. And not um, some of my favorite teachers as well have left the district simply because they, they can't support their families and other districts have higher rates of compensation. Um, and of course, they didn't leave because they didn't love their school, but simply because they can't support their families and it was the right decision for them. Um, and I've been able to experience the firsthand benefit of an MLO bond. Uh, such as the one passed in 2018, and I'm confident that we will see those same effects with a new MLO bond. Next slide, please. This is an outline of the presentation of what it'll look like in the next few minutes. We'll begin with some background about finances in the state of our district, and then next we will look at an overview of the data that gives an overview of support, feasibility, and demographics, and then we will provide recommendations on the necessities for the success of an MLO bond, and we will end with the next steps of what the MBEC looks like. I'd like to introduce uh, Brad as our next speaker. Next slide, please. In trying to evaluate this, we've looked as broad as we can. We know <laughs> it feels like a cliche to say we live in interesting times. We have for years now. I won't read all of these to you, because they don't come to one conclusion. Some of these argue for waiting, unquestionably. The fact that our demographic shift, the fact that overall our student population will decrease. Others argue for an immediate movement. The increase in inflation and interest rates makes borrowing and taxing money later more expensive. Student enrollment is dropping in, mo in some areas, but it is increasing rapidly in others. Property values, as we will demonstrate later, are skyrocketing, and that has an impact both on public perception and on income. And I would not presume to lecture this board about the difficulties of political discord. Next slide, please. But here's the reality. Our capital needs, which I have presented to you before, have gone from urgent to emergent. We remain, despite the last bond and the work done under the last bond, we still identify over $150 million in ongoing capital needs that are unmet, and that increases $30 million every year. We have made substantial progress on addressing those. We've also purchased the Innovation Talk campus, but to make it work correctly, more funds are needed. Most importantly, we have at least three identified areas where if we are not able to provide new capacity in the near future, we will not be serving our students. When I say near future, I am not talking in a five and 10 year timeline. It takes three summers after a bond to build a school. Crystal Valley, the Canyons, and Sterling Ranch do not have five more years. The operating needs remain as well. I will again not presume to lecture this board about the need to provide competitive compensation for our staff and our employees. I'm sure you're aware, but the public may not be. We have one operating bus maintenance facility, not because we don't have 
the facilities, but because we only have two mechanics who can appear at any given time. The cost for staff, the cost for licensed staff will continue to increase. And the bottom line is, as you all know, that does not exist in the current funding environment. District growth simply necessitates new schools. If we do not proceed in the very near future to build not just new schools in those three areas, but update Mesa and Sierra Middle School, we will be providing an inadequate learning environment for our children. And in Sterling Ranch, we will be looking at bus rides of 40 to 45 minutes. Now, our excellent charter schools may provide some assistance. But that's not choice. The choice in Douglas County has always been, we will provide you with a high quality neighborhood school. And then we will encourage and support charter schools that can provide you an option if it's best for your child. I submit we cannot look at Sterling Ranch and say, either get your kid into STEM or put your second grader on a 45 minute bus ride. We have other issues. In Highlands Ranch, for example, we have under-enrolled schools, and we're going to have to make difficult decisions about how to handle those and how to repurpose those. But the reality is that costs money as well. And we have to start addressing those. It does not matter how we got here. We are past the point of debating what we should have done a decade ago. We are to the point where you have to make difficult decisions about how we're going to move forward but they cannot be delayed. Next slide, please. And then there's this. You may have noticed property values are increasing in Douglas County. Again, I won't belabor the obvious. What most people don't understand, and which we did not fully understand until we had the brilliant presentation from the county assessor last week, is we're on a two-year cycle. Property values, residential property values in Douglas County are increasing at a rate of 30% a year. That rate has not yet been reflected in our assessment because of the two-year period. Come November, January of 2024, your friends, your neighbors, your constituents, and the voters are going to see, absent some relief from the legislator or from the voters, a substantial increase in their assessment and, as such, a potential increase in their taxes. This, to me, argues for moving more quickly to acquire funds so that we can be honest with our constituents and the people here. Next slide, please. I will now pass this to Krista, who will give you more information about the data that we have. So we have been working to collect some data from different focus groups. Um, we're also working with the district to do an official um, statistical survey of some of our uh, county members. So we have, we did a PTO and SAC survey. We have done some small focus groups. We're hoping to do more, but currently we've been able to get one with some homeschooling families, um, a GOP focus. We went to a GOP breakfast and um, we had an MBOC survey. So the members of the MBOC. So that's where our data is coming from thus far. So obviously very preliminary. We're hoping to expand those and have a more comprehensive report for you in June. Um, next slide is our current. So this is the results from our PTO and SAC survey. We uh, attempted to get them to all 89 schools, PTO and SACs. Um, we got about 300 responses, uh, just under. And so these were, it was overwhelming, which we kind of already knew. They are well educated, they understand the needs. Um, over 90% know that we need a bond and an MLO, which again, kind of supports what our hypothesis was with this group of people. Um, they obviously overwhelmingly ranked, I think the uh, percentage was something like 75% picked. Um, teacher compensation is the number one, um, support staff being number two. Uh, the bond I found interesting because repair and upgrade buildings was favored almost two to one over building new school buildings. And from our capital needs reports, we know that our need for new schools um, does outweigh the repair and upgrade. So that is a... Um, Area of improvement as we get out to educate our community as to what our needs are. Uh, next slide. Now these are some of the concerns that we have um, garnered from all our different areas. Trust is a big one. Trust in current boards, past boards, um, the way things have been handled in the past, fear for what's going to happen in the present. So there's just a lot of trust across the board, or distrust, I'm sorry. 
Um, and then the second, probably number one and two, very even, was transparent accountability. Where is the money going to go to? Lots of talk, comments about tight verbiage of ballot, ballot initiatives. Um, overall, I would say there seems to be um, more support than you might think, uh, but as long, it's always with an asterisk. As long as I can trust the money will go where we say it's going to go. So that's kind of been our overarching theme. And then obviously economic uh, volatility and increased taxes is also a concern. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at with communications. We, like I said, we are hoping to reach out to more focus groups. I know Superintendent Kane is working to get out um, building leaders and other to help just educate our community because what, regardless of what we determine with feasibility, I think it's important that we get out and educate our community um, and what our needs are and how funding works. And so yeah, in June, we hope to have a more comprehensive um, data for you update and a recommendation. Thank you guys. Oh, and I want to introduce our data guy, Eric. Good evening. Hi, Eric. Eric Woldite. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the data guy, I guess. If so you want to go to the next chart. And, and, and I promise you there's only two slides of these, these uh, he heavy chart numbers, so we, we won't spend too long. But I mean, over the past couple of months, we've spent a lot of time going over a lot of different data. Um, and so what we put on here is, 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 is some of the highlights of that analysis that, that helps us illustrate um, some of the points, I guess we're going on some of the points that um, push to that the noise framework that Sandra's been talking about. So our needs and opportunities, what's the data telling us? Um, so I went back and looked at the, uh, the 2018 MLO bond results and just pulled the data by precinct. Um, and and how, 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 do we can, how can we plot that data and try to understand what's going on within the county? So on the, on the left side there, the, there's, um, there's two charts, the MLO and the bond. And along the, the x-axis is is how um, Republican or Democrat, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, the right is more Republican, left is less, less Republican or more Democratic, how, how those precincts were voting. And then on the y-axis is, is how, how much they supported either the MLO or the bond. So that it's just a scatter plot looking for correlation, right? So when you're doing a correlation plot, you've got a slope of one, they're highly correlated. If you're flat, you're not correlated. Um, so. So what's the question here is, is basically, you know, are we looking at a partisan issue or how, how partisan is this, this question really? And I've kind of highlighted the, the, the colors are my colors to try to help um, illustrate different points within the, in the chart. And there, there, is a, there is a portion of the electric where um, it is highly correlated on um, that sort of the red area down off, off to the right where they're not as supportive of the bond. They're, in fact, you're underwater. Um, but fortunately, that's only about maybe 10 or 15% of the precincts within the county. So it's not, it's not the bulk of the electorate. The bulk is, the, is that green blob in the middle um, where you can see that slope is kind of laying down. I mean, there is, there is a slope there. You can do some regression, and I've done that, but that's not really the point. The point is that we are getting support across a broad spectrum of, of people's politics. It's not the same, it, um, obviously, between Democrats and Republicans or independents. But it is across a wide, a wide range. Um, you're getting Dems out to vote. You're getting Republicans out to vote. We got support amongst all things. What, so as you're looking forward, you know, political winds can blow this way or that way. That's not that's going to move your curves left and right. But that's not necessarily going to tell you how the how your bond is going to fare. What's really going to tell you is is within those groups, can I maintain that level of support? Can I move that curve up or down? Up, preferably to, to pass right. Um, so from a noise framework, the needs are um, for, for feasibility is, is we need to get that broad support across the political spectrum. We need voters from both sides supporting us. If you don't, you won't. If we do, we get, the, we get the pass. And that's what happened in 2018. So the other way to look at it is um, geographically. So there's DCSD, uh, and, and this is sort of a stoplight uh, color scheme. The darker red is less support. The lighter the colors, the more support there was for the MLO. Um, I think the darkest color is below 50%, and then the lighter colors are a little bit above. Scale doesn't matter hugely, but so you I mean you can see you getting support up in up in the Highlands Ranch area, getting support in Parker area, some some more support up and down the I-25 corridor. And then if you lay on that, the so the stars on that plot are those are the areas where we're talking about building new schools. 
So the green stars are first priority, purple stars are second priority um, that you, I think you've seen before. Um, and then also laid on there are circles, and the circles are areas of growth within, within the county. So th those are areas where we've seen growth since 2018. Um, so you can see Sterling Ranch off to the left and um, Crystal Valley down there in Castle Rock. It's different areas of growth. So you can see along those boundaries of that. And, and as we go out and target those areas and, and seek the needs of the communities in those areas, that's how you harvest more votes and, and get support for, for a bond measure. All right, enough of that. Next chart. All right, so the other thing we've looked at is, is sort of age and household demographics within Douglas County. And this, is, this should come as no surprise. Um, Douglas County is um, older than average. Uh, median age in Douglas County is 39. The state is state in the metro area is around 37. Um, a lot of that's because you see that gap. So there's a histogram of age groups. Blue is 2010. Red is 2020, so you can see we're moving, moving older. The, region, the reason the ages or the median age is, is higher is because there's not a lot of young adults in the county. Um, and if you look at it in terms of households, um, here's, a, here's a nice stat for you. 61% of Douglas County live in households with no children or no children under 18, right? So we're, so we're talking retired folks, empty nesters, lots of different categories, but that's, that's I'll, I'll take a stretch, and that's probably two-thirds of your voters. Two-thirds of your voters aren't getting your e-blasts. They're not getting your principal's notes because they don't have kids in the school, right? And that's a critical voting block that we need to, to address. I think there's one more plot on here. Yeah. So th this came from the 2016 survey. Um, it's just a, it's a survey of... Uh, of support, and there was a lot of data in that survey, but um, one of the things that came out is moms. Moms tend to be the, the largest supporters of any of the bonds and MLOs. Um, dads are also supportive. Not quite as much for the bond, which is interesting. We're, this, is, this is one thing we're trying to figure out, is like why, why do the dads drop off so much when, they're, when we talk about a bond versus an MLO? And you see this across the board. People are more supportive of an MLO than they are of a bond. And non-parents were right on that line. So, so we're talking two thirds of the voters and they're right on that line and that's really where we need to, need to address those voters. Okay, next, next chart. Oh, yeah, it's on here too, so. All right, so demographic focus areas, unaffiliated voters, it's 125,000 independent voters or unaffiliated voters in Douglas County. That's up 50% since 2018. I think it was around 80,000 last time around. Um, Retirees, those students without children, that's, again, 60% of your population, probably two-thirds of your vote. And again, uh, so another thing to address is, is our business community, um, providing emphasis on the career education and all the great programs we have in DCSD to provide, you know, when students graduate, they're, they're ready, for, ready for employment. And then, again, areas of population growth, Crystal Valley, Sterling Ranch, and other areas within Douglas County. And that's all I've got, so I, I will let Sandra wrap it up for you. Next slide, please. So we, I am here just to sum up the recommendations. We're not making anything that's really detailed today. I kept them to the top three. And mostly I wanted to put the team in front of you so you could see the robustness of the work and the, the talent stack that you have and the people. So I will run through these really quickly, and then we'll take questions. Next slide, please. Again, the thing about the noise framework that we like is that it's solution-oriented, not problem-oriented. Top three needs, increase community trust. This is all supported by the data. It all wraps back to what the guys are telling us. Clear communication, particularly on the ballot language. That's dropping out of every focus group we do. And then that effective outreach to the childless households, unaffiliated voters, and a right. For improvements, um, continuing to hear that clear articulation of a district vision and strategic direction. And then this was more from the committee than from the focus groups, the, the noise to signal ratio when it comes to how excellent our students, our teachers, our staff, our district is. 
that's not heard enough. It gets drowned out by kind of the toxic crust of nastiness that takes up all the, the oxygen in the room sometimes. And then um, the increased community awareness on previous and potential use of funds, the, with the emphasis on people who are childless, we're getting some feedback that they're not actually seeing the signage in front of the schools for the previous funding. So the perception is, we just voted for funding. Why do you need funding again? I mean, you've heard this. And then talking about the potential use of funds, compensation, everybody knows. The bond is not quite as clear. Brad did a great job on that. And then the opportunities is to build ur unity around that urgency he vividly described. Uh, the one thing I do want to say is this developing a community of advocates. Um, I, it has been a privilege to, to meet weekly with these guys because everyone is smarter than I am. They are more qualified than I am and they are committed and they come and they stay for hours and then we talk in between. And there is someone in the audience, Lillian Adams, she's not even on the committee. We have people who come to the committee because they're interested. So I hear this feedback that people don't want to engage with the district. And I'm here to tell you with these guys, you have an unbelievably talented and skilled group of community members who will help. All we have to do is ask. And they do it, I mean, again, for free. They volunteer. And that's not something every district has, is this huge talent pool. So um, strengths, the unified outreach, starting with the, the deputy superintendents holding the center and then uh, Superintendent Kane coming in and immediately going out and talking to the board committees. The community is hearing about that. They are excited. That interaction is making a real difference. So thank you, leadership. Um, PTOs and SACs acknowledge the need. There is strong support. And then the last thing is the alignment on the and interaction of the board district and advisory groups, the fact that the communication has gotten so clear in the last few months. People are excited to engage. And then when it, we talk about the demonstrated board unity, one of the recommendations that was very specific that came up is having members of the board who are perceived to have different ideological uh, bents coming together to write op-eds because the community newspapers are definitely a place where that childless demographic's getting information about the district. So seeing that there is this unity among you guys on funding is just invaluable. So with that, I'd like to thank Tanya Stewart for helping with the presentation. She's also an MBAC member in the audience and we'll take questions and that's all I've got. Thank you. Oh, I have a quote. Barack Obama said, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. And so it's time and it's us, so let's do it. Thank you. And Ms. Brownberg, we actually have a few more slides on next steps. Did you want to cover those now or? <laughs> no. Yes. I'm sorry. Next steps. Uh, I... Next one, please. Uh, yes. So we're doubling down on our analysis. Um, we want to give you guys, again, data driven, not, not anecdotal data. So we're, we're doing our focus groups and our outreach in alignment with the district who is doing a much broader outreach, much more educational. Ours is more of listening. We're going to wait and prioritize and analyze those factors and give you that final report on the 7th. In addition, we will have a library of documentation, presentations, statistics, everything that whoever goes next will need. So whether it's the campaign committee or whoever, even if you decide to defer for a year or two, this time we will have that information for them next time so they don't start from scratch. Thanks. Okay, questions from directors. Director Williams. So actually, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for all of your hard work. I um, have had the privilege of coming to a lot of the MBEC meetings and the work that you all put in and the time and the energy to do this for us is greatly appreciated. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Other directors, comments, questions? Director Meek. Yeah, I echo that. What an impressive group of volunteers. Thank you all so much for this. This is a very impressive presentation. I have a few questions. Um, one was on the scatter plot diagram. I'm definitely a data person. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it properly. Um, you had the red and the green. Yeah, that's my and colors. And each of those represent a precinct? 
Yeah, each dot is a precinct. There's 168 precincts in Douglas County and a couple more in Elbert. But. And what determined red versus green? Me. So I, I, I really am just divide. So it's really just dividing it into just kind of two populations within the county, and I just made a arbitrary cutoff to try to illustrate the fact that like the bulk of the thing, like if you try to do a linear regression on the whole curve, it, mm -hmm. it blows up. It doesn't work. If you do it on those two individuals, you get a line and a lot. You get. That, that is the percentage that voted for Republican. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, yeah, that's. Sorry. So yeah, each dot is the percent that voted for the Republican. I use congressional candidate as the proxy, but so it's the percent you voted. That's that's what each dot is. Is is that the question or? Close enough. Yeah. I I think that's fine. The red and the green um, is just to divide it up so that you can actually do it. It's a line because it's actually a curve. Okay, that yeah. helps to yeah. know it wasn't something else. Yeah, because um, it's not red blue. It's not no no no. It's not red blue, and I and I try to use stoplight colors because I didn't want to get into that. It's really that there's there's kind of two populations within the the voting population, and that's I'm just separating out that there's this outlier stuff, and then there's the bulk of the county. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And follow up on the um, so thank you. Yeah, okay. I think my next question is for Christy. Um, so you had mentioned, and I always love seeing, again, data with the results for the SAC survey. Um, were there results from the other presentations? Like, did you compile feedback? I think I heard you say you spoke to at a GO, GOP mm -hmm. breakfast, maybe. Yes, um, we did. I took, it was very last minute, fly this by the seat of my pants. So what I did is I took the SAC survey and I edited it just a little bit to simplify. Um, and then we printed that out and had them fill it out. I did compile um, that data. I didn't include it. I just did it like this week, like yesterday. Um, so yes, we did get some data. Um, the only real statistical, I mean, I think we want to tweak it going forward for our focus groups because there wasn't a hard, will you support this in November? And I think we need that if we're going to determine for feasibility. But the biggest difference between the GOP survey and the SAC survey, the SAC survey, we, we asked, um, how would you rate your knowledge on uh, what a mill and a bond is? SAC and PTO were three to five. No, most four or five. Uh, the GOP was like one to two. And then the question that was very different was, do based on your knowledge, do you think Douglas County needs a mill or a bond? SAC and PTO was overwhelmingly over 90% yes. The GOP was more leaning no. Um, then we same questions, where are your priorities? Teacher compensation did strike first. Um, the bond, it's very clear that there is a need for education on how our funding works. Um, we got some questions about, doesn't the state pay for the buildings? No, they don't. So that was my biggest takeaway from that. Um, and then anecdotally, I got some, um, I guess the feedback was actually more positive than I expected. I got some pushback as expected, um, but I had many people come up to me and say, you need to speak to more people. I didn't realize all of this. I would support this. So it actually, I left feeling they're much more hopeful than I expected. Was there an education component before asking them to weigh in? Yes, it was very brief. She only gave me five to seven minutes. So I did a very Cliff Notes version of Miss Kane's presentation. I wasn't able to bring slides, so I did my best to convey as quick as I could in the five minutes and then took a couple questions to try and clarify. So yes, I did my best, but I was not Superintendent Kane by any means. Yep. Any other directors? Director Ray? This might be for Chris also. Um, you, it look, looks like we're bringing back poll, uh, polling information for June 7th. Can we talk about that a little bit? Is it, are we doing a professional polling company? And how is that process working in terms of what question we ask? And mm -hmm. kind of give me more details about that. Sure. Um, we're doing informal, like what we've done. We're, we're working. But um, Superintendent Kane, and she might be able to answer it better, she is working. Stacy. Or Stacy. <laughs> Stacy, want to? Um, they are working on some formal polling that we're advising on and helping with, but really they're driving that bus. So, so I'll let cool. Stacey. I'm going to jump in and then have Miss um, Rader jump in. So, the um, MBEC in working with staff, um, we we've been we've secured the same polling company that did polling in June of 2000 or late May, really of 2018. Um, for MBEC's work based on their um, charge from the board. So 
that's something, and Ms. Reader has taken, um, has, has taken the lead on that with MBEX input so that, you, so that when they come back to make a recommendation to the Board of Education um, in terms of feasibility, they have information for you. I think, I think she's covered it. So we are working with the same consulting firm, actually as we've used back in uh, 2016 and 2018, some of the same lines of questioning so that we can compare back with those years and then obviously some that's more customized to where we are today. Great, thank you. Sure. Great. <laughs> the goal is for that to start next week. Okay. okay, any other questions from directors? Director Meek? I want to continue on the community engagement piece. So are there organizations and groups that have been identified that, that you are specifically reaching out to? And it would be great to hear a little bit more about that. Yes, we have a list, a very long list, so it's really more of a how many can we get. Um, we've identified a few that Ms. Kane will be targeting, their larger outreach groups. Um, I forget the ones we've given her. She can come, jump in here in a second and give the ones she's hitting. And then we are really, because we're short on time, we're looking at our own individual connections. Um, I have another conservative group that I will be presenting to next weekend. Um, I know Brad is working on getting some that might be on the other side of the political spectrum. Um, we, I mean, we have gone round and round, so yes, I don't have a list ready to go for you, but we are looking to get a broad demographic. Um, so yes is the answer, and I'm sorry I don't have a, a little bit more specific I for you. I can jump in here yeah. as well, if that's all right. Um, so on the, on the staff side, we do have um, a comprehensive list of organizations that we're teaming up with MBEC to make sure that we target, not just between now and May 24th, which is kind of their deadline to come up with a recommendation for you all, but our master list is going to continue on into the summer. The four um, big groups that, that we will go present to with an MBEC person um, in attendance partnering with us, um, in order for them to get their feedback, we're going to be going to some kind of retirement community, which Ms. Raider's in the process of setting up a growth area. Um, and so, so Sterling Ranch and or Crystal Valley, um, again, to give uh, MBEC their feedback. Um, a feeder area, so I will be presenting to the Highlands Ranch feeder area um, next week and looking at expanding that. And then, um, oh my goodness, the fourth one. Oh, and a business community, so Chamber of Commerce. So we're in the process of setting that up as well. Just to give, um, for the, from a feedback standpoint, to give MBEC some data that they can that they can use in their recommendation, and then just from a staff standpoint, making sure that you know we're hitting as many organizations as we can, um, and so we'll continue to do that and continue to have a lot of outreach. And then tied to that, do you have a specific ask for board representation, preferably multiple board members, at any of this outreach, and can we get those requests yeah. in as soon as possible? Yes, and yes, that is um, at the top of our priority list now that we've gotten a few big things done. So um, we do have an entire matrix. We're working on getting all the dates in there and then we would love for one or two board members to sign up for whatever um, you would like to do further. Um, I will be offering a Zoom training um, to committee members who want to be able to talk to their groups as well as for board directors. If you'd like to go out to your groups and do um, outreach individually, you certainly would be welcome to do that. We did a Zoom training this week, actually earlier today, it feels like last week, but earlier today I did a Zoom training for all of our leaders um, that felt like they wanted some more meat and more information so that they could go present to their staff, SAC, and PTOs. Is that also open to our committee members, our board committees, because I know there would be interest there as well. Yeah, so the next one that um, I'm scheduling, which I think we actually may have put on a date on the calendar just today, so we will get it to you, is for specifically for committee members, DAC, uh, LRPC, MBEC, should they want it, um, MBOC, all of our uh, committees, as well as to our board directors, um, if you would like more information, although you guys certainly could present it in your sleep. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for our MBEC team? All right, thank you, Ms. Brown, Reagan Company.
All right, now we'll move on to uh, items eight, nine, and 10, which are review and public hearings for our three charters that have applied this cycle, and we'll be starting with Novastar Academy. Or actually, I'm sorry, uh, we will start with Mr. Gordon Mosher, Director of Choice Programming, to give us a little uh, preamble, and then we will go to our, our three charters. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Mosher. Sir. Thank you, Okay, so I'm just going to, um, is this thing on? Good enough? I'm going to run through just a, a couple of things to uh, um, frame the conversation, and then I'll introduce the three teams who will be coming up. Again, just for reminders for, for everyone, there will be a 10-minute presentation. They have their presentation ready. And then 10 minutes for question and answers. Uh, uh, we'll go in, in order of them that are in the presentation. I'll introduce them. So 10, 10 and 10, 10, 10, 10 through the, uh, through the blocks. And then there will be an opportunity for the public to engage in a public hearing and provide their comments after that in a separate item that's on the agenda. So if you would, the next slide. Just uh, as clarity, you know, there's um, sometimes we get asked uh, questions around when and why and how charter schools apply to an authorizer district. And we are um, following the, the Charter School Act. You can see the number there. But the clear designation is that the local board uh, must hear the applications from charter schools. That's a law in the state of Colorado. Um, if we don't hear them and if you don't hear them publicly, then we are and hence denying them, and then they can appeal that decision straight to the State Board of Education. So we are following Charter School Act by allowing these presentations and allowing you to have your opportunity to engage in this hearing. So we welcome those high quality um, charter school applicants on an annual basis. March 1st is our current deadline for letters of intent, and for full formal applications were due to our office on March 15th. Next. Again, the, the areas of a new charter application, these are a little bit different than a, a replication, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about those, but this is all outlined. This is not a Douglas County School District uh, process. This is a State of Colorado and Charter School Act of Colorado list. You can see there everything that's included that must be covered in a new charter application, and also the, the assumption is that with a replication, they already have those things in place. They are replicating their current process, just moving that new, build, that new building into a new area, but the same uh, philosophies, educational design, all of those uh, pieces that you see outlined there. So we do have one new application and two replication applications. Next slide, please. Just important dates uh, for you and your reminders and for the public. Here's where we've been, everything with the highlight here today. We are doing the public hearing opportunity uh, at the Board of Education. Um, in May, we'll make a recommendation. The, the charter application review team, the CART, will make a recommendation to Cabinet. Then Cabinet will make that recommendation to uh, the Board of Education. And you will make that formal decision ruling and, and take action on June 7 at the, uh, the general meeting. Next slide. Just for clarity again, our CART members, uh, the Charter Application Review Team, it, it goes across multiple um, departments in Douglas County School District, but also we have uh, representation, as you can see, from FOC, from DAC, from LRPC, um, from many, many different um, entities who are looking at these applications through a lens of, again, governance, finance, and educational programming. Those are the three areas of, of authorization that we focus in on. Next, please. Perfect. And so that's just a little bit on that. Any questions on the process for me or get right into it? Just quick, Gordon, I thought, Mr. Mosher, I thought sure. we also made sure there was a parent who currently had children in a charter school in the CART team. Am I not understanding that correctly? We can kind of, we, we have discretion to do that. We actually have two, um, for the first time this year, two charter school principals who are on the CART team. Okay, so we have, we have discretion at kind of who we put on that team. Um, there may have been in the past, in my Understanding that's not a requirement. I thought state statute though had some requirements about um, having a parent who has charter students be on that review team. And I mean, I may be just, it's been so long since we've had a new charter, I may be recollecting something that I shouldn't, but I'm just wondering about that. Let us, uh, let us get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, I certainly believe the CART team was constructed based on the law that that was uh, earlier. So yeah. let me get back to you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, the Novastar Academy team. They will go through their presentation and then you'll have 10 minutes uh, for your questions and answers. Thanks. Good evening, dear directors, district leadership, parents, students, and community. My name is Larissa Higginbarth. I'm the founder of Nova Star Academy. Good evening. My name is Mark Manners. I'm the vice chair of our uh, founding and governing board. And I'm Ryan Brodsky. I'm on the governing board as a treasurer. Um, we have two members who couldn't be here today. Um, Angie and uh, Leah, our uh, board president, is on leave, and Angie is uh, going to uh, undergo some medical treatment this week. So they are sending their best to us today. Thank you for this privilege to introduce Nova Star Academy, a proposed charter school, and our vision. We are a hybrid blended learning school to serve the needs of individual students. Our community is diverse in race, ethnicity, language, and cultures. We propose to open in Meridian area, Ridgegate Corridor, with 220 students and grow to 500 in 2028. started as a grassroots effort by English language learner parents in 2017. We expanded to multicultural Colorado. And our mission, I'm sorry, can I, can I this? Our mission to offer academic rigor and global career preparation. With that, our vision is to create innovative learning opportunities for our students who are new generation. At Nova Star, we believe in respect. We also believe in integrity of educating our children as a whole child. Shared leadership is part of our philosophy. It anchors in our belief that every child has a unique destiny. At the core of our educational program is personalized approach. And every system is built around the student to support the needs, abilities, and ambitions of every individual student. Our students translate our program as rigor to learn as fast as you can, as far as you want, and as deep as you want, and empowerment, prepare to be a leader, steward, and a citizen. Our unique personalized approach means our school is gonna look a little different than most other schools. There's gonna be a lot more working around tables together and collaborating on projects that really mean something to you. Uh, we hope to have a truly hybrid learning environment where students can learn at their own pace through challenges that fit their interests and their learning style. Uh, the project-based learning will drive some authentic collaboration among the students and the work together to build that global competence and nurture a community of learners with the attitudes and values to become compassionate global citizens. Um, our unique educational framework also results in a somewhat unique schedule that Mark will explain. Great, so there's a little visual representation to kind of help paint the picture. Uh, we hear personalized learning uh, quite often in, in K-12. Um, all of us on the team are experienced educators, so um, this will help kind of paint a better picture of that. But each student really is going to be grouped in cohorts that are based on skill levels and competency levels. 
um, those will fall into primary, intermediate, and advanced. So we're not gonna have traditional grade levels. Um, the day is gonna be split up into two major chunks of time. So that will be core time, where students are focused on the foundational learning and core content. Uh, and then there will be lab time, which is where students are gonna be able to dig much deeper and really focus on the things that they're much more interested in, and then work on cross-collaboration projects. Uh, which then lead into a Friday opportunity project where every student is working independently on uh, more in-depth projects which helps them grow deeper into that. One thing to highlight is we are going to be including world languages into our core time and not being looked at as an elective um, like we see commonly. Thank you. So this personalized project-based approach is hopefully going to turn our students into nonstop learners. Um, you can see on this visual the cycle of project-based learning that all starts with student voice and choice. Every student will have a personalized learning path that's co-created with their mentor, their parents, the community, their teachers, and so on. And so hopefully this will lead into authentic engagement and sustained inquiry into problems that students really care about and that are pitched at the level that they are able to achieve. Uh, so this will frame a challenging problem or question that will result in a public-facing product that we proudly presented to our whole community and incorporated in the student's final portfolio. That's the culmination of their learning journey. And finally, at the end there, you have the critique and revision where our community will give them advice on how to do better next time and what can they can improve. And reflection, which is really about the rigor and empowerment we were talking about, that these students are going to be capable, not just of waiting to hear whether they got the right answer, but they will be able to thoughtfully reflect on the process they use to achieve and create their product and evaluate for themselves whether those process worked out or whether they should adjust that process going forward. Um, I just meant to go back real quick. There's an example of how we're going to look at a schedule on how we're going to actually accomplish some of these goals. So that's also in that slide. Um, uh, one major focus about Novastar Academy is that we're really trying to attack enable our students. Um, we have a series of different learning management and software solutions that we're vetting right now as far as um, uh, tools that we really want to use, one of which is uh, our core learning exchange. Um, it's, it's really focused on Colorado academic standards, but also new generation scientific standards. Um, so students are going to be moving through their learning at grade levels and hitting milestone achievements. We're going to have a badging kind of process. Um, they're also going to be supplying evidence into digital portfolios, which will be a culmination of all of their learning. Uh, and then uh, students are going to be applying those skills into collaborative projects focused predominantly on mastery. Um, a couple things just to highlight. Uh, some of the work that we have been doing um, has received some recognition. So we were awarded a preliminary grant from the Colorado League of Charter Schools. We've been working pretty closely with them over the last couple of years. Uh, Novastar also uh, was awarded the uh, CCSP grant uh, pending approval, which we have uh, highlighted in our budget in a couple different places. Uh, and then we have some uh, unique strategical partnerships that we are working with as well. Yeah, the last part I would like to highlight is the mentorship path system. Uh, we believe that personalized learning only really works when you have personalized attention. And to that end, each student enrolled at Novastar will have a individual mentor assigned to them that will follow them throughout their entire learning journey at Novastar. So their teachers may change in and out, but throughout the whole program, they will have this individual mentor to be their champion and to connect them with the rest of the community, to advocate for them, to help incorporate their learnings and their goals with what's out there in the market and the sort of career-ready skills that we want them to have by the time they graduate. So these mentorship pathways are really important to us. We also incorporate them in our teacher professional readiness as well. Like we believe that our teachers should be learning the same way that we believe our students should be learning. Teacher to teacher mentorship, peer to peer student mentorship, students helping each other out and supporting each other in mentorship capacities, just building a lot of long lasting and sustaining relationships to help great Novastar as a community hub. And because our goal to become a family and uh, 
become a community hub. We have been working in close collaboration with our families, our organizations, community organizations, and of course our parents. Our parents highlighted priorities in their, in their children's education, and you can see that on this graph. We also provide unique opportunities of authentic engagement to our parents. We have partnerships with, with uh, after-school programs, summer camps, and we also started offering ESL language courses for our parents and the Nova Star Language Center um, um, learning pod. We do have a short video. And this is our picnic. Thank you. Just uh, uh, want to conclude that our ultimate goal is for every graduate to receive career technical education certification validated by AMS Global Consortium and a seal of literacy validated by Colorado Department of Education. We aligned our program with strategic plan of Douglas County, um, building positive culture, authentic engagement, with parents and community, creating a program that would build health, safety, and emotional learning for our students, and support them through flexible learning environment. And the result, we will have graduates who are locally developed and globally positioned. Graduates who will be competent, confident and competitive for the jobs that do not exist. It's all about rigor to learn as fast as you can, as much as you, and as deep as you want, and empowerment to become a leader, a citizen, and a steward. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Director Countenbunce and questions. Director Williams. So can you tell us what kind of outreach you have done within the community here in Douglas County and the feedback that you've gotten? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, we reached out to our early childhood education organizations, preschools and child cares. Um, uh, feedback we're getting is um, uh, excitement about the opportunities for the uh, future of uh, uh, our young children. Uh, we also connected to multiple organizations providing uh, enrichment opportunities for our children. That would be sports schools, um, um, gymnastic schools, um, music schools, and such, um, large and small. For example, uh, uh, we have a partnership with ICE Arena, and um, um, they count 210 students as, um, as their enrollment. Um, so uh, very strategic partnerships uh, with community organizations. Okay, one of, uh, one of my questions or a statement for any parents that are listening, uh, or listening, listed in the charter application are languages Chinese, Spanish, German, French, Ukrainian, and Russian to be offered at Novastar. So if anybody's work wondering what some of those language offerings may be, uh, they're the ones that are listed in the application. One of my questions um, is around the draw with a, a lot of the student enrollment projections coming from outside the district. What are your plans to make sure that there's transportation, nutrition services, and other supports for those students that are coming from outside the district? 
I, I can take this one. Um, so a part of our, our budgeting plan is that we have allotted uh, some, some funding for a bus. Um, so we have that agreement in place. We also have kind of some preliminary agreements with uh, Hop, Skip, Drive, which is kind of a rideshare Uber uh, platform, and then GoTo as well. So those are the three kind of channels we're seeing. Um, we're also expecting that some parents uh, in district are gonna be wanting to bring their kids to school, but uh, it's really gonna depend on year one and how we have, you know, what we need to do as far as uh, legitimate enrollment. Okay, and anything on the nu nutrition side of that question for nutrition services? So, so we had initially had an agreement with a, a consulting firm that was gonna help us work through those. Um, at the last Colorado League of Charter Schools Leadership Summit, we engaged with some new potential vendors, so that's on the to-do list right now. Okay, thank you. Other directors? Director Ray. So, it's gonna sound like a strange question, but why Douglas County? Tell me more about what drew you to our district to partner with us through a charter school. And, 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 and one of my reasons for asking that question, so when we look at your intent to enroll letters, we have, what, 263, and out of those, 13 are Douglas County um, residents. So I'm just curious in terms of your thinking, what led you to say Douglas County is where we want to plant this school? I will start this question with uh, an apology because there was a, a mistake on that count. Um, I just submitted uh, updated numbers to uh, our choice programming team. Uh, we are the much larger Douglas County uh, homeschool um, intent to enroll count at this point, and it is growing. We actually have uh, a larger uh, number of interest form submissions, meaning that they're still, those are parents, they're still thinking and, and making that decision to uh, complete intent to enroll. Um, so with that, uh, we'll be happy to provide updates uh, as we count and as we complete those intent to enrolls. Um, right now we are at 50 uh, students who uh, already have intent, solid intent to enroll from Douglas County. Um, and growing. And uh, the uh, second part of the question um, um, related to um, proposed location of our school in Meridian, uh, Rich Key Corridor, where we expect um, growth in residential and um, um, in residential development and uh, um, uh, the projection um, for uh, just elementary students is about 1,000 students by 2025. And I'm sorry, did you say a location? Were you, what was the location? Ridgegate Corridor, Ridge well, maybe it's not an official <laughs> um, t terminology. Uh, we call it Ridgegate Corridor. So it's uh, uh, Lincoln Ridgegate between I-25 and Parker. Uh, it encompasses uh, a number of large residential developments. Uh, just one Ridgegate uh, residential development uh, will uh, produce 10,000 single homes. And that's just one of them. The total um, count was about 25,000, and that's um, a long-term development uh, for next 10 years, I believe. I think just to add to that, um, we heard strategical plan quite a bit in some of the previous conversations. And I think what was really unique about Novastar is that um, in 2017, 2018, a lot of our goals as an organization have kind of oddly just coincidentally aligned with what's going on in the district here. And we just see a really strong synergy between what our opportunity could provide to the students uh, in, in Douglas County, but also potentially serve as like a beta opportunity for future programming and, and look at this kind of as a micro, smaller, um, you know, beta um, school that we can maybe, you know, grow and, and uh, expand and support larger population of students. Another question. Go ahead, Director Ray. When you applied to be a charter in Cherry Creek School District, uh, it was declined. Has anything changed in your charter objectives and your charter program addressing some of the things that they highlighted that said wasn't a match for Cherry Creek School District that they were concerned about? Any, any changes in that? 
Yes, of course, we took um, almost two years to develop and address all the uh, recommendations uh, given by the district. Uh, one of them was a uh, diversity plan, which we, by default, we uh, a very diverse community. Uh, we do have um, that reflected in our uh, board, our uh, founding board as well. Um, uh, some other were related to uh, programming, which uh, we, we believe we uh, created a better, uh, more clear picture in our application, explaining how the needs of every students I served, uh, every student um, served, including um, um, students with special needs and gifted and talented students. Thank you. I, I think one of the most noticeable changes was enrollment. And we, we were not a K-12. We were a, a high school proposed to really focus more on language and career and technical ed. But um, what we noticed is that our families had younger siblings and a lot of those younger siblings were starting to take advantage of the summer programming and after school programming and camps. And that kind of evolved and, and moved into this idea of really the full K-12 scope of work. And so I think that's one of the most notable changes uh, on top of the, the programming uh, and then some of our uh, change in leadership and, and curriculum. Very good. All right. Any other directors? OK, thank you, Novastar team. Next up will be the team from STEM School Highlands Ranch. Thank you. Good evening. It's so exciting to be here. It's been a long journey for us. It began in 2014 when Sterling Ranch owners reached out to STEM, took us out to the prairie and said, imagine the numbers of houses, I think around 12,000 in future schools, district schools, charter schools, all providing choice. So we're so excited to be here. I'm Dr. Penelope Euchre, Executive Director of STEM School and future CEO of Coson Schools. I'm joined here uh, with uh, Dr. Karen Johnson, Ms. Nicole Bostel, Star Ake, and members of our replication team. I'd like to start by thanking Douglas County Board, the STEM Board, who are here, uh, and also I um, am so grateful to our emerging Sterling Ranch community that are both here and online. And also Superintendent Kane, thank you so much. Also, I'd like to uh, thank um, Director Peterson for recognizing our school at the three-year mark. Uh, we really appreciate that. STEM School Sterling Ranch will be a replication of our flagship school in Highlands Ranch. We will be part of the COSON Schools, of a network of nonprofit schools. When at full capacity, STEM Sterling Ranch will serve students K-12. Our mission and our vision, our mission is very simple, never stop innovating. Our vision, we envision a world of exponential possibilities where every child develops the innate knowledge, skills, creativity, character to thrive, lead, and succeed in an ever-changing world. What we believe. These are the crucial pillars of our school. We live these every day. Uh, we have K-12, and we've added, thanks to the uh, Douglas County Board, years 13 and 14, P-TECH, so our students can achieve an associate degree that then transfers to a four-year program, all at the expense of the state. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for our families. Next up, we have our COSON instructional model, which uh, is critical to the success of our program. Dr. Johnson. 
Good evening. Our COSAN instructional model really is our secret sauce. It's what inspires our students every day and staff every day that we're in session. But what is the COSAN instructional model? It is actually the problem-based learning model done in the COSAN way. That means that we're teaching new, new methodology where learning is student-centered and driven by relevant real-world problems. Throughout the lessons and instruction, students team around a team and learn surrounding a problem that they're trying to solve. They ask questions, they research, they brainstorm solutions, they test, analyze, and take action, all while learning the Colorado academic standards. Next slide. Okay, our COSAN instructional model encourages collaboration with peer learning, critical thinking, learning responsible use of technology. Working with our industry partners and leaders, students for have and find new ways to collaborate and seek new solutions to problems. This is an example of our gold standard PBL that our teachers put together, which includes all the following. We start with a problem that's centered, there's time for reflection and feedback to their inquiry process to see if they've not only mastered the content, but they've met the standards, but also to see if they've pushed themselves as far as they can go. But why not take my word for it when you can see for yourself our instructional model? Problem-based learning, an educational game changer, a unique approach to classroom instruction and one that makes STEM School Highlands Ranch a one-of-its-kind school. STEM students are given real-world problems to solve. Whether it's coming up with solutions to potholes, developing lunar landers, saving Colorado wildlife from extinction, or creating clean energy technology, our students go far beyond the standard assignment. By partnering with industry leaders, elementary students have the rare opportunity to collaborate with and learn from representatives of Fortune 500 companies. We're not just preparing them for the next grade level, we're putting them on a path to make real change in the world. As you can see, our PBLs, or problem-based learning, excite our students and it shows in our classrooms. They're noisy, they're active, but amongst what appears like chaos, there's innovation at the center. We meet students where they are. We do not make them into the model student, but rather we make the model fit to the student. Our STEM curriculum is full of reinvention and change in order to be responsive in our ever-changing world. The important part of our curriculum is that it's creative, exciting, and challenging. It's a unique blend of limitless possibilities of our students infused with fun. The benefits of our COSAN instructional model include an inclusive and inviting environment for all students and staff. It's a unique educational experience that will meet the needs of all students within Douglas County a one-of-its-kind learning environment that breeds excitement about in-person and hands-on learning every day. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole Bustel. Thank you. We believe strongly that in order for any school to be successful, there has to be a strong community involvement and buy-in. And by community, we mean all of our stakeholders, which includes our students, our parents, our staff, and our community partners. We will also have opportunities for parents within our STEM School Sterling Ranch community to be part of our COSON Schools Board of Directors to ensure community representation. Additionally, the Executive Director of STEM School Sterling Ranch will continue to engage with the community to develop additional avenues for community involvement and input that best suits the community. Based on our highly successful communications model at our flagship campus, we will provide our families with weekly communications through our weekly parent newsletter that will share the news and updates of the schools as well as highlights from within the classrooms. After a needs assessment, additional pathways for disseminating information will be developed and implemented in order to meet the needs of all stakeholders.
As we stated previously, we believe all students deserve a high quality, engaging and inclusive environment for learning. Building off our flagship campus, the success in meeting these students, our students' needs, STEM School Sterling Ranch will also provide differentiated learning for all students. In particular, we will ensure that the additional, there's additional support for our English language learners, gifted and talented learners, students with special education needs, and 504 accommodations. Our proven push-in model has shown to be more effective in delivering the specialized services that our students need. There's so much more to say about who we are and what we do for students, but we believe that the best way to really make it resonate with the Douglas County community is to share with you some of the success of our flagship campus and that we can bring the same to the Sterling Ranch community. While that was a high level look at our flagship campus, I wanna now share with you more detailed ground floor data from our student performance. I'm a data person too. <laughs> in 2019, we had a 95.8% achievement rating by the Colorado Department of Education. We also have won oh, the five John J. Irwin School of Excellence Awards, which is awarded every year that we've been open. Um, in addition, our school has one of the most diverse populations in Douglas County. We have 46.1% of ethnic diversity among our students. And lastly, we do have the first ever Time Student of the Year. We believe that by sharing with you the successes of our flagship campus, you can see all of the youngest innovators at STEM, Sterling, STEM School Sterling Ranch receiving one of the best educational experiences around. Our commitment to our community. As we close our presentation, the COSON replication team would like to thank you for your thoughtful consideration of our application to Douglas County Public Schools to open STEM School Sterling Ranch in the fall of 2023 so that we can continue to unleash each child's unlimited human potential. Thank you. Okay, hey, Director, comments and questions? I, I can save you from going first if you want. Uh, Please. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, we know that you're also looking to replicate up in the Denver uh, Public Schools area. Um, if you're approved in Denver Public Schools and in DCSD, are you concerned from the larger COSAN family about the division of resources uh, to support all those campuses with such rapid growth? And a follow-up, if you could only pick one, which district would you pick to replicate in and why? I'm asking my board if they would like to take it, but uh, I'll start and then I'll hand it over. That's a, such a great question. Um, our board of nine, um, seven are STEM parents, and they have seen the transformational change in their own children. They are so passionate about the opportunities that their children have received that they are 100% unanimously, unanimously behind getting it to as many children as possible. And so uh, the starting with elementary, it's really where we're so strong. Um, we have well over 600 students in our elementary, and you can see how they thrive, how we individualize. So um, the, uh, what we have been working on for several years is what does that replication look like? How do we grow that leadership? How do we look at within our own uh, faculty and leaders to make sure that we can populate our new schools without draining our current talent? Uh, typically in district schools, when you open your brand new, your best principal goes there and then they want to take all their talent from and drain. So uh, typically in district schools where many of us have background, you limit it to 10%. Uh, so if we look at our elementary and we have four rounds, five rounds at some uh, grades, uh, only one could go. And so we're open to one class, one kinder, one first, one second, one third. So only one could go to these two schools. Uh, and, that, and then we would also hire do. And then as we grow those with two and then three, and then if we fully grow to four, uh, we would grow that at each location. But uh, our board chair, Roy Martinez, might have more to add. 
Sure. If you don't mind, just for the folks listening. Sure. <laughs> Oh, I liked your question. Wait till you hear my public comments. So, uh, just real quick, uh, I, I think this is home. So this is where we want to be. Um, that we haven't always felt that way um, from your end. Uh, and I think the Denver application, pun intended, is probably a little bit more academic than uh, something that uh, is, is likely. So I think this is this is where we're going to be. So. Other directors, Director Ray. Dr. Euchre, how long have you been a COSAN school or part of the COSAN school net network? In my heart, I guess it's been forever. Um, we just so believe in that model. We trademarked COSAN. We did a, a real deep dive from all of our stakeholders. What is our true beliefs? What do we you know, we were all these things, but our number one, our North Star, is problem-based learning. And we wanted a name that distinguished us instead of STEM, everyone's STEM, but COSAN was a blue sky name. It has no meaning, so we trademarked it. And it really wraps up all of our fundamental beliefs. And so uh, we have been trademarked uh, for quite some time, so I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Well, my question, so how different from the original charter that we've approved and renewed, how different is your school's current model? Well, I, let me answer the, the question about COSAN, and maybe that answers your question for you. So um, <clears throat> when we were STEM school and academy, I, I did a search of uh, STEM school and academy in, in, in uh, the metro area. There's 67 other STEM school and academies listed at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, there's 17 in Douglas County. In fact, I'm not sure why Ben Franklin Academy also filed uh, under the name STEM school and academy. There's, there's a, a section of Secretary of State's office there. So COSAN was a way for us to distinguish ourselves from others. COSAN and STEM are, are one and the same. Um, but going forward, the idea is by using the COSAN name, it prevents others from saying that they're the same as us. So the difference is there's not a significant difference from the original charter that we approved uh, there, to what you're doing now? There really isn't. Okay. I mean, it's been working, so why change it? Gotcha. Thank you. Director Williams. So um, you talked about Sterling Ranch reaching out to you early on. And so my question, I have two. Uh, the first is, have you been promised land by Sterling Ranch? Yes. Well, not promised. Uh, they identified uh, uh, several sites to be future Douglas County schools. Um, one they thought would be perfect for STEM. Uh, they have identified schools that um, might also partner with them. In the early days, they were looking at private schools, and my heart kind of sunk because I thought, how many families uh, would have the ability to buy a brand new house and send their children to a private school? I'm such an advocate for public schools. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question would be, if, if uh, the replication was not approved for Sterling Ranch, what would, what would you do? We believe, uh, looking at our wait list at elementary and how fast it's grown, that we would anchor it uh, in another community. A few have reached out over time. Um, we just believe so much in the model. And when we map where our students come from, they come from as far south as Fountain, as far north as Green Valley Ranch, uh, in, um, uh, uh, evergreen. Um, so when we did our zip code map, the distance families drive 100 miles round trip to bring their children. So we would do uh, more outreach if it were not in Sterling Ranch to uh, make sure that we anchor it where we are wanted. And just a quick follow up to that answer. Do you have an idea of what percentage of students are interested or would be enrolled in a Sterling Ranch STEM school uh, that come from the local geographic community versus those that would come from outside that local geographic community? The Sterling Ranch community has said loud and clear they want to have priority. Uh, they don't want um, others coming in and 
and in a lottery system, they not get in. So they want priority. Uh, for the federal grant, uh, you can't go above around 30%, uh, but we could forfeit. Uh, we said to Sterling Ranch, we could forfeit the federal grant if we wanted to go higher and say 100% would come from the Sterling Ranch, um, but then that would exclude others. Um, outside the district, we feel that we would probably draw quite a bit from uh, a southern part of Jefferson County as well. Other directors? Director A. You may have been here when we had our MBEC uh, presentation, the Mon Millevy Bond Exploratory mm -hmm. Committee, I can't remember the acronym. Yes. Um, we, one of our people on that team stated that um, it's preferable for a new subdivision like Sterling Ranch to have a neighborhood school first and then gradually evolve into offering more choices like charter schools. And I'm just, I'm curious about your thoughts about that. I mean, it seems like you've had a lot of interaction with Sterling Ranch residents, obviously, but I'm wondering about that notion of timing. Does it make sense to bring a charter into a new subdivision when they don't have a neighborhood school in that subdivision yet? I would love to partner that we construct simultaneously. I, I feel um, STEM is a unique learning model that fits very well with the huge growth at Lockheed Martin. Those families have already said, you know, we're STEM, our children are STEM, um, but not everyone's STEM. And we've even tried to pivot a little to uh, more of the arts because we have four full-time art teachers, two full-time music teachers. Uh, uh, we, we have constant play production with our theater department. So we could pivot to more of a arts and sciences, and we ask the community, but a lot of them still want STEM. Um, I think ideal would be multiple schools growing up at the same time to keep up with all the construction. I mean, it's so amazing every time I go out there, it seems like a thousand more houses, and uh, their sales department are saying, this is the future of where STEM will be. But I think it would be great for uh, families to have choice of a district school and STEM and other charter schools, each with different branding, because you know if you have more than one child, they're completely different. So the sales department is already stating that there's a STEM school going into the subdivision? Hey, to sell homes, you know, whatever. <laughs> we didn't I give them permission. We, yeah. we didn't give them permission, but we heard from some of our community. Another interesting thing, a lot of the Sterling Ranch new families attend our school, and they said that they would have to decide if they wanted to go to the new um, Sterling Ranch campus. Some of them said one in particular family stands out. They moved here from San Francisco, and they have a first grader, and they love that we are almost 50% diver ethnic diversity, and they wouldn't want to leave that. So they may drive, um, but of course, once it opens in their neighborhood, maybe they would change their mind in the winter. <laughs> one of the questions, you're, how big how big is STEM right now? Our capacity is 1850, and uh, we dipped a little bit at our high school level and grew more at our elementary. So we're about 1700 this year. 1700, okay. Yeah. And I think in your uh, application notes, you uh, said there were 125 students that were identified as special needs or were on an IEP. Yes. Yes, is we it? have about 100. And 24, 25 on IEP, about an equal number on 504. About a quarter of our students are ALP, and we are the home of Twice Exceptional. So we are the 2E school, which you know from visiting. You can just feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 125 is a pretty small percentage comparatively it's to our other schools. It's about 7%. Is it 7%? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And for a charter, that's actually fairly high. Okay. And um, our process has high equity. We accept all students, and if they have an IEP, we ask for their sending team to work with our team to make sure we can provide FAPE. And the few times, twice, that I can remember where it didn't happen, it was the district team that said STEM isn't the right placement. And so we always defer to Douglas County uh, SPED team who are beyond amazing uh, to guide us on those hard decisions. 
The reason I ask about special education certainly is that without a neighborhood school in that community, um, we, we don't have the potential of placing a, a student with significant needs program. And we know that charters typically, well, they do not. We have not allowed charters to have SSM programs in their schools. And we do a different kind of uh, negotiating in terms of where you support us in providing that programming for our, our neighborhood <laughs> schools. But I'm just wondering if we can't put a neighborhood school and instead a charter school goes in there, have you thought about uh, opening or preparing to have more intensive need students in your charter school? Because it would essentially become the only option in that, in that neighborhood. Absolutely, we would be open to it. The funding stream, the way it works in Douglas County is somewhat unique in that uh, Douglas County retains the funding for the SSN. But it's interesting, in Denver for our application, we had to agree to accept a site-based program in partnership with Denver, which we absolutely said yes. Um, and so we welcome all students. Um, we have quite a few on the autism uh, spectrum and parents are sometimes uncertain and we just say, why don't you try it and see how it works for your child? Often it works amazingly well. So we are open to any iteration uh, with district support because you know it's a lot more support. Any other directors? Okay, thank you STEM team. Thank you. And our last uh, presentation from this round of schools will be Lehman Academy Charter School. Well, good evening, directors, Superintendent Kane, Cabinet, staff and community. Um, I'm here, my name is Jason Edwards. I'm the principal of Lehman Academy on Stro Road and I'm accompanied by my board president and one of our founders who are prepared to uh, stand with me for questions as well. And it's really a joy for me to walk you through at a high level briefly the mission statement of Lehman Academy. Um, when we opened the school over, you know, over four years ago training the staff and hiring, we required that every teacher would memorize this mission statement before working with children. And it's really our call every single day and our promise to families. And um, I just want to say along with that, that uh, it's been wonderful to sit you know, and, and hear of the strategic goals for Douglas County School District, also the research of the Mill Bond Exploratory Committee. Uh, we wanna be, continue to be wonderful partners with the school district, um, you know, seeing that the district growth will necessitate new schools and that it takes about three years it's for that same reason that Lehman Academy is asking for you to consider now this application for replication, not for the fall of 2022 or for 2023, but for the fall of 2024, because as I'm sure everyone feels, land and the supply chain and materials are very hard. And so we want to make sure that anything we go for and commit to, we can deliver well for the community. All right, well, Lehman Academy of Excellence offers a rigorous classical education. And by classical, we mean a time-tested approach. So both the curriculum, what scholars will learn, and the, the approach of how they will learn it have been time-tested. Um, I enjoy sharing with our community how George Washington, our first president, only had an eighth grade education. And that's really the opportunity we have, kindergarten through eighth grade, to instill um, some, some knowledge and wisdom and hopefully growing toward virtue that will last a lifetime. That's what we mean by classical education. Where all disciplines are interrelated, allowing scholars the ability to think independently and critically. So the goal of our school is to cause our scholars to think. We want to have the teachers guiding them to put their eyes on, on rich text and rich pieces of work that have once again, uh, proven themselves to be culturally significant and to prepare them with confidence. They, I can understand the key words in this paragraph, or I can appreciate the beauty of this piece of art from a totally different time period in a different continent. We want our teachers to be guiding the scholars to analyze, 
to think independently for themselves. And we do this by supporting them um, with the atmosphere, with the disciplines, the way the curriculum is organized, and then by not letting any single scholar fall through the cracks. So um, if you'll permit me just for one moment, I want to explain the way this is a bit unique. Um, you know, and, and I'm personally, I'm honored to be in the company of such high caliber charter schools. As a startup school in the last four years, we've benefited from the mentoring of some of these well-established, high-performing charter schools, and even our school accountability committee, our PTO. Uh, it's been such a wonderful partnership. And um, Lehman Academy is a bit unique in that our, our program is really using history as a skeleton. So first graders live in the ancient time period, second grade middle ages, third grade early modern, fourth grade modern time period. And then it starts all over from fifth through eighth. The same for science, one entire school year in biology. Our third graders spend the entire year in chemistry, and then they visit again in the seventh grade. So by the time they get to high school, they've seen chemistry twice. They're comfortable with it. They can access it and do very well. We have a, a fantastic approach as well, beginning with the classroom teacher and then providing numerous safety nets so that no scholar will fall through the cracks. Um, this is something we've worked really hard at over the last four years. If we were to replicate, we'd be able to give that second campus a really um, advanced starting point. And um, we want to just give teachers that opportunity. If a scholar is struggling with behavior or academics, every two weeks they come before a panel. We use, uh, we use proven interventions from CDE, and we progress monitor with further steps on how we will support every single one from there. So that's how we train every single scholar to succeed and to think independently within our program. Our mission statement goes on to say that we purpose is our, our, our verb here is we purpose to partner with supportive parents, pursue excellence, provide a safe and challenging environment. So Lehman Academy is really for the whole person. Uh, it was Benjamin Franklin who said specialization is for ants. And you know we recognize that our scholars will have high school, they'll have college, many of them a master's degree. In whatever field they choose, it's our job now until eighth grade to give them a broad base and let those decisions be theirs for the future. We believe that learning happens through healthy relationships. And the most important relationship in every single child's life is with their parents. So even though we're rigorous and classical, um, we really value that partnership with the home and with the parent. We try to be really clear to that for families that want that type of partnership to offer one more very good option for them. We say in our mission statement that we, we work to instill morals and values in order to produce tomorrow's leaders today. I've got a graphic here from one of our classrooms. Every single class with the beginning of the year, they get to work with their teacher off of the same sentence stem. So whether you're in kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade, um, this, year, this is how you'll begin your day, every single day. No matter what your siblings did on the ride over or how angry you are about breakfast or anything like that, we're going to settle into our classroom, do our bell work, and then we'll stand. We'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll recite our, our famous poem or speech, and then we will say our class creed. We are, we can, we ought, and we will. And we believe that that sense of community, um, that integration of virtues and values into the curriculum, history, literature, everything that we do, um, is gradually basking these scholars in something that will shape them. And then the behavior becomes less about managing the mistakes. It becomes more about calling them to love what is lovely. We view our scholars as adults becoming. And we believe that they can uh, be balanced, wise, and virtuous for, for decades to come in this community. They'll be the glue of society. They'll be the future teachers, the little league coaches, and maybe a board of director in one day. So that's our desire, is to prepare tomorrow's leaders today. I want to share um, that this is not just a lofty mission and vision, but we had a third party survey that we participated in, uh, and it was thanks to the funds provided for improving school safety um, through the county commissioners. So CU Boulder's climate and culture survey results, and it just shows here, I won't read each one, but you can see how our elementary and middle school scholars feel very safe at school. They report a very positive school climate and staff morale has been very strong uh, as well, strong academic orientation compared to the state, and our parents are highly engaged. 
And this is my last slide. I just want to highlight for you some of the things you've reviewed in our full replication application. But our enrollment has steadily grown. Uh, we're almost at capacity next school year. And um, you know, even though it's been a, a bit of a wild ride the last couple of years, the school has been performing financially stable. Um, I, I did want to highlight our positive partnership with local neighborhood schools. I've got principals in the area on speed dial. We text each other, encourage each other, other charter schools as well. And I do want to say a big thank you to uh, the Choice Office and all those within Douglas County who have supported us. Really, a charter school could not ask for a better authorizer, better partnership. We value that relationship. It's been wonderful to have close to 90% retention of staff over these four years as well. Unheard of, really. Um, our school accountability survey, parents have indicated that 93% of them do recommend this school to their friends and family. And uh, even with this prospect of a second campus, um, without any marketing or reaching to the whole community, just with those who have come on tours or those who are commuting from a great distance as well, um, just saying if there were to be a second campus, what is your interest? And there are 958 indicating, indicating that intent. Of course, wanting more information by the time we get to 2024. So for these reasons, we do ask that you would grant at least a conditional approval for a replication at that time to allow us to take those steps and not lose those precious months so that it could start very strong. Thank you for your time. Okay, Director, questions and comments? I'll actually start off with a question that was asked of our other school interested in replication. Um, you would have now two shared campuses here in Colorado, and I know you have other locations out of state. Are you worried about um, draining one to fill the new one or anything around resources as you replicate? Um, yes, that's a, that's a very important strategic concern. And um, we have taken measures you know, every school year, and this would certainly continue with with this opportunity in mind to create a very strong leadership pipeline internally. Because our approach is unique, there's no shortcuts, um, but we, we wanna give every single teacher that's with us that opportunity to grow to that next level. So I'm proud to share we have a strong team lead, we call it Team Shepherd model at every grade level. We have, uh, this upcoming school year, we'll have 11 teachers and staff that will also be instructional coaches and they'll help multiply and provide that cognitive coaching reflecting on our practice so that we're improving. Um, and then we did have a very strong internal process for a, a vice principal. And so I know that there's a desire to be part of that. Uh, of course, uh, I thought STEM's answer was, was wonderful. We'd want to keep that in mind as well, you know, a, a calculated ratio so that the current school remains strong, but also that we're, we're truly replicating this model um, and that it would be true to what we promised. And one other follow-up that we asked the other uh, school. Um, you have interest in replicating in the Parker region, yet you say folks want to access the school and would drive to a distance, but these, relatively speaking, would be fairly close together. Would you consider replication in an alternate location if you could not do it in the Parker region? I'd say the answer to that is yes. Out of that 958, 65% uh, of them live in Parker, 15% live in um, Castle Rock, and um, we've been looking for property, and as somebody mentioned, it's getting expensive. <laughs> and we'd be happy to talk with you all, because I think you've got a few pieces around uh, some places. So um, we're open to that. We do want to replicate. I think the closer we can be to the school that we currently have would be very helpful in the res to answer your question um, regarding the management of that school. Um, and, you know, the closer they are, it's easier for this guy to get back and forth. And as you can probably tell, he's one hell of a leader. <laughs> hey, thank you. Other directors? Yeah. <laughs> Director Ray. All right, thank you. It's good to see you both again, Dr. Edwards speaking. Um, one of my questions, and it might be a technical question for Mr. Mosher though, and in our procedurals manual, when we look at replication, one of the criteria is that you have four, obviously completed four successful years, but also that you've gone through the renewal process for another um, five year period, if you will, of being a charter school in our district. And I'm just wondering, 
it, it seems like this doesn't align with our eligibility, Mr. Mosher, in terms of when to replicate, although Dr. Edwards, I certainly heard you say you're waiting until 2024 to actually open your door. So I'm just curious um, where we are with that because it's, you're just completing your fourth year, is that correct? And this this will be just yes. finishing your fourth year. Yes, sir. That's correct. And and we've not we we have not put you through another process to renew your contract yet. That's correct. And I can make one comment, and I welcome others to add on to that. Um, yeah, that's correct. And uh, we were up for for the the charter renewal process last school year, and with with everything that was going on, we we willingly agreed to pause a year. We we wanted to be able to have our state test results you know, because it had been suspended the two previous years. So um, that, that would be my response initially, is yeah, that we to, were happy to partner for that reason. And to my understanding, that was a mutual agreement on the contract between the both parties. So because it was mutually agreed upon that they would enter into that cycle and they would be on that, they would be eligible to apply for this at this time. So we did, so, so that's what I'm trying to get at, Mr. Mosher. So we, so I appreciated the fact that we extended your contract without putting you through that renewal process. But you feel like that we negotiated that the replication requirements would be waived, that we would not hold this school to a, at least going through a renewal first before they could replicate? No, that's, that's not my understanding, but there would be, they will be going through that renewal process next year. So th they're going through the renewal in this next year, so they still would be in the pipeline for eligibility is my understanding. So you can probably see where I'm going with my concern. My concern, and, and it's, it's not Lehman, it's us being consistent with our practices. And so typically, as I understood, and, and Superintendent Kane, you might have some more to say because you've replicated a couple times, but typically the, the, the gift of that renewal process is we get another chance to really vet how you have done in the past four years before we get to a place where we're making a decision of replicating your school. So I'm just concerned about consistency of our procedures and not having you have the opportunity to be vetted again and before you're actually approved to be replicated concerns me from a consistency point of view. Um, I don't know, Superintendent Kane, any, any additional comments regarding that? I would like to request some time for the board for me to be able to sit down with um, Mr. Mosier and the CART team to kind of understand the process uh, to this point and look at those requirements and then get back to you. Super. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you. May I, may I just add on one thing? Um, totally respect that. And as you, as you all consider the process, um, maybe I would just, you know, uh, I guess add into that consideration that perhaps that in the unusual times with pandemic and state testing being suspended, that perhaps um, the replication being favorable could be one of the conditions if you were to grant a conditional approval. And, sir, hey. if, I, if I could Go ahead. comment one other thing. It would, I would be happy as we all would to be, accept a conditional approval of the replication for one reason only, and that is the supply chains issues and getting started on these schools. I found out from construction people that aluminum and windows are eight to 10 months out. Roofing is another nine months out. You've got to get all your construction documents ready to go in. There's a lot of work to be done and we're gonna be lucky to get it all done and comfortably open the school in August of 24. And I'd be happy to take a condition on our approval of the other thing and it would be very helpful if you would consider that uh, on our behalf because it's it's really hard to run fast for nine months and you when you can't get it and I'm not sure the supply chain is going to get better from what I'm hearing on the news about China and their yeah. lack of production of stuff. Well, if I remember Lehman also, and part of your journey was we, uh, you, you ended up having to delay your opening when we first chartered you yes, for some no, similar I, reasons. No, I, I, with, well, uh, and that was before the crisis. Yeah, uh, that so was, we just got too tight. It was uh, yeah. like January or something that we didn't get approval, and 
and we couldn't get it done in time to open the school. And so we purposely delayed so that we didn't have a school. I think you've yeah. been through that a couple of times and it's not good for anybody. Right. And that's the reason we did delay, but you are correct. We did, yeah. we've been through that. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think you answered my final question would what would be the effect of delaying approval to the next cycle? Is it mostly financial uh, or is it financial plus timeline due to cost of materials? I guess the question is if you are delayed to the next cycle, do you think you would still tar target a fall 2024 opening? I don't think so with the supply chain being what it is. Financials, are, uh, we're not concerned about that. We're going to cover it all. We've got the money in the bank and we're doing quite well and, and it'll all be done with a bond before we start. So we're in very good shape financially. It's the supply chain that worries me. Thank you, though. Any other director questions, comments? I have one more. Director Ray. Dr. Edwards, I also want to just sing your praises because you truly are, both of you truly are that partnership that I think we really value with our charters. And you were talking about having colleagues on speed dial, you know, and, and certainly you have really done well in networking with them. I'm curious, though, in, in our circumstance, when you look at a declining student population, um, and you look at like our mountain views in our northeast that are, you know, sitting around 300 students, in your conversations with your colleagues, you say to them, I want to open up another campus and, and compete for even more kids to come to our school. What kind of feedback are you getting from them? Is that a concern? Um, I would just be curious if you've had that discussion with those neighborhood schools that might be impacted by an additional campus of Lehman. No, that's, yeah, that's a thoughtful question. I've not had that discussion because it's just very early in the process and of course it's, it's not even approved, you know? Sure. Um, yeah, but I, I guess I'll just share the perspective I do get very often is, is just from families and those on the wait list. Um, we, you know, our last tour a couple weeks ago, 125 signed up and we divided into groups and showed them the school. And so I do feel like I see a lot of houses going up and it's hard to project three years from now, but um, I believe it could be one more good option that would align with the district's big strategic goals, and that would be our desire. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Okay, thank you, Lehman team. Thank you. Okay, we will have a 10-minute uh, a break. Uh, we will, it's time 52. We will start up at 8.02 for public comment.
back to order. We are moving on to item number 11, public comment. Purpose of public comment is to balance the ability to hear diverse viewpoints from a broad spectrum of citizens throughout the district while allowing our Board of Education to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner. Time has been adjusted to allow all speakers the opportunity to speak during the allotted time for public comment. When speaking, please remain respectful and address the board rather than the guests and staff in the room. This is your time to speak. And I do know we have some commenters tonight um, that are planning on addressing the board members. That's fine. But they have also seen previews of public comment that name specific members of the staff or uh, non-district members. If you can please not refer to those people by name, I would appreciate it. To respect a speaker's free speech, please not interrupt them while they are at the podium providing comments. You have a 15 second notice prior to any of your time so you can wrap up your comments. When your time is up, please leave the podium. If the audience wants to react between speakers, feel free to do so while being respectful and honoring the next speaker's time to speak. Attendees who have created disturbance or disrupt speakers while they are speaking will be asked to leave the room after a prior warning. The board president will be responsible for determining when audience members are disruptive. Colorado law, CRS 2230-50-1072, requires that a public hearing be held in the district to obtain information to assist the board in its subsequent decision to approve or deny a charter school application. Uh, tonight we heard three uh, spring charter cycle applicants, Nova Star Academy, STEM Charter School, and Lehman Academy Charter. So all of the initial speakers, both live and via Zoom, will be asked to limit their comments to the charter school subject. We will then go to regular public comment. With that, the first person up will be Matt Collins, followed by Maria Castillo, followed by John Castillo. Mr. Collins. Good evening. My name is Matt Collins. And my family and I reside in Sterling Ranch and have resided there since 2018. I'm here tonight to encourage the board to deny STEM's application for application at Sterling Ranch. As it currently stands, pending other proposals yet to be reviewed by the county, Sterling Ranch's developer has dedicated only one parcel of land for a future school site in Sterling Ranch, which STEM has planned to occupy. Approving STEM and specifically approving STEM to occupy our only current site set aside for a school is a standard that, is, that will set a standard that is fundamentally contrary to the position of prior, prioritizing neighborhood schools in the district's newer, faster growing communities. Many residents share reservations that if the board approves the application and a bond is passed in the near future, though no additional school sites have yet to be dedicated by our developer, the probability for a neighborhood school in the near future will be further jeopardized. In addition to, to denying the application, we ask that the board move forward with a bond authorization on the 2022 ballot. While the prospects of a passage may be demand, demanding, there are residents in our community that understand the importance of a bond authorization and are up to the task when it involves community engagement and outreach for a proposed bond passage. Successful passage will require clear articulation of the district's vision, establishing trust and unity among all members of the board and effective outreach. While Good residents are ready for the training. task in Sterling Ranch, I have yet to see any of these dynamics demonstrated by the board. This needs to change and our community needs the support of our leaders among the district's administration and board, starting first with the denial of the STEMS application. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Collins, Maria Castillo, John Castillo, followed by Kelly Reyna. Ms. Castillo. And uh, I decided that I'm not going to speak. I would like to give my time to my husband. Okay. Good evening, board. Uh, we're here tonight. I'm the father of Kendra Castillo. That's my wife, Maria, who lost his life at the STEM school in 2019, May 7th. We're here tonight in a strict uh, opposition to the STEM school being replicated in Sterling Ranch. Um, we feel that it's not a safe charter over three years. You know, we don't feel that there's been enough done, and there hasn't been enough conversation, quite frankly, through many of our charters. As I sat here tonight and listened, uh, Lima and Academy was the only school that I heard even mention about disciplinary action and how they would handle it and what their plan was uh, to create safety. Um, we have prayed and we have hoped that organically something would come out of this board and charters that would change since the loss of life of our son. And we haven't seen enough. 
So much like our son attacked the killers that took his life, we're here tonight to do the same, to make change happen, no matter what we have to do going forward. With that said, when I talk about these charters, you know, we heard great business models and replication designs, and different views of education, which, you know, may be good. Kids learn different many ways, but let's not, uh, you know, let's not be coy about it. It's a business. People make money at it. There's executive directors that make more than superintendents of counties. So thank you. And, and you can continue with your other 90 seconds if you oh, have more, sir. I do. So, you know, when, when we look at these models and we, we hear about deals being made with sales departments and partials of land and, and hoping for uh, money to come in, federal funding, we have to look at what we're doing. And we have to, you know, even with uh, the county commissioners that freed up money after the death of our son, there's still not enough transparency to see where these funds are being spent. Um, long term, as far as safety goes, I haven't heard one of these charters or any of our schools talk about maybe having closed campus or things that would make sense to keep our kids and our educators safe. Our teachers in our schools deserve that. And that's how we retain the best that we can get as far as our educators go. It's not always about funding and money, it's about safety. They wanna work in an environment where they can do what they love and feel safe about it. So I would encourage this board to look at those things when we consider replication of any charter. But for Pete's sake, don't allow STEM to replicate another charter um, until they can prove that they've made mounds and discussed what they've done with transparency. Uh, threat, 15 seconds. Threat assessments should be available to families just like we check Canvas for grades. They should know what those numbers are. They don't need to know the content, but they need to be able to make an educated, safe decision on where they keep their children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Kelly Reyna, Carla Go uh, Gustafson, followed by Alex Erbertoni. Ms. Reyna. Oh, good evening. Thank you. Um, whew, why is everyone so nervous when they come up here, right? Uh, I just wanted to come up today and thank you for hearing our charter replication. Um, I am a STEM parent of two kiddos, a seventh grader and a fourth, third grader, fourth grader, fourth grader. And I came from Illinois where there was no school choice. You went to your neighborhood school and that was, that was what you did. When we moved to Colorado, not only did I have to understand I could go to school of choice in my neighborhood, um, but I could go to a charter also. And when we joined STEM, it was like opening a door of opportunity for every child. Um, and just hearing Lehman's presentation today, just allowing that for our community is, is huge. I think it's something that children could grow from and learn from, and STEM is where that happens for us. And the PBL model is something that I hold dear to my heart, and I do this, I volunteer, I'm on the board, I'm on SAC, um, I do this for my directors, I do this for my teachers, and I do this for our students. So thank you, I know I have 15 more seconds, um, but uh, I don't have anything else to say, I just wanna thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Reyna. <laughs> Carla Gustafson, Alex Ab Albertoni, followed by Veronica Albertoni. Ms. Gustafson. Okay. Thanks. My name is Carla Gustafson, and our family has been at DCSD since 2013 and part of the STEM school community since 2016. I'm here to say that we don't need to take sides as far as pro-neighborhood school versus pro-charter school. Our family has benefited from the combined experiences at both types of schools. We love our neighborhood school, Saddle Ranch Elementary, and are so grateful to raise our kids as part of the SRE community. Saddle Ranch has done an excellent job of supporting our children from both an academic and social emotional standpoint, preparing them for their future. For middle school and high school, for us, STEM has provided the small school community individual support, an amazing range of engineering and science programs that are best fit for our kids. 
My oldest has thrived with the problem-based learning curriculum at STEM because of the engaging experiences with real-world problems and hands-on activities. Most importantly, my oldest has found a community of peers where he fits in. I've committed countless hours of my time and support to STEM because I believe in the school mission. I'm currently on the SAC committee and a parent member of the STEM board. I'm here to express my support for the replication of STEM to Sterling Ranch so more families can have the choice that we've had to find the best school for their kids. I feel strongly there is room in this community for both charter schools and neighborhood seconds. schools. And that having that choice in our district will benefit all families. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Gustafson, Alex Albertoni, Veronica Albertoni, followed by Kyle Whitehair. Hello, I'm uh, Alex Albertoni. I'm a father of two students at uh, STEM Highlands Ranch. More than two months ago, we communicated to STEM authorities our concern and subsequently our conviction that the English one teacher was violating school rules. As of today, she's still pushing what we see as one-sided political content and ideology in her ninth grade classroom. This is not acceptable. We do support charter schools and the STEM model. We believe in the school and we believe in the teacher. However, imbuing students with ideologies from one far side of the political spectrum does not belong in the classroom. Instead of teaching the kids what to think, we should teach them how to think. The novels used in this English One class were selected following the 2020 protests by Black Lives Matter. And not surprisingly, the novels do reflect the philosophy of BLM and promote their political ideas. These books are biased and they do not present different perspectives or opposing sides at all. We're not in the business of banning books. These books should never have been introduced in the classroom in first place because they do violate STEM policy. We find this content toxic seconds. and divisive, but worst of all, even when it is requir required by school policy, the teacher failed to notify parents of the specific controversial content in the books, keeping parents in the dark about it. Next, my wife is gonna speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albertoni. <laughs> Veronica Albertoni, Kyle Whitehair, followed by Julia Taylor. Hello, my name is Veronica Albertoni. And the STEM teacher referred my ex-husband in her unit, English unit, for my surprise, she introduced one-sided politics, vilified police, violence and rioting as protest method, heavy stereotypes, attacks on American values and institutions, fights of racism with more racism, distrust of authorities, sexual obscenities, and an incredible amount of foul language. On May 7, 2019, our STEM school suffered a tragedy and our police rush in to save our students and teachers. It's unbelievable to me that a block of books seems to be coordinated to teach our students to distrust and resent our police and our institutions. We deeply appreciate our teachers' hard work, but in this case, we believe that teachers is irresponsibly advised, advancing her personal and political interests in the classrooms. There has been the most trouble around doing and the process to bring a precautionary or corrective measure has been inadequate. So far, the only ones seconds. paying the price have been the students. We ask the board to help us fix this particular issue and help us, help us our school, school reach the great potential that, the, that we so much care about. Thank you, Ms. Albertoni. Kyle Whitehair, Julia Taylor, followed by Janine McDonald. Uh, good evening, my name is Kyle. I'm a Douglas County school parent and I lived in Sterling Ranch since 2018. While I'm not inherently against charter, STEM, or private schools, I think there are a multitude of reasons we need the neighborhood option first. Uh, on the average, studies have confirmed charter, STEM, and private schools do not outperform neighborhood schools. Uh, charter, STEM, and private can also present barriers for entry for those children with special needs and our local children by using a lottery admission system. 
In addition, low performing schools can be difficult to close, although academically inferior, if they are fiscally competent. In Colorado, those schools can also hire unlicensed teachers who may or may not possess the necessary skills. Further, if we build a charter STEM or private school first, we may lose the neighborhood option later. Charter STEM and private schools are not the panacea that their supporters claim, nor are they the villains that their critics charge, despite passionate arguments on both sides. In closing, with the potential for so many inconsistencies, the benefits do not seem to outweigh the risks. We need to invest wisely and effectively for our children and the public education system. We need to give our educators and staff the increased pay and support they need. For now, we need to forego and deny the charter, STEM, or private school option. We must pass a bond or mill levy in Douglas County to make this happen so we can secure our children's futures, pay our teachers, and get a neighborhood school built in Sterling Ranch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehair. Julia Taylor, Janine McDonald, Michelle Superat. Ms. Taylor. We would like to have our times combined to speak together. I'm Linnea Dotsev, towards the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having us this evening. My name is Julia Taylor, and I'm an occupational therapist that serves three schools within our district. Next to me is Linnea Dotsev. She's a special education teacher in the DPS school district. We are standing before you today to ask you to deny the STEM charter school application for Sterling Ranch and instead work together to approve a bond MLO for the next ballot to secure a neighborhood school to be the first in Sterling Ranch. A charter school is not a neighborhood school, no matter what STEM falsely advertised to the Sterling Ranch community with their flyers and during their December information session with a big cake from Costco. That is false. A neighborhood school is required to accept all children living within their boundary lines and without the use of a lottery system or capping attendance. In a neighborhood school, everyone is welcome, and education is provided that is well-rounded and includes STEM. We do live in the 2022 20, year. They cannot say no to kids with disabilities, and if they can't be serviced, if a kid with a disability on an IEP that has extensive minutes cannot be serviced, a neighborhood school will work extensively to find them a place where faith can be offered. Unlike STEM, who can tell a family they can't provide the support the IEP is deeming necessary. In 2020, 11.6% of Colorado students altogether in the state were, had an identified disability, compared to a STEM school in Highlands Ranch, which only had 6.5% identified. This is from a Center for Special Education and Charter Schools report that was done the same year. At the front of our neighborhood is a perfect land. It's right there where everybody can see, and it's ready to go for a school. We would hate to see that land go to, go to STEM Sterling Ranch, as this is the land that is most visible of all the plots allotted in Sterling Ranch. How is it that they, you can drive by a school, by a neighborhood, and see a STEM school, however that school, who is allowed to call our neighborhood home, does not let every student call it theirs? STEM should not take up the only plot of land ready for a school in our neighborhood and call it their home. Currently, as stated by our CFO a few years back, our district is already saturated with charter schools, especially in the Highlands Ranch area. There's a STEM school already 10 minutes away that is able to be accessed by the families choosing to do so. I'm asking us to work together as a community and school district to approve a bond to be placed on the 22, 2022 ballot to work towards a neighborhood school before approving a STEM charter application. Please help us in building our community and approving a bond on the ballots this year and working together to build a neighborhood that deserves a neighborhood school that deserves all and accepts all that there will and knowing that there will be other plots of land within the Sterling Ranch community available down the road for a variety of communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Dotson. Janine McDonald, Michelle Superat, Nicole Bostel. Ms. McDonald. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I'm Janine McDonald and I'm a parent in Sterling Ranch. You've heard us over and over since December. You've heard the residents of Sterling, Sterling Ranch speak about the true need in our community, which is a neighborhood school. We do not need a charter school that is also currently only 10 minutes away. We have an abundance of schools to choose from and only 26 kids from Sterling Ranch currently attend the STEM elementary school. Almost 300 kids choose to attend other elementary schools. Not even 100 people are following the STEM Sterling Ranch Facebook page and the majority of comments are negative. About half of the people that attended their community meeting were in opposition of the school. As we talked when we met Christy and uh, Mike, there was a laundry list of problems that, were, that are going on at STEM and are continuing right now. Not only did the replication officer just resign, who started three months ago, but they continue to have high turnover of teachers, which they cover up by changing the name of positions so they don't have to report it. 
We are aware of at least five state complaints and four federal complaints. STEM has settled with multiple families accompanied by non-disclosure agreements. And most currently, STEM goes to trial in September concerning the wrongful death of Kendra Castillo. Shouldn't we wait until we find out if the school is at all liable before opening up more schools with the same leadership? As a current parent of a child at STEM told me, STEM has no business opening another seconds. school right now. I know all seven of you agree passing a bond and an MLO is something that needs to happen to ensure the success of our district. So I hope you can work together and make this a priority and do what it takes now to ensure this possibility in November. Please listen to the residents. Give Sterling Ranch the chance to have what they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Michelle Superat, Nicole Bostel, followed by Chris Mann. Ms. Superat. Good evening. I'm speaking tonight to urge you to show your unwavering support for Lehman Academy to build a second school. This is honestly an easy vote. Probably the easiest vote that you've had since the new board members have taken office. Our family has had the privilege of having four of our children attend Lehman, and I have the distinct honor of teaching there. I can attest to several of the things Dr. Edwards has already mentioned. Enrollment requests continue to climb. The demand is clearly there. Based on how many immediately wanted the second school in the survey came out, and also the increasing enrollment numbers. Parents are absolutely craving the type of education that Lehman is proud to offer. A school that truly focuses on parent-teacher relationship. A school that models virtues and values that emphasis, uh, emphasizes real history and rich literature. Teachers that truly care for your child and work hard to create a family in their classrooms. The positive climate and culture offered at Lehman is unparalleled. I'm passionate about this school. It's truly a school of excellence. <clears throat> and I wholeheartedly believe seconds. in their mission statement. I know Lehman would proudly continue to serve and bless this community as it already has the past several years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Superat. Nicole Bostel, Chris DeMann, followed by Judy Brandberg. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I'm asking the board to please approve our application for replication for STEM School's Sterling Ranch. I joined the STEM School Highlands, um, the Highlands Ranch community as an employee in the fall of 2019, but my connection to STEM goes back further. With a niece and nephew that have been Spartans since a very young age, I want to share how much the school has helped my family. My nephew has ADHD and autism, and in his previous school, he struggled to create connections with others and find an identity. My niece was living in his shadow and trying to find her way. Within months of both attending STEM, they were thriving. They had found their home. Not only did they make those connections that, were so that we so desperately wanted them to have, but they also tapped into their imagination and creativity unlike anything we had ever seen. Through STEM's problem-based learning approach, both are pushing the boundaries of their learning and achieving way more than we could have possibly ever hoped for. It is for both of them and for the hundreds of other students just like them that I am so passionate about what we are doing and what we are offering. My belief in what we are doing is why I commute for an hour each way every single day. I could have had the opportunity to work closer to home, but I choose to get in the car and do that commute every day. And believe me, I'm not seconds. the only one who takes that big commute to be a part of the STEM magic. I'm sorry, I lost track and now I'm out of time, but thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Bostel. Krista Mann, Judy Brandberg, Barry Brandberg, Ms. Mann. Good evening, board. We began our DCSD experience with our son at his neighborhood school for the first two years of his formal education. During that time, I saw my son start to fall through the cracks. He entered first grade, meeting just about every benchmark for the end of the year. And upon voicing our concerns to the teacher and eventually the administration, we learned they were unable to provide our son with a differentiated learning to keep him engaged, even as a talented and gifted magnet school. I saw his love for learning and willingness to attend school diminish as a first grader. My husband and I were unwilling to let this be the trajectory of his school career and started exploring other options. One of the schools we toured was Lehman. And let me tell you, 
When they offered our son a spot for the next school year, we couldn't say yes fast enough. Upon our transition to Lehman, my son began to love going to school again and has been thriving for three years now. He is challenged academically and has the support of so many amazing educators. The opportunity to attend Lehman has been life-changing for our son and our family. I want to make it very clear that if Lehman was not a choice in this district, he would no longer be a student in DCSD. We find the quality of education and engagement by Dr. Edwards and the entire staff to be unmatched. I respectfully ask that the board approve the application for the second campus so that parents and students can have the choice and access to the level of education that Lehman provides. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mann. Judy Brandberg, Barry Brandberg, followed by Valerie Mundell. Good evening, my name is Judy Bramberg and I am the co-founder of the STEM School. Tonight, I am giving public comment in opposition to the replication of the STEM School for the following reasons. Number one, in 2014, STEM School experienced catastrophic financial failure because of fiscal mismanagement. With a $1.7 million deficit in a secret, under-the-table, non-transparent bailout, Douglas County co-signed and signed off on a $14.6 million SECFA bond, which STEM did not legally qualify for. And without meeting four of the seven contingencies for a legal five-year contract, STEM never had a legal parent complaint and communication policy from 2014 to the present because of what is published in the current handbook. STEM is at risk for another shooting and current students are not safe. Number two, on December 17, 2018, a STEM parent called DCSD and anonymously warned that parents are afraid to speak out because of illegal threats in the STEM handbooks. The parent Parents expressed con concerns about a repeat of Columbine or Arapahoe. On January 17, 2019, the STEM director personally sued the anonymous Jane Doe and selfishly built a firewall around her self-bullied parents and then left STEM, STEM students unprotected from the murderous shooting attack. Number three, in January 2014, the STEM director illegally disseminated to Douglas County a one-sided forgery of our mutual two-sided confidential separation agreement. Ms. Bramberg, if you could wait, I believe you're taking uh, Barry Barry's? Bramberg's time. Okay, yes. Thank you, your husband's time. Go ahead, Mr. Blair, thank you. Continue. Okay, their objective was to slander, disparage, and smear our excellent charter history and to bribe Douglas County into denying the creation of our school charters in 2014, 17, 18, and 19, our employment, property building, and land interests, which was breach of contract. On November 8, 2017, the Douglas County Board disseminated a forgery to our agreement to bribe the CCRD into denying our employment discrimination case. The original agreement stated any dissemination of any draft would be a violation of this agreement. Forgery and bribery are serious felonies with a penalty of jail time. In 2014 and 2017, both STEM and Douglas County breached our contract when they disseminated that forged agreement. Therefore, we demand that the STEM school be returned to our leadership and that our jobs be restored. From 2014 to the present, we warned Douglas County, STEM, the State Board of Ed, CCRD, UMB Bank, SEFCA, Sterling Ranch, Jeffco, and their 20 plus attorneys who did nothing to protect students nor to take remedial measures. Instead, Douglas County retaliated against us and voted to deny our school charters in 14, 17, 18, and 19. 15 Tonight, seconds. we call for the removal of directors Hanson, Meek, Ray, Director Euchre, and the STEM board because they breached our contract, failed to protect the safety and best interest of the students, engaged in criminal misconduct of forgery and bribery, and because of financial failure. Thank you, Ms. Brandberg. And I'll remind other speakers, please limit your comments and naming to the board of directors and let's leave other folks out of it. Thank you. Uh, Valerie Mundell, Jason Cassay, and Nicole Lindhart. Ms. Mundell. Um, my name is Valerie Mundell. My family's lived in Roxborough. Can you hear me? Has lived in Roxborough for 23 years. As a mom, I began to research the proposal of bringing another STEM charter school to Sterling Ranch and felt compelled to speak tonight. 
I believe charter schools are a successful educational option for many children. I investigated the original STEM school as it was opening in Highlands Ranch and liked their model for education. I cannot support the current STEM school coming to Sterling Ranch, however, for several reasons. Namely, I feel the practice policy recorded in the student handbook of not allowing students or parents to speak up creates an unsafe atmosphere. Um, at the time of the school shooting, um, I'm sorry, uh, um, a specific executive was warned, and I have the public, public documents um, here, and she, um, it, it talks about 14 serious problems that were going on, including the, the, the potential for another Columbine or Arapaho. The parent group was afraid to speak out, which is why they called the school board, not STEM, and anonymously reported it. She um, not only buried it, but then she sued Jane Doe because it was listed as a anonymous caller. Um, that is not transparency. That is not ethical. Um, they settled with the, um, the anonymous caller. Thank you, Ms. Mundell. Thank you. Jason Cassay, Nicole Linhart, followed by Roy Martinez. Mr. Cassay. Good evening, guys. Um, my wife and I are not anti-charter. In fact, our kids are attending one this August. We live in Sterling Ranch, and I want to ask the board to not approve STEM to be the first school in our community. What Sterling Ranch needs first is a public school that meets the needs of our neighborhood, and then charters can be built. Why STEM is not the right choice. They have a lottery system. Not all Sterling Ranch students can attend, and they are low on the priority list. It's initially going to be a K through 3, and yet their website is misleading everyone, saying that it's going to serve students K through 12. Sterling Ranch needs K through 6 from the start, and the three public elementary schools that, we curr that currently serve Sterling Ranch will be at or over capacity within the next few years. The commute from Sterling Ranch to STEM is the same 10 to 12 minutes for the three elementary schools, middle school, and high school zone for Sterling Ranch. There is little demand or need for a second STEM campus in Sterling Ranch with only 8% of the K through 6 students attending there. there. There's a less robust offering for IEPs and 504s than what DCSD offers. We were going to have significantly worse traffic due to the students commuting from outside of Sterling Ranch in an area that already has a traffic problem. The Waterton Road extension does nothing to alleviate the traffic coming south into Sterling Ranch from Santa Fe to where the school would be. STEM has, a, has high teacher and administrative turnover, a large number of parent complaints, as well as other controversies and lawsuits based on different documents seconds. submitted to the board. Please visit Sterling Ranch to speak with its residents. If an MLO bond doesn't pass this year, let's keep trying. It is far better to wait and have patience for the right school than to rush on impulse or just have any school and settle for something that doesn't serve our community needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassay. Nicole Linhart. Roy Martinez, and then we will transition to charter online speakers with Ms. Uh, Pal uh, let's see, Palermachuk. I'm sorry if I uh, did not get your names. No, Ms. Linhart, thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Linhart. I have been a STEM parent since 2013 when my oldest daughter uh, started there as a freshman. I love STEM. I, my son is there now. He's an eighth grader. I want him to continue to go there through high school. I, however, am finding myself surprised to say that I really am not in support of their replication into Sterling Ranch. I would like the STEM uh, leadership to focus on staff retention. Um, I think that's a bigger priority. I also would like students at STEM to feel safer in the building all students not, like danger-wise, I don't feel like my students are in danger. Um, I'm not concerned about it, an, another shooting, although my son was on the property when that happened. I am concerned, though, that not every student's viewpoint is respected. There's a large amount of alternative viewpoints that are highly supported at STEM, and students that have more conservative viewpoints are judged harshly for that or put down or bullied because of their viewpoints. And I believe in a school like STEM that all viewpoints are very important and should be recognized. 15 seconds. Um, so that is why at this point I cannot support the replication of STEM in Sterling Ranch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Linhart. Rory Martinez. Then we will go online with Ms. 
uh, Paula Marchuk, followed by Alina Cardellian. If I read, I can make 86 seconds. STEM School Highlands Ranch brings students back to the district. Our students hail from 63 different zip codes and in the past have traveled from Erie, Brighton, Bailey, and Colorado Springs. STEM has returned many homeschooled kids back to the DCSD system. They join our enrichment programs and learn that there is a public school that works for them. Instead of attending private schools, STEM provides many a chance to attend and learn how great our public schools are in DCSD. My family was one of those families. Many of our students will transition further into traditional district schools, especially for high school. We are ranked in the top 2% of best performing schools in the nation by US News. Approve our replication plan, support our community, and DCSD may soon be able to boast having two top 2% schools in the nation. Our students thrive. Going back to 2013, we've had STEM students get their science experiments included on the International Space Station. We have triathlon competitors and training Olympic hopefuls, patent holders, and grade school robot programmers. This year, we have two more seniors with appointments to the United States Air Force Academy and the United States Military Academy, West Point. Seconds. We have graduates attending Ivy League schools on full ride scholarships. We also have students not choosing college because they have 75,000 a year jobs waiting for them based on the certificates they earned at STEM. Approve our replication plan and give more DCSD families great opportunity to achieve their dreams too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. We'll now transition to our online charter school speakers for tonight. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Paula Marchuk, followed by Alina Cardalian, followed by Ms. Tatiana Valverde. Paula Marchuk is not online, so... Okay, we'll move on to Ms. Cardalian. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Hello, dear leaders, directors, and community. Thank you for this opportunity. I am a mom to a bilingual child. My son is exposed for four different languages at home, English, Armenian, Russian, and Ukrainian. Our family is coming from blended background of several ethnicities and cultures. We are excited about Novastar Academy and its academic proposal. My hope for my son is not to just learn literacy and numeracy, but deepen his knowledge and skills in STEAM project and earn a career certification when he graduates. My hope for my son is that he keeps his heritage languages and excels in English as well. We see Novastar offer to support gifted students, students learning languages and career education. We support Nova Star and think I will be a wonderful addition to the district schools. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. We'll have Ms. Tatiana Valverde, followed by Olga uh, Fujertos. Ms. Valverde. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, dear board directors, Douglas County administration and parents, um, thank you for this opportunity to share with you and the community. I will be pretty short. Uh, so my name is Tatiana Valverde and I am a teacher and instructor. I've been teaching English as second language classes to Novastar parents and community. And from a number of our parents, I would like to express our gratitude and hope for Novastar career, for, for Novastar charter approval. We believe in Novastar version, uh, vision of serving students with rigorous program that will prepare them for future jobs and careers. And, you know, we need a safe school where our community can thrive, sustain their heritage languages and become productive citizens of Colorado. So please consider approval for the charter, grading Novastar a chance to serve diverse learners. And thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Next will be Ms. Fujeros, followed by Ms. Rielvitz, followed by Alona Comerford. Next speaker is online, sir. Okay, we'll move to Rachel uh, Rielvitz if she is online. She is, we're asking to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. 
Um, as the Relvitz family and residents of Douglas County School District for almost five years now, we want to express our support for Nova Star Academy Charter School. Our ch children are at the impressionable ages of 10 and 7, and preparing them for college and life afterwards is of the utm utmost importance to us. We feel that Nova Star's high standards and rigorous academics help to ensure that that's an achievable success. We resonate with their core values after reading their mission statement. And for these reasons, we give them our full support. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Alona Comerford, Kara Schubert, followed by Yuri Kramen. Hello, my name is Alona Comerford and I'm a current resident of Sterling Ranch and a parent of STEM student. My nine-year-old son is finishing fourth grade at STEM elementary right now, and this also concludes our fourth year with STEM. My kiddo started school at kindergarten of a neighborhood district school and then transferred to STEM in first grade. His kindergarten year at the neighborhood school was good, but then we tried STEM. The hands-on PBL approach that STEM elementary is using has really sparked curiosity in my son like I haven't seen before. He also discovered his passion for technology and STEM, and now my fourth grader can do things that I can't, like code or build a website. But the most important change I see is the result of numerous group projects that kids work on at STEM, including PBL projects. My son now truly believes that people can accomplish more by working together rather than on their own. These kids brainstorm ideas together, pick best parts of what they come up with, divide their roles within the group based on who is good at what and who wants to work on what, and then they make the magic happen, ultimately allowing each kiddo to be the best version of themselves. And isn't that what we all want, for our kids to be the best version of themselves? Now, does this learning approach work for everyone? Probably not, but it works for many, 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 many children who can thrive with hands-on PBL-type learning environment that STEM provides. And that's where school choice becomes extremely important. Right now, all kids of Sterling Ranch have access to DCSD neighborhood schools with bus service and special needs resources. Access to STEM school, seconds. however, is limited because there's no bus service and spots are limited. Adding a STEM school in Sterling Ranch will not take away existing neighborhood DCSD schools, and it will not take away DCSD resources for special needs kids either. Instead, it will expand school choice for all. Thanks. Thank you. We'll now have Kara Schubert, Yuri Kramen, followed by Lubo Kazachuskaya. Ms. Schubert. Kara Schubert with Okay, Yuri Kramen. Or, I'm sorry, you're asking to unmute? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Kramen, can you hear us? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, uh, hello everyone. And um, uh, let me start with expressing my gratitude to all of you for this opportunity to share at public comments time. I'm a pastor at Bethel Community Church, and I would like to speak as a community leader and as a parent of two wonderful daughters. Uh, our children's education is critical to us, and we opt for the schools of choice for our daughters. And the reason we did that is uh, to give them a rigorous academics uh, foundations and prepare them for college. And as a community leader, and uh, I've been serving our community for over 20 years now. I understand how important uh, it is for our children to grow and study in safe and family-oriented environment. And Novastar has been building that environment as a family encompassing diverse communities. They've been building that, and I really strongly stand behind uh, the school, Novastar, and I strongly believe they can accomplish their mission and vision meeting the needs of our children to uh, grow and be leaders in this uh, changing world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kramen. Uh, we will now have uh, Ms. Kazachu, or Mr. Kazachu Skaya, followed by Karen Pennington, followed by Jeannie Brevort. Hello. My name is Lebo Kozachevska and I'm mother of a five-year-old son and I'm very excited to be here with you today and to be able to support Navarstar Academy as I strongly believe that the Academy will provide our kids with high standards of education due to excellent curriculum, unique schedule 
and diversity of students, as well as flexibility in individual goals that will allow our kids to become great professionals in the future and valuable members of our society. I would be very pleased to send my son to North Star Academy uh, if you allow it to be approved. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Next will be Karen Pennington and then the last charter school commenter, Jeannie Brevroot. Ms. Pennington. Yes, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Okay, my name is Dr. Karen Pennington. I have three grandchildren in the district. This is very simple and short. I fully support charter school options for our students in Douglas County. All parents need options, not just wealthy families that can afford a private education. Although these comments may not reflect Douglas County, I feel that they are noteworthy. Per the Federal Department of Education, um, outcomes are not always stellar across public education. Prior to COVID, 64% of third graders in public education nationally were not at a third grade level, and 66% of sixth graders were not at a sixth grade reading level. As indicated by the DOE, these figures were not the result of COVID. Parents need options for their children's education. As parents, we carried these kids for nine months. We birthed them. Oh, that was fun. We fed them. We clothed them. We socialize them for school. We should have a say in their education. I'm opposed to parents not having a voice and not having a chance to comment on what is taught and where they attend. We, the families, bear the brunt of poor education for seconds. our children. Not the state. The state does not bear that brunt in the same degree that parents do. Thus, we need a voice and a choice on where we send our children, the curriculum, and what is suitable for their. Thank you, Ms. Pennington. Our last online speaker for charters will be Jeannie Brevroot, and then we will transition back to live public comments, starting with Amity Wicks, followed by Jennifer Iverson. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Perfect. My name is Jeannie Brevort. It's a tough last name, I know. And I'm a parent of kids who attend STEM school Highlands Ranch. I'm here to speak in favor of replication. Our school has seen some dark days, and I know that some people want to highlight our darkest days. I get that. I live them too, and so did my kids. But we're not stuck there, and I'm here to tell you that our best days are happening now. I have five kids at STEM. We are moving into our seventh year. I have an 11th grader, 10th grader, 7th grader, and two 5th graders, elementary, middle school, and high school. We have a wide variety of learners in our household. I have kids who perform at the top of their classes and kids who need social and academic support. Each of them keeps choosing STEM. Because they choose STEM, I had to make a decision. I decided to help. I stepped up, I joined the PTO and our DEI committee. Since my kids chose STEM, I'm determined to help make it better. I want you to know that we are a community. We are working together. Our SAC and PTO is strong. Our board of directors are mostly parents. We are working together. I'm thankful that one school can serve all the needs of my kids. The PBL model keeps my kids engaged and interested. They ask great questions and they want to solve real world problems. I want more kids to experience what my kids have. 15 seconds. I am in favor of replication. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brevoort. We'll now transition back to general public comment. First speaker will be Amity Wicks, followed by Jennifer Iverson, followed by Megan Birch. Ms. Wicks. I've provided copies of an email dated January 21st, 2021, where hypocritically, Director Ray reminds other board members of board governance policy 1.8.6 that he states in quotes, Members will respect and support the legitimacy and authority of all board decisions, irrespective of the member's personal position on the matter. The irony is so rich. Director Ray is violating this policy consistently with continuous noise, narrative, and subterfuge of duly elected board. He should resign or be removed. Also note that in January, in January 2021, Director Ray was no longer using his expired LPC candidate designation, but it did appear in his email signature throughout the end of 2021 and in his February 1st, 2022 email to Director Peterson, last page in your packets. 
This makes one thing painfully clear regarding Director Ray. He had to proactively go back into his email program and re-add his LPCC designation after it had already expired. This is clearly not some accidental oversight. It is a clear decision to misrepresent his professional designations. It is a lie. David, this issue is not going away. Your actions as a member of this board are reprehensible. You're, you are sowing division and discord in our community and you should resign. You've clearly done much more harm than good in this role and the sooner the children of DCSD are protected from you, the better. Seconds. You're dishonest and divisive. Thank you, Ms. Swicks, Jennifer Iverson, Megan Birch, Lucy Spire. Ms. Iverson. Hi, I'll be reading for Jennifer Iverson. Thank you for actively listening to my concerns tonight. I'd like to repeat my apprehension about STEM opening a charter in Sterling Ranch before a neighborhood school can be built for all levels of learning. Many know and have experienced the struggles STEM of Highlands Ranch has in adequately teaching students with IEPs and 504s. STEM's common practice of counseling out students so that their test results look competitive is unethical. The toxic environment that a certain individual creates at STEM led to the departure of 40% of secondary teachers just last school year. Eight out of 10 administrators left as well. This isn't the first mass exodus under her guidance. STEM has problems. It is unstable under current leadership. DCSD does not need more problems. Our community needs, needs solutions like a neighborhood school would provide for all students at all levels of learning. Last week, an organization called FAIR targeted a beloved school on social media. This wasn't their first attack on Crest Hill Middle School. This school has been a beacon of hope for many families with children experiencing trauma and mental health struggles. It is extremely distressing me that a certain individual continues to encourage division and bullying behaviors without consequences. If any student acted this way, there would be disciplinary actions against them. With these documented actions to intimidate our teachers, staff, and community, should this certain individual remain on the Equity Advisor Committee? Is it ethical for DCSD to continue having conversations with people who incite these behaviors? Lastly, March's core requests have not been released for the first time in my memory. It's April 25th. Can we expect a continued lack of transparency from the legal department? Is there some other reason for the enormous delay in these records? Please show your integrity by responding to this inquiry. Thank you. Thank you for Ms. Iverson, Megan Birch, Lucy Squire, followed by Will Johnson. Ms. Birch. Good evening, my name is Megan Birch. I'm the parent of two DCSD students. I'm here to address the recent discrimination complaint filed against DCSD, specifically the claim that the individual respondents, the majority board members, expressed animosity towards LGBTQ staff and students. Sadly, as the parent of LGBTQ youth, I agree with that statement. You have made harmful coded statements about the LGBTQ community, such as allegations of an LGBTQ agenda, implying that curriculum or books that affirm LGBTQ youth are sexual in nature, pathologizing the LGBTQ community. You passed a resolution to the equity policy that lumped our staff and students into common humanity and validating specific needs or potential harm that can be experienced with identity and lived experiences. You have permitted coded homophobic and transphobic statements in public comment, mocking LGBTQ affirming books, gender identity, and students' use of pronouns, when I came to you board members with these concerns and the harm that was being created for LGBTQ youth, the response I got back was, some people just don't play nice. I want to make it very clear the impact that you are having on the LGBTQ students in this district. You are telling our youth you do not belong and there is something wrong with you. LGBTQ students are more than four seconds. times likely to attempt suicide, and that is a direct result of the hostility they experience. I hope you see this as an invitation into accountability and to create repair and to be in dialogue with LGBTQ students and their parents and caregivers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birch, Lucy Squire, Will Johnson, followed by Patty Hickley, or Hickey, excuse me. Good evening. I was recently asked what I would like to see the board focus on based on my perspective as a teacher. Number one, please stop saying that we need to return to academics. This implies that we have not been focused on academics. The last two years have been the hardest and most challenging for schools, teachers, students, administrators, parents, you name it. Successfully navigating all of the schedules and changes throughout the last two years while continuing to balance student absences and quarantines for various periods of time, the only consistent thing with schools the last two years has been the inconsistencies. These things don't fall on any one person because it's been pretty COVID-y out there and I think we've been pretty successful in navigating through it all. 
In addition to these COVID challenges, we've also been working to fill in the academic gaps from the remote learning in 2020 and the inconsistencies of last year while also still covering all of the grade level content we're required to teach. The expectations of what we teach has not changed, nor has the rigor in which we teach. I urge you as new board members to get into the schools to see what we're actually teaching. Come see what our students, especially in our elementary schools, are learning. Come see your curriculum and our resources so you can speak to facts and not the boogeyman of theories. But please stop saying we need to return to academics. Number two, do the work as new board members to learn about how to seconds. do your jobs as elected officials so that you can support all of your community. In doing so, you can show your support for educators, school staff, administrators, students, parents, and community members. You can also begin to speak to the things actually happening in classrooms and schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Squire. Will Johnson, Patty Hickey, followed by Kevin DePasquale. Mr. Johnson. Good evening. I'm part of a group called FAIR, and where we promote a culture of treating kids as individuals, embracing our common humanity, and academic excellence. I recently shared a picture that a concerned teacher sent us. My post was misinterpreted by people outside of our group, and I assume they shared their displeasure with you. So I wanted to clarify several things about it. We all want welcoming classrooms for all students. And I'm sure the picture in this class was intended to foster that and had messages that we can agree with. But to create that welcoming and kind classroom, does each child need to believe that their own gender is fluid or believe certain things about minimum wage policies? And is it a school's role to deliver that message? And parents have a right to know what their kids are being told to believe. But the main point I wanted to clarify is this. We aren't encouraging parents to disrespect teachers. If parents have concerns, they should engage their child's teachers and schools in a respectful manner, knowing that we all have positive intent. We talk a lot about this in our group and have seen numerous examples of doing this well. We also aren't trying to pit teachers against each other. Teachers have a right to diversity of thought. And if they aren't comfortable sharing those thoughts internally, Parents from cl the classroom or school can still constructively support them via, via the appropriate 15 process. 15 seconds. The overall goal, though, is for parents, teachers, and schools to partner together to help create a culture where all kids can thrive. It's natural to have disagreements on how best to accomplish this, but the partnership should start from a place of mutual respect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Patty Hickey, Kevin DePasquale, followed by Carolyn Williamson. Good evening. The current divisiveness happening within our district couldn't be more apparent. Board members who choose to attend events hosted by political groups that foster an extremist national agenda, setting the framework to dismantle public education is frightening. I'm referencing the Lincoln Club of Colorado Luncheon in which Director Peterson attended a few weeks ago. The Lincoln Club is a program it promotes educational and social programs of the Republican Party and supports elections of Republican candidates. Director Peterson, your speech at the luncheon was titled, Taking Back Our Schools, the State of Education in, in Douglas County. This makes no sense at all, implying that our teachers and students have somehow not been successful. You couldn't be more wrong. Misinformation and gaslighting by creating fear and panic when it doesn't exist. Three quotes from your speech. Students are being indoctrinated by teachers who are bringing supplemental materials about sex into the classroom, creeping into the district. Somehow teachers are being inappropriate with students, really? Two, battling activism in our schools. There's no problem when students walked out in protest of mass, but you have a problem with teachers protesting the firing of Corey Wise and your illegal actions. 15 seconds. Remember, the right to organize freedom of speech and peaceful assembly. And last, you're gonna see the collective bargaining come in that self-licking ice cream cone. What does that mean? Um, teachers just wanna be valued, heard, and respected for their work. Please get off your political podium and do real school board work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hickey. <laughs> Kevin DePasquale, Carolyn Williamson, and Amy Winju. Mr. DePasquale. Good evening. I'm Kevin DePasquale, president of the Douglas County Federation. Many people here tonight know me only because the Federation tends to get men mentioned lately in the press and by some members of this board. I stand before you today because I'm afraid and disappointed for my community and schools. 
We have seen too many articles about actions and behaviors that are not about learning and student needs within DCSD in recent months. Since November, there have been seven special board meetings and not one of them has been about students. My main point tonight is that after the last two very tough years, it's time to move forward. It's time to work together and unite for our students. And I'm hoping that this board will lead the way. We need to end the toxicity and division in this district and concentrate on making our schools the great public schools our kids deserve. Everything, and I mean everything, we do right now should be focused on improving our kids' education. Everything else is an unnecessary sideshow. We need you guys, as the board, to move from a top-down decision-maker mindset to one of how can we partner with parents, students, administrators, teachers, and school staff to make our schools better. I can tell you that if you can do this, teachers seconds. and school staff and the Douglas County Federation will be overjoyed to partner with you. All we're asking is for this board to set the tone and lead the way. Let's put aside the political divisions and unite for the sake of our kids and their futures. Let's do whatever it takes to give our children the best education they deserve. Thank you, Mr. D. Pasquale, Carolyn Williamson, Amy Winchu, followed by Tiffany Wilson. Okay, the audience, can we be quiet and do we have Miss Williamson here? I do not see Miss Williamson, Amy Winchu, Tiffany Wilson, followed by Heidi Carrero. Good evening. Um, I'm going to speak about David Ray's, Elizabeth Hansen, and Susan Meek's role in bringing teacher union activity to the district. Meek was director of communications for an organization called Great Education Colorado for over three years. It's tied to teacher unions and promotes grassroots activism, AKA social justice in the classroom. The three minority board members hired Corey Wise. Wise held monthly meetings with senior leadership of the American Federation of teachers throughout the time that he worked here. The three and wise were instrumental in the formation of the Educational Equity Committee. On January 31st, the minority board members held an open Zoom meeting call with the intent to bring union activity led by Kevin De Pasquale of the Douglas uh, County Ms. Federation. Ms. if we can limit our responses and remarks to the board members, please, thank you. Yes, sir. Of teacher unions front and center into Douglas County that cost kids a day of school. These minority board members would love it if the teachers union used taxpayer dollars to indoctrinate Douglas County students with divisive identity politics. They owe the students, the teachers, the parents and the community an apology. Thank you, Ms. Winju, Tiffany Wilson, Heidi Corot, followed by Lydia Hayes. Ms. Wilson. Thank you. I'm here today to express my concerns over the intentions of the plaintiff in the DCSD versus Mr. Marshall court case. The plaintiff has cost our school district over 100,000 in the past year due to his involvement in three lawsuits. The plaintiff is currently not an active lawyer, according to uh, lawyers.com, yet refers to himself as such. This seems somewhat similar to a board member referring to himself as a counselor. This individual is a known antagonist with multiple appearances at peaceful rallies with a sheer goal to be a disruptor. He is known to don Trump apparel and wave Confederate flags by instigating a hostile environment. I have asked this individual multiple times if he has kids or grandkids in his county, what his intentions are, who is helping him fund these lawsuits and the intent to run as a state representative, I get crickets. Let it be known that this individual threatens to sue those who question him. He blocks him from his public office social media accounts and requests his records for campaign fundraising to be kept confidential. What is being hidden? As a man who wore the uniform of a United States Marine, it's shameful. As a granddaughter, daughter, niece, and sister of US Marines, I am embarrassed. The wars my family fought in were to protect the very things that this individual is trying to take away from our kids and this school district. 
Please do not be fooled. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I support the majority seconds. members in appealing the DCSD versus, versus Marshall case. We need to stand up for justice before and truth before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson, Heidi Caro, Lydia Hayes, and then Iko Browning. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I am currently a Douglas County teacher and I absolutely love my job. I feel very lucky to teach with an awesome admin team, amazing teachers and families, but board majority members, you make it very difficult for us to do our job to the best of our ability. You see, we watch your board meetings and then have to teach the next day feeling confused, anxious, and worried. I realize that the majority board may not care what I have to say this evening, so tonight I'm really addressing the parents and teachers who are listening right now. Parents, talk to your children's teachers and speak up at these board meetings about the foolishness of this board. Teachers, I encourage you to be brave and speak about what your school needs and maybe cannot afford due to our board spending. With these current lawsuits, we are dwindling away money that could go directly to students. Here's where the litigation money could go. We've been told that there is no money for these items next year. Buzzers for fourth grade science experiments, cardstock, tech subscriptions, electric pencil sharpener, personal laminators, copies, expo markers, science consumables, stamps for projects, class set of protractors, whiteboards, clipboards, class set of rulers, social studies curriculum with consumables, and math games for rotations. Did you know that substitutes have to come out of our school budget? Also, seconds. technology funds for all schools each year as devices age out year after year. We don't fundraise enough compared to other schools to pay for this. Please, teachers and parents, I urge you to speak on behalf of your neighborhood schools. What are your needs? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Groh, Lyd Lydia Hayes, Iko Browning, followed by Robert Marshall. Ms. Hayes. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to share my truth. I started teaching in August 2004. My entire teaching career has been in Douglas County and has been at one amazing neighborhood school. I am also a DCSD parent. This is my first time coming to a board meeting and making a public comment. And first, I want to thank all the brave staff, students, family, and community members who have come to share their stories. You are amazing and have inspired me to be here today. I want to share about my neighborhood school. I believe my story is not unique. I believe it is like other neighborhood schools in Douglas County. My team and I start our day standing outside our classroom doors to welcome our students. We students and teachers have morning meetings daily. We look each other in the eyes when we talk. We share stories about our backgrounds, families, cultures, and traditions. We have disagreed and agreed. We know hearing a different perspective from our own is powerful. We are open to learning and growing. We are writers, readers, and thinkers. We meet kids where they're at and we give them what they need so they're all successful. We believe in equity for all. We are scientists, mathematicians, historians, geographers. We learn how to be citizens who stand up for what we believe in. We have lunch bunches. We play outside together and we hold each other accountable. We are family. This is a very short list of what my life is like at my neighborhood school. I applaud the families from Sterling Ranch who continue to fight for a neighborhood school. You want what seconds. we have. I hope you get it. We are rooting for you. I also want to put on record that like many teachers in DCSD staff, there are a number of things that weigh heavy on my heart about the current direction of our school district, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to come back here in the future to share my concerns. Thank you, Ms. Hayes, Iko Browning, Robert Marshall, Brandy Bradley. President Peterson, directors, and Superintendent Kane, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Aiko Browning. I am a Douglas County resident, taxpayer, and parent with two kids enrolled in Douglas County School District. I oppose the proposed STEM school expansion in Sterling Ranch. I have two kids, one of whom receives special educational support through the significant special needs program. My son would never be able to obtain his education at a charter school. It is not right to build a charter school in the Sterling Ranch neighborhood before building a true neighborhood public school that can serve all children. If the board approves this proposed STEM expansion in Sterling Ranch before building a true neighborhood public school, then you will have demonstrated to the Douglas County community that you support charter public schools over neighborhood public schools to the detriment of children with significant disabilities. 
I would also like to bring to the board's attention the comments of a board director at the Lincoln Club. This director said, quote, you're gonna see the collective bargaining come in, that self-licking ice cream cone, where the teachers union funnels money into candidates to get elected to the school board, then they negotiate with the candidates that they funded for more union dues, and on and on it goes. That's where they come in, end quote. Do you refer to the firefighters union as a self-licking ice cream cone? Do you refer to the police union as a self-licking ice cream cone? Do you refer to the DCSD bus drivers collective bargaining union agreement as a self-licking ice cream cone? 15 seconds. Why it is do you refer to the teachers union as a self-licking sweet treat? Could it be that you do so because education is a women dominated field? Why is it you believe that educators should not have the right to collective bargaining to work toward improved working conditions? Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Browning. Robert Marshall, Brandy Bradley, followed by Jenny Brady. I'd prefer to be up here talking about voc tech and the education of the kids in our district, but rather than the deranged and dishonest character assassinations that take place, I actually have real issues with the integrity, ethics, and legal uh, conduct of this board. You filed a motion for reconsideration yesterday, and yet, uh, Nowhere is Hall and Evans anywhere on the filings. They haven't been on the filings the last couple weeks. Did you already make uh, Blue and Gessler the lead counsel? What kind of backroom dealings is going on now? Or did Hall and Evans not want to have anything more to do with you once it was found out that Weiss actually has a tape recording of Peterson and Williams' conversations with him, which very unlikely will conform to what you actually testified under oath in court? These are very serious problems and issues. Where's Mr. Trockman? He's not been around ever lately. Why is that? From my understanding, he withdrew. And apparently, he must have withdrawn right after I sent a certain email to the entire board and the general counsel. I've been asking for that withdrawal. We don't have it, and it's not privileged, and we are likely going to another Cora suit in court, which I will win. This board said they'd be transparent. Seconds. Where are the Estes Park benders? Where are they? You want to be transparent? Why don't you produce them? That's going to be part of the core suit you're going to be facing again. Why do you not produce them? And don't be so coy. A lot of the information I'm getting is coming from Thank your Thank you, support. Mr. Marshall. Brandy Bradley, Jenny Brady, followed by Spencer Payton. Oh, good evening. David Ray, you've held yourself up as a licensed mental health professional during your time as our former president of our school board, leading discussions and pushing the negative parts of SEL onto our youngest children and giving mental health recommendations through various mental health panel discussions, all while falsifying your credentials as an LPCC or licensed professional counselor candidate. In January 2021, you were no longer using your expired LPCC designation, but it did appear in all of your email signatures throughout the end of 2021, and in a February 2022 email to Mike Peterson, which Amity provided a copy of. This makes it very clear that you had to proactively go back into your email program and re-add the LPCC de designation after it already expired. This is clearly not some accidental oversight, but an attempt to build yourself up into something you're not in the eyes of teachers, staff, parents, and students. We want a public answer to this as a door complaint has already been filed. If it was any of the new board majority members that falsified their licensure, you would demand their heads on a platter, and we all know who would file yet another frivolous lawsuit. How hypocritical is that you, David Ray, and your supporters are suing, accusing the four majority board members for a lack of transparency, integrity, and truth, while you fraudulently portray yourself as a licensed professional when seconds. you, in fact, knowingly were not? Thank you, Ms. Bradley, Jenny, Jenny Brady, Spencer Payton, followed by Anthony Hartsook. Jenny Brady. Hi, guys. Um, there is a predominant culture in the schools right now, a culture of anti-freedom, whereas parents are scared to come forward and question teachings that are happening in the classroom. They are afraid to share their stories in fear of retaliation against their children. Most stories revolve around social emotional learning topics, restorative justice, or even teaching sexuality in lower elementary classrooms. Stories do not, these stories that parents are telling me do not revolve around math problems or dissecting a cricket. 
These parents and even teachers that elevate concerns are not racists or bigots, yet they are treated like it. Demanding children to participate in the critical pedagogy ideology is immoral, and what's more evil is expecting parents to turn a blind eye to this. This culture change is about parents owning their children's education and the freedom to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brady, Spencer Payton, Anthony Hartsook, followed by Matthew Solak. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Spencer Payton. I am speaking today as a private citizen on a matter of public concern, that being the recent conduct of the current school board. However, before that, I want everyone, literally everyone here, um, to know that as a first year teacher in DCSD and recent migrant to Colorado, I can be as objective as I want. I am naive to the history of this district and its policies. And personally, I can tell you this, you can check, I have no allegiances to any political parties or schools of thought. I only want right now to take the opportunity to highlight my observations that show what is not working in this district. First, teachers are paid unfairly in DCSD. The current pay scale offers around a 3% increase in pay per year at best. With inflation being estimated at 7% this past year, staying in DCSD means our pay will not only stagnate, but effectively decrease. Secondly, regardless of the people involved, because I don't care about your parties, I saw as a first year teacher in your district, the superintendent be fired without valid cause or explanation. As an employee, what do you think this represents to me? In times like these, people want stability and your actions thus far have not demonstrated that I can trust this district with my family's future. Lastly, to add insult to injury, the current school board appointed a clear conflict of interest to fill the void seconds. they created. Between the text messages and board retreat, it cannot be more clear this board has acted unethically and unfairly. So what do we do about this problem? We need to take the money out of our politics to take the politics out of our school. We need election law reform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payton, Anthony Hartsook, Matthew Solak, and Lucas, I believe the last name is John, none provided. Good evening, this is Anthony Hartsook. Frivolous lawsuits and harassment of our new board members do not help the education of our kids. Whining and pouting of some board members because they don't get their way is unproductive and unprofessional. We elected a new board to change the direction and we're excited about that change. Kids develop self-confidence and moral character through truth and competition. Competition drives excellence in everything, academics, athletics, and business. We must encourage competition and truth in our schools. Strong families with confident kids build strong communities. Strong communities ensure public safety and parental involvement ensures truth in our kids' education. By seeking truth and justice, we ensure a better society. Analysis and critical thinking are essential. Therefore, we must ensure high academic standards and integrity, competition, analysis, and critical thinking across the entire scholastic spectrum. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Hartsett. Matthew Solak, Lucas John, followed by Matthew Smith. Mr. Solak. Hello, my name is Matthew Solak. I'm a teacher at Legend High School, a parent of a DCSD student, and a proud member of the union. Uh, the luncheon at the Lincoln Club of Colorado on March 23rd was both, both enlightening and raised many questions. While a director there warned of left-wing liberal narratives trying to demonize the board majority, I would like everyone to be aware that there are narratives on both sides. The idea that there is a boogeyman union and activist teachers in the classroom is a right-wing narrative that is blown way out of proportion. The, that director stated that you fired uh, Corey Wise and hired Aaron Kane in part to stomp out teacher activism in the classroom. I'm interested in what this looks like. What makes a teacher an activist? What do you mean by activism? What does a t or when does a teacher cross the line into activism? How will the new superintendent hold activist teachers accountable? 
Part of Aaron Kane's entry plan into, uh, is to build trust and establish a positive culture and climate. How in the world could labeling teachers as activists and threatening to come after them build trust or establish a positive culture and climate? This kind of rhetoric damages our district. Since you seem to feel free to discuss your motivations and seconds. plans at a private luncheon and unwilling to share those in public, then let the narratives run wild. Until you are honest with the public, we are left only to speculate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solak. Lucas John, Matthew Smith, and May Sands. Uh, Lucas Johnson. <laughs> Good evening, directors and Director Ray. It is particularly great to see you here tonight. I am so happy to see that you have exited your toddler temper tantrum and have returned to your duties serving the Douglas County electorate. Congratulations and welcome back. Regarding tonight's action item, I support the board's decision to retain outside counsel, counsel in the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education and encourage you to identify Gessler Blue as lead counsel. The general public should be reminded that the narrative regarding the majority board directors violating Sunshine laws is a false narrative. It is a lie. The judge's ruling is a classic case of judicial activism that relies upon the legal precedents of other states but has no basis in Colorado law. I encourage the board to appeal the lawsuit and preliminary injunction, as the case could have far-reaching consequences for the public policy making in this district and across the state. The majority board has the right to defend the district and themselves against frivolous lawsuits and deserve skilled representation. Furthermore, I take exception to Biden Bob's false narrative and lie that our board directors are wasting district financial Again, resources. Again, Mr. Johnson, please confine your comments to the board. Thank you. It is he who is stealing resources away from our children and the county citizenry by supporting and initiating numerous frivolous lawsuits. He has staged lawsuits and publicity studs to fashion himself as a community activist in order to gather support for his political campaign. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Matthew Smith, May Sands, followed by Lorraine Ball. Mr. Smith. Good evening, um, evening, everyone. I'd like to echo that. Thanks, Director Ray, for showing up tonight. And, you know, there's been a lot of comments on the LPCC issue, and I'd like to be part of the solution. So I brought you a book, Counseling Skills for Dummies. Um, so I thought maybe you could study this, and, and it would help you on your path back to that LPCC. Um, I've been reading through it. There's some great stuff in there. And, you know, there's really not um, any conservative talking points. So I just want to make sure. I'm not trying to feed you some uh, propaganda here. I'm going to start going up through the list here. Um, I've learned a lot this month, and I have a lot of hope um, that white males can file discrimination suits. Um, so I, I thought those days were done, but, you know, Corey Wise has proved me long, wrong on that one. And it's, it's great to, that he finally went on the record uh, with his love of masking and, and his involvement in the mask lawsuits and also his um, overwhelming support of the um, Equity Advisory Council. So I know he kind of danced around that topic for a while, but now we have that in writing. So that was great to see. Um, you know, I, we've had a lot of talk of the MLO, and I just really, you know, I, I really can't get there. There's about 1,200 reasons why I cannot, uh, you know, support the MLO. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, the, you, you know all the teachers that uh, protested. Seconds. And then, you know, um, nothing be done being done about it um, within the district. Yes, there is freedom of speech. Yes, there is freedom of protest, but you don't get to organize uh, walkouts and then, you know, just get away with it scot-free. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mary Sands, Lorraine Bowl, and then we will transition to online with Tiffany Baker. Ms. Sands. Okay, it does not appear Ms. Sands is present. Lorraine Bowl. I'm Lorraine Bull, co-leader of the Douglas County Chapter of FAIR and the state coordinator for FAIR. I'm here to comment on misinformation about FAIR that's been disseminated during board meetings, on social media, and in the local media. 
We held a virtual open house for our community last night in an effort to counter this dishonest narrative and provide an opportunity for attendees to ask questions of Brian Bartoning, the founder of FAIR, and three members of FAIR's Board of Advisors. Anyone who is interested was welcome to attend. There is a contingency in our community who is trying to silence FAIR's community of parents, grandparents, and teachers through name calling and intimidation. We will not be bullied into silence and we will continue to come forward with our opinions and perspectives, and we're transparent with our opinions. We're not an anonymous, faceless entity that defames others for expressing a counterpoint of view. I and other fair leaders in this room are available this evening to have a conversation about any issues with fair's position on a poster in a classroom or any other positions that we have taken. FAIR's Pledge of Understanding states that we seek to understand opinions or behavior that we do not agree with, and we consider points of view that are in conflict with our convictions. 15 seconds. We take this pledge seriously and look forward to hearing other points of view. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bull. Moving to online, Tiffany Baker, Julie Watkins, and Susanna Igilden. Ms. Baker. Has the board already decided who their lead counsel will be before this public meeting? Jeff Blue and Scott Gessler are alumni of Leadership Program of the Rockies, a right-wing political outside interest group alongside our superintendent and legal counsel, Will Trackman. Scott Gessler is a former Colorado Secretary of State who ran for governor. In his gubernatorial campaign video, he said, the liberal left, I think, is terrified that their backroom deals and their cozy status quo politics are threatened. Gessler, as a private attorney, helped Trump generate the big lie by serving as a testifying expert in election challenges in Nevada and Pennsylvania. Now he represents Tina Peters, the Mesa County clerk accused of participating in a serious breach of election systems in her own office. Gessler Blue is also legal counsel for a Colorado Republican state lawmaker and a House candidate, Dave Williams, who filed a lawsuit last week to have the phrase, let's go Brandon, included as part of his name on a Republican primary ballot. The Colorado Independent Ethics Commission conducted an investigation against Scott Gessler that resulted in a unanimous vote finding that Gessler violated the state discretionary fund statute by spending roughly $2,000 in government money on travel surrounding a political event. The state of Colorado would ultimately pay the fees of both lawyers, which eventually seconds. totaled over $515,000 after Gessler appealed the finding in court. He could have just paid the $2,000. We're supposed to trust his law firm to have the best interests of Doug Co. taxpayers in mind? Would selecting Gessler Blue for political reasons be a misuse of district? Thank you, Ms. Baker, Julie Watkins, Susanna Eigelden, followed by Chad Cox. Ms. Watkins. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can, go ahead. Great, good evening. I'm a member and I'm speaking on behalf of Doug Co. Collective, which is a nonpartisan 501c4 organization dedicated to educating the community on public education issues that impact the district. We are a collective mem of members of the DCSD community. We are parents, teachers, staff, students, and community members who care about the success of our school district. We believe in quality, inclusive, and equitable public education. I was planning to read a statement that was issued earlier today by the DECO Collective in response to an op-ed published in Sunday's Denver Post, but the 90-second limit makes that impossible, so I'm instead going to read some excerpts and I will email the board our statement in its entirety. We at DECO Collective believe it is an obligation to highlight misinformation when we see it. Krista Kafer's lawsuit from ousted DECO superintendent is laughable, opinion piece, in the Denver Post on April 24th is an example of pushing misinformation for the benefit of entertainment. Filled with inaccuracies and bias, her opinions fuel the fire of divisiveness and extremist ideologies. If we are to continue down this path of divisive partisan dog whistles, attempts to sanitize curriculum and policies, and outright mistruths, we will continue to see our students underperform. If a district seconds. of distinction is the goal, equity and inclusive policies are the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watkins, Susanna Igilden, Chad Cox, and then we will go back to Tatiana Palomarchuk, who is now online. So, uh, Ms. Igilden. She is not online, sir. Okay, Chad Cox. Hello, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. I too would like to echo some of the words commented by 
a few of the committee or a few of the audience members. Um, Director Ray, Hansen, and Meek, I actually do want to thank you for being here tonight, um, but for various other reasons, um, mainly the reason to keep the board majority honest and uh, keep their integrity in check if they have any at all. Uh, additionally, I want to take a moment just to thank everybody that has made comments about our wonderful teachers in Douglas County. If you're so concerned about what's being taught in your students' classrooms, quit trying to make up lies like some of your house district candidates want to do and actually get up off your butts and go into the classrooms and talk to the teacher. You have the freedom to do that. I do it on a weekly basis. I talk to my teachers every single week about what's going on in the classroom with my students. I am actually involved. I'm not faking it. You have the freedom to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. We'll now go to Tatiana Palomarchuk, followed by Margarita Fiducia and then Tina De Los Santos. Hello, do you hear me? We can, go ahead. Um, okay, I'm Tatiana Palomarchuk, and hello, dear directors, leaders, families, and communities. And I'm so grateful for opportunity to share uh, my support uh, to Nova Start proposed charter. I'm a Ukrainian community member and the owner of a small school of music, Adagio. Um, I, I teach children, um, the beauty of music, piano and voice. And my students come from uh, many diverse uh, kind of family and, and they speak many languages. And a lot of parents are uh, looking for a strong academic program. And um, I just would like to refer them to Nova Start Academy and their program will prepare uh, will prepare the children for future. I know that program. I, 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 um, I kind of learned that what, what, what they're going to do and they will learn main subject and a lot more. What is important to us, um, like parents and family and teachers for our children to be ready for the uh, changing world and new jobs and Nova Star can do that. And please grant, um, I, I, it's my um, 15 request to you. Please grant the proposed um, Nova Star Charter approval. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Palomarchuk. Uh, Margarita Fiducia, Tina De Los Santos, Jose De Los Santos. Hello? We can hear can you. you hear Go me? ahead. Okay. Um, I'm speaking for um, on behalf of a uh, teacher. DCSD board, I am a long-time educator here in DCSD board majority. Tonight, I would like to address some of your kids' first campaign promises and ask you what exactly happened to them. In one YouTube campaign video, the message is given that kids first will seek to provide a culture where teachers feel valued, appreciated, respected, and heard. Unfortunately, it feels anything but that. Instead of coming to our schools, even when you are invited, you have shown that you'd rather attend political events. This has happened on multiple occasions. Some board members even spoke at an event at, in which a gubernatorial candidate made a homophobic comment. Shockingly, the board members in attendance at this event did not condemn the behavior. Some board rookies are affiliated with social media groups that completely undermine educators. In fact, the Kids First DCSD Facebook page is filled with comments like, if you're not happy here, move. Public education is garbage and teaching is not a real job. And another far-right Facebook group, which some of you are members of, the group admin called for the community to harass a teacher for having an inclusive sign posted in their classroom. These are hardly what I'd call statements and actions that make educators feel valued and respected. If you really do value and respect us, it is time to be, distance yourself from these groups and publicly call them out on their abhorrent 15 behavior. 15 seconds. And another YouTube campaign, a board rookie says, we have seen a lot of chaos in the boardroom. We will go the distance to reestablish trust. Unfortunately, that chaos has exponentially grown since you took over our board. Since you've been seated, we have seen overnight changes in policies that we had no time to prepare. Thank you, Ms. Fiducia.
Martina De Los Santos, Jose De Los Santos, followed by Ursula Kekos. Ms. De Los Santos. Good evening. If the majority board wants to retain outside counsel in the, in the case of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education, we in our home support that and we encourage them to identify Geisler Blue as lead counsel. The board's current legal representation is wholly inadequate in this matter and has already cost our district unnecessary time and money due to their incompetence. I encourage the board to appeal the Robert Marshall lawsuit and the preliminary injunction. Regardless of the misinformation put out by the other members of this board, the union and a few groupies, please remember the majority board directors violating Sunshine Laws is a false narrative. It is a straight up lie. Furthermore, the firing of Corey Wise was the right thing to do. I remember listening to him lie to me and parents about returning to schools without masks, lying to the school board and the public that schools were handling masking the same way. I personally wanted him replaced long before the election of the new board members. Director Meeks, you pontificate about preparing children for the workforce. Well, in corporate America, a CEO that does not carry out the direction of the board of directors is fired, and the unions do not get to dictate that. Thank you. 15 seconds. Thank you, Ms. De Los Santos, Jose De Los Santos, Ursula Cacos, Gretchen Brown. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, good evening, board. I'd like to address Mr. David Ray. <clears throat> Earlier this year, you stated from the dais that the public should hold you accountable while you were spewing lies about the new board members breaking the Sunshine Law. So let's talk about holding you accountable. A complaint was filed in February with the Department of Regulatory Agencies, and it was discovered you had been deceiving the public about being a registered psychotherapist. Your bosses, the parents, and taxpayers are demanding an explanation of your deceitfulness. This type of lie would get you fired in any corporate America. Since you lied about that, what else have you been lying about? Are you ready to admit that your handlers are the teachers unions? Are you ready to admit that you're trying to use the same playbook that was used in Jefferson County in partnership with the teachers union? Well, we are not Jeffco. We are Douglas County and we will not stand for this type of behavior. When you stated we should hold you accountable, was that another lie? I ask you to look in the mirror and hold yourself accountable to the wonderful teachers, the wonderful students, the wonderful staff there at Douglas County, and you are to set an example for them. So it's way past time to start telling the truth and shame the devil. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. De Los Santos, Ursula Kakos, Gretchen Brown, and then Liz Wagner, Ms. Kakos. Good evening. My comments this evening are in regards to agenda 26 and 27, approval of textbooks and novels. The books being considered for Douglas County should be focused on protecting parents' rights by providing their children with world-class education without the fear of indoctrination or exposure to dangerous or decisive concepts in our classrooms. Looking at the critical race books that have been banned in Florida due to inappropriate material, I wanna make sure our children are here for academic excellence, not to be social activists. I have been able to attend some of the equity board meetings here in Douglas County. I was very disturbed to find out one of the union leaders is taking up a community at large position on this board. I was also disappointed to see that the board is extremely left leaning. I don't see how this represents our community. With so many people on their board, there might be two to three conservatives that does not represent Douglas County. I send my child to school to be educated, not indoctrinated. I hope the board considers these books carefully and looks into them thoroughly, making sure these are pro-human choices before accepting these materials for our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kekos, Gretchen Brom, and then our last speaker this evening will be Liz Wagner. Ms. Brown, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead. Sorry, I can't hear you, but I'm gonna go ahead and speak. Good evening. Tonight I'm here to ask, what are you willing for DCSD to give up long-term in the future for something short-term in the present? 
Later this evening, you'll be taking a vote to approve lead counsel in your appeal on the judgment in the COML lawsuit. You've already been told that the district's insurance carrier will not pay for this lawsuit. They're in taking money directly out of the district's operating budget. Yet you continue forward with an appeal. I kept asking myself, what are the repercussions of doing so beyond the obvious short-term financial costs? It appears that the insurance company very likely denied coverage because they saw evidence of intentional misconduct with the conversations held prior to Corey Wise's termination. It is quite possible that they have deemed the four rookie directors a moral hazard, someone who makes more risky choices and takes certain actions with the assumption that their insurance will cover them. Interestingly, you seem to be proving that to be true since Gessler Blue has filed a motion for reconsideration earlier today before you have even taken a vote or received public comment on the topic of that firm being appointed lead counsel. The questions I now have are the following. Do you think your behavior showing that you could be considered a moral hazard will lead to non-renewal? If that happens, will the district then be considered uninsurable because other insurance carriers in the market have deemed DCSD an, un an entity unfit for coverage? All of this leads to the conclusion that if you continue seconds. with this pattern of decision-making, the district could be without insurance. They're in placing the financial burden of future lawsuits squarely on the taxpayer and district operating funds. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Last speaker this evening will be Liz Wagner. Is Ms. Wagner online? I am. Good evening. Um, just wanted to share uh, a little bit about the lawsuit that uh, was filed by former Douglas County School District Superintendent Corey Wise. And I just wanted to say, don't be fooled by the lawsuit. He alleges that he was fired for supporting protected classes. But my family is among many families in Douglas County that have come forward since the filing of his lawsuit who have experienced his actual lack of support for our protected classes of students with special needs. In my family's case, this was during his time as an executive director of schools where he was directly involved. For others, it was when he was principal at Legend High School. And perhaps most concerning are the parents who have come forward with how their student was discriminated against while he was both interim and permanent, permanent superintendent. These are students who are both in, protected, in a protected class based on race as well as disability. The emerging theme is that Mr. Wise is selective and inconsistent in his support. Um, for protected classes of students. While he was quite popular in the district among staff for families whose students he didn't protect, the trauma and harm from his actions and inactions will have lifelong impacts. Claiming he was terminated seconds. without cause because he supported protected classes is a headline grabbing attempt by his attorneys to extort money from the school district he claimed to be quote, all in for. It doesn't however mean it is true. And it certainly is not the experience of countless families of Thank you, Ms. Wagner. We will now move on to item number 13. You need a break? Okay. We are going to try to do consent agenda and then give the staff a break, but we will take a 10-minute break. It is 9.45. We will restart at 9.55. Thank you.
Um, back into session, we are now on item number 13, adoption of the consent agenda, specifically agenda items number 14 through 28. Do I have a motion concerning the consent agenda? I move that we adopt the consent agenda items 14 through 28. Have a motion by Ray. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, we will go with Meek. I think she beat the buzzer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will call the roll. Hanson. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero. Uh, before we move into adoption of the joint motion agenda, um, Superintendent Kane, if you have any members of cabinet that you do not believe are needed for the rest yeah. of the meeting, please feel free Thank to Thank you. I them. wanted to make sure we were ready for any changes to the consent agenda, but I would very much like to respectfully ask the staff to go home. <laughs> Mr. Blair, I'm sorry. I think you have to stay. And Please, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, there's a few that are required for Mary. and But the rest of you, please, please pack up and go home. So thank you so much for staying so late. I'm very, very grateful to all of you. Thank you for allowing me to do that, um, Board of Education. I'm, I really appreciate that. So. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item 16, the approval of minutes. And the recommendation is the Board of Education approve the board minutes as presented. Those are the minutes for March 2nd, 3rd, and 8th, uh, and March 8th. Do I have a motion concerning approval of minutes? I move we approve the minutes. Motion by Meek. Second. Second. I will give it to Williams this time. And I will call the roll. Hanson. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson, aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero. We are now into item number 30, which is our study policy revision. Uh, we will have any questions on the items, followed by any motions, discussion, and statements, and then a vote on each item. Uh, item number 30 is the proposed revision to board file JLCD, which is administering medicines to students. We did have a uh, earlier brief uh, on Narcan, and uh, the recommendation is to approve the revision to board file JLCD as written, which simply adds a uh, final part on the use of opiate antagonistics in emergency situations, uh, basically, allowing the district to maintain a supply of opiate antagonistics, Narcan, and others to assist students or staff who uh, may experience an opiate-related drug overdose. So any questions from any board members on the revision to policy JLCC before we entertain motions? I'm sorry, thank you, JLCD. Director Meek. Just to clarify, this is to approve the updates. It's not a first reading and then coming back to it later. Uh, this would be a singular reading followed by a vote for approval since it is not a new policy, but just a revision of a current policy per uh, current board policy on doing revisions. Yes. So if we were to count this as a first reading, would that delay the application or would we be able to apply with it pending? I believe we need to have a final approval for us to be able to apply. Other questions from other directors? I move that we accept the revisions to board file JLCD administering medications to students. Second. I have a motion by Ray, a second by Hansen. Barring any further discussion, I will call the roll. Hanson? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero. Now moving to item number 31, which is revision to board file BEAA, electronic Part participation <clears throat> in school board meetings. And the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the revision to BEAA electronic participation in school board meetings. Any questions on 
the revisions to BEAA as attached to this item. I have a question, Director Peterson. Yeah, go ahead, Director Weiniger. Um, so there's just one thing that I personally would want to revise in this policy, and it's the first paragraph on page two that begins with a board member may attend and participate by electronic means in a maximum of two board meetings per calendar year. And I just feel like in this day and age that putting a maximum on electronic participations is unnecessary. But I do agree that attending in person is better and when we're able to, we should. So I agree about keeping the parts about board president approval and board approval on there. Um, but I, just think it'd be best to scratch that entire paragraph regarding the two meeting maximums. But before I motioned for that, I was wanting to confirm with Council Clemish that it wouldn't um, go against the state law about attending three consecutive board meetings. Like in other words, you're still considered attending a board meeting even though you're remote. Oh, sorry. Council Clemish, if you like to comment, I believe the question from Director Weiniger is uh, electronic attendance does count as attendance in a board meeting and would not count towards uh, failure to attend three consecutive board meetings via uh, state law. Is that correct? Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Oh, I have it. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the question. Um, I think that I do want to avoid giving legal advice in open session of the board. Um, I do want to state that there is a provision in the school code which addresses participation in a school board meeting. And that provision is found at 22-32-108-7A and states that a board may adopt a policy authorizing board members to attend and participate in regular or special meetings electronically. At a minimum, the policy must ensure that a meeting at which one or more board members participate electronically is open to the public and that the members who participate electronically are included in the recording made in accordance with paragraph B of subsection five of this section. A member who participates electronically in conformance with the policy is considered present for purposes of other subsections of this section. Thank you, Council Klamesh. Uh, Director Weiniger, does that answer your questions? And I also see that CRS 2232-1087A is in fact referenced on this policy. Um, did that answer your question, Director Weiniger? Yes, it absolutely does. So I just um, would like to open it up if anyone has concerns on um, eliminating that paragraph. Um, if I may make a suggestion or a friendly amendment, I don't think there's a formal motion yet to amend on the, on the table, but I would not recommend eliminating the entire paragraph. I would at least keep the last sentence, which says, in accordance with state law, the board shall declare a vacancy et cetera, because it just does restate uh, state law around if a board member were to miss three consecutive meetings. I think that that should be stated in the board policy as state law. But if you make a motion to straight, strike everything prior to that, um, I think that's what you're, you would be asking for, because that's where it refers to a maximum number of meetings. Yes, that makes sense. Um, I just thought it might be confusing on stating that, like it's assuming that you're not participating in electronic. But if you don't think that it's confusing, maybe it's just me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Director Wright, did you have something? Um, we, we do have a different, we have a separate policy that talks about unexpired term fulfillment or vacancies. And I don't think that there's any reference that says that it it would be considered if someone were to participate remotely. So that we have a whole separate policy that focuses just on board vacancies. So I don't, I understand Director Weniger's concern, but I don't, I think our policy on vacancies would supersede this one uh, just because it defines it in more depth what that means, so. Okay, and in any case, we can't change Colorado law. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> right. um, whether we state it uh, for clarity's sake or whether we just rely on the law, um, 
I think either way would be appropriate. I also want to just, if I may, speak a little bit to the maximum. Um, there's also a clause in this paragraph that allows us to make exceptions, of course. So someone that maybe had a baby just recently, <laughs> uh, we might make an exception to say that that rule of two maximum is uh, over, um, that, we, that we would not hold that individual to that because of an exceptional reason like someone recovering from a pregnancy. So I think that's in that paragraph. I would also just say that um, having had a history with many different boards, we put that maximum in there for pretty intentionally uh, because there was a former board even before the last board that kind of abused the ability to call in uh, at certain times. And we really felt like that that uh, compromised the spirit of us being in a room together, having discussion, looking at each other eye to eye. And so that maximum really was there so that no one would abuse that to where they would only call in when there were certain votes that they wanted to um, participate in. So I would still advocate that we keep that there with the knowledge that we would certainly give someone grace or an exception if there was a circumstance that required more than missing more than two or doing remote more than twice. Yeah. Director Williams. I'm actually not opposed to um, doing what Director Ray says. I, I do think we need to make sure we make allowances for someone like Director Weiniger or if, you know, God forbid something else horrible happened and someone couldn't be here. Um, I guess my question is, does the entire board have to approve it? It doesn't really say. So I don't know if we can put something in there it's at the president's discretion or something so that we don't have to hold a meeting in order to approve um, someone taking additional uh, meetings off. But I do think it's a good safe hold to make sure people aren't just missing meetings. That, that, that would also be my comment is earlier on the first page, we allow the board president or in their absence, the vice president to consider the request, which can be fairly reactive. Some of these things come up same day of, you know, things like that. And there's a nice uh, safeguard in there subject to appeal by the board. So if you have a president who is weaponizing that and saying, no, you must attend, we can always appeal to the board in that case. However, uh, when we look at the paragraph that Director Weiniger referenced, because it says approved by the board, that may not be reactive, especially depending on how you read the temporary injunction we have, we would have to call a special meeting to have a meeting to have the board approve someone miss if they were already past the two. So that would be my concern, either we Strike and I could go either way. I could agree with Director Weiniger that we strike everything in a reference to a maximum of two and we just leave it up to the president and the board as a whole to uh, self regulate. And if we think someone is abusively constantly missing meetings, we just address that as a board. Or we could keep it in here, but I would say, unless otherwise approved and just strike by the board to not have the requirement to have to meet as a board to approve every electronic attendance above and beyond two. That would be my concern with a very strict reading. Director Ray. I think, the, I think the statute requires that we identify the maximum number of remote meetings allowed. Ms. Clemish, and I'm not, I don't have my book in front of me, but I thought we had that part of that was that you had to identify a quantity. Yeah. That, Again, it's not my intention to provide legal advice in a public session, but I can read the other provisions <laughs> of the statute. Thank you. Okay, so Section 7B provides that it is the intent of the General Assembly that a board that adopts a policy authorized in subsection 7A of this section to allow board members to attend and participate electronically in regular or special board meetings ensures that the policy Subsection Roman numeral one requires a quorum of the board, including members physically present and members attending electronically to convene a meeting. Roman numeral two allows members of the board to attend the meeting electronically only when there are extenuating circumstances as described in the policy. 
three leaves discretion to the board to decide the maximum number of board meetings that a member may attend electronically before the member's position is declared to be vacant. Four, requires the board to have technology in place that ensures that members of the public can hear the comments made by a board member who attends the meeting electronically and that the board member can hear comments made by the public. And five, clearly describes the methods by which a board member may attend a meeting electronically, which methods may include attendance via telephone, via video conferencing, or other electronic means. And six, requires the board to have a procedure in place to ensure that a board member who attends the meeting electronically has real-time access to any materials that are presented and available to members who are physically present at the meeting. So the, the provision uh, provides that at subsection 7, a, a 7B4, um, excuse me, 3, leaves discretion to the board to decide the maximum number of board meetings that a member may attend electronically before the member's position is declared to be vacant. Yeah, that, that's, thank you for that lovely reading. Um, <laughs> but that is a little different to hear it, that it's, it's really leading up to declaring that seat vacant. So that's a little different than what I understood. So I'm, I'm open to any recommendations regarding that. Do we have any recommendations from any directors on how to address that in this policy? Director Meek. I mean, I'm, f I'm fine either way we want to go, but I, I kind of like the idea of leaving two in there because it gives the impression that we really are encouraging you to be here and then um, allowing for those opportunities to excuse others when needed. So keeping a number in there, I feel like, encourages participation. Okay, I, I, I agree with that. Like I said, I could go either way. My only suggested change would be the second uh, sentence of that paragraph that Director Weininger referred to and just keep it as unless otherwise approved additional quests uh, to attend uh, will be denied. And that just refers back to our two means of approval on the front page, which would be either the president could approve or if there's a disagreement with the president's decision, you could appeal that ability to uh, to uh, attend electronically to the larger board, which could then approve it. So that would prevent presidential abuse of certain members. So that would be my only recommendation so we don't get stuck with after two having to meet every time for someone um, to attend electronically as a board. Any other questions or discussion before we entertain motions? Okay, seeing none, do we have any motions regarding um, file BEAA as submitted? I make a motion that we accept the revisions to board file BEAA with the additional revision of striking the three words on next to the last paragraph by the board. Okay, we have a motion by Ray to accept as written with the amendment to strike the three words in the penultimate paragraph of by the board. Second. We have a second by uh, Williams. If there are no other motions, I will uh, call the roll and this is to accept uh, revision to board file BEAA mm -hmm as motioned, so as presented, mi minus the three words by the board. Director Hansen? Aye. Director Meek? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Williams? Aye. Director Weiniger? Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero, and we will now move to item 32, which is resolution uh, identifying Lee Council in the matter of Robert Marshall v. Douglas County Board of Education et al. Case number 2022CV30071 and the recommendation 
is that the Board of Education modify the proposed resolution to identify the lead counsel in the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education et al. And we will start with any questions on the resolution as presented. <laughs> you have questions. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Director Ray. So I, so I, like our, some of our public commenters, I was surprised to see that we ruled or that we entered something into court yesterday or that Gessler Blue entered. And so I guess I need some clarification. I know we have to be careful um, with, with whether we can have this discussion in public or not. But I, I guess what will help me understand is how that happened um, without the board being informed. And it does, unfortunately, take on the appearance that Blue Gessler is already taking the lead on this case to, to actually um, submit that. Um, so my question is, how did that happen? Why did it happen? And was, is the assumption that they are already taking the lead on this case? Yeah, I, I think I can address that. We as a board, when we passed the re last resolution regarding the Marshall uh, v. DCSD et al. case, uh, had two parts of that previous resolution. And the first one um, was to file an extension, or it was called an enlargement of time in the resolution. And then the second resolution right below that was, and if the enlargement was granted, to file the motion that was filed earlier today, uh, look, uh, requesting reconsideration and or clarification. And it went further on to state in that resolution uh, and also to uh, consider a consent degree was the terms that we used in that resolution. So we as a board, in a previous resolution directed legal counsel, and it did not specify the name of Holland Evans or Gessler Blue, it just directed legal counsel in the case to file that motion, which was filed today. So we actually took that action as a board. My understanding is that uh, one or the other, and that the two councils have been talking with each other to coordinate things. It could have just as easily been filed by Hall and Evans. Obviously, both councils would not file the motion. At least that's my understanding. So um, pursuant to that, because we have two councils and this exact type of thing comes up, who does the file, who's, you know, whose name appears here, um, it has been requested or suggested that we should at least name a lead counsel. So going forward, um, if there's a disagreement or coordination needs to take place, we know which council has primacy. So that uh, hopefully that answered your question, Director Ray. Mostly, um, and I concur that the resolution did give uh, some latitude for our legal counsel to do that. Um, what's disturbing for me is that I find out about this from a community member who texts me. And so as we're trying to decide who is the correct counsel to take the lead, quite honestly, this leaves an impression on me when there's no communication to us as board directors to say, you know what I'm doing today is I'm going to file this uh, in, in the court. So. Um, I, I, that helps to understand that there was some conversation between our legal counsels, but it also, for me, as I'm deciding who should take the lead, it kind of, um, to me, leaves a negative taste in my mouth to think that this was done, and the way I find out about it is a community member who texts me. And, and, I, and I, I think that's been the concern all along that we've had is this whole communication issue is just so wonky. And I, and I agree, uh, Director Peterson, that certainly it's a reflection when you have two legal counsels and you don't have a lead designated. But you know we, we've had this concern day one that some uh, board directors are getting information, other board directors are not. Um, and, and so for me, as we're thinking about who should be lead counsel, I just need to have some kind of um, 
guarantee that the communication is going to improve tremendously. Because right now, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not impressed with either, quite honestly, because I feel like we've been let down uh, on a couple occasions. So, um, it, And I recall thoughts. previous remarks uh, by Director Hansen about the lack of communication on items. And that is something I, as board president, when I have had a chance to talk, with both Holland Evans and Gessler Blue, I have uh, stressed that they represent the board and that when there is events or, uh, or even engagement, when a board member reaches out to them and asks them a formal legal question, that that should be reported in a somewhat timely manner, you know, in a day or so, whatever, depending on the item, that they should report that out to the whole board. So I agree with you, Director Ray, which either, which either council is named in here, I would think the board, and I could put this out formally to whoever's named, there is an expectation for timely communication on things that are occurring in the case, things that are proposed, recommendations, and uh, I believe later today, if we vote to go into executive session, we will get some updates and recommendations that are appropriate for executive session. But outside of executive session, updates, and they can be privileged attorney client information to all the board members should occur at a regular basis. I would expect that out of any council that we would name uh, for, you know, as the lead council or any council, frankly, that's retained, whether they're the lead council or not, if they are taking action, they should be reporting it to the board. So I actually couldn't agree more. And I know Director Hansen has indicated similar comments earlier. Director Meek. I'm pretty sure you stated that at the last meeting, yes. that we would get that kind of communication. So I think that's what's troubling, is that that was asked prior. And yet something was filed yesterday, and we had no knowledge of that. So I'm, I'm curious, do any board mem did any board members receive any email or any phone call or communication about something being filed? The information I had when I uh, talked with Mr. Um, Mr. Blue, I want to make sure I get the right one there, um, I asked if the motion would be filed in accordance with the time, and I was told it would be filed prior to the deadline granted with the extension. I did not get either notification that it in fact had been filed. Uh, I was just, uh, I just asked, will you be filing it per the previous resolution in accordance with the deadline? And I was told they would, but I did not actually get confirmation that it in fact had been filed at this point. So you were just in conversations that it was underway, like it was being processed, as yep. was discussed in the resolution. Correct. So just I'm just curious what we do to address the communication issue, because I feel like we've asked, mm -hmm. we've talked about it every time, and yet we're still not receiving communication. So I think as a board, we need to figure out how to ensure that that happens. <clears throat> Any thoughts? Well, I, I'll just say I'm a little uh, bothered because at that meeting when we were drafting or we were accepting the retention engagement with Guess or Blue, I brought that up. I said we need to have something in that retention agreement that says just exactly how what you described, Director Peterson, that timely communication whenever anyone talks to the legal counsel should be provided as soon as possible. But that was not... Um, friendly amended into that agreement. But I think that's where it is, because that's how we hold our legal counsel um, accountable, is when it's written into the actual agreement that we sign off on. And so I, th I think we would immediately need to maybe revise that to include some kind of statement that says exactly what you just said, Director Peterson, that the expectation is communication, written communication, as soon as any board director is, is having conversation. I mean, including, I mean, Director Pearson, you said that you had had that phone call or whatnot just to clarify the timeline. That should have been put in writing, and that should have been sent to all of us. Had a phone call with Director Peterson, and here's what we discussed. You know, and so I think in the absence of that being in that agreement, um, I, I don't know how else we get at that. Uh, because you're right, we've asked for it, and it didn't happen again. So. Good, Director ask, Myers. Can I ask a question then? Since none of us received anything, but you got a text? Yeah, I got it. 
I got a text from a community member who saw that it had been filed in the court. Oh. They said, did okay. you know this? I'm like, no, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> Director Williams. I actually don't disagree. I, I had no idea it was being filed. At, I learned actually uh, today. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's important that we're all kept apprised of any decisions that are being made. Um, I, I, I'm not opposed to adding it into the contract, but that's not what, I mean, we can do tonight. We can certainly put it on an agenda moving forward, but right now we are where we are with what, what we're talking about, which is not changing the contract. I'm not opposed to that, however. Director Hanson. Um, Mr. Gessler, I'm assuming, is sitting in, no? Mr. Blue <laughs> is sitting here today in the boardroom. Um, their firm filed the um, motion to reconsider yesterday. Um, I can clearly see where this is going. I don't see anyone from Hall and Evans. Um, what I would like clarification on is what happens to Hall and Evans and what will their role be in this after Gessler Blue is designated as the lead counsel. Um, I am significantly concerned about the financial aspect of this. Um, I also think it's important just to correct some misinformation that's been shared um, through board correspondence. Lot, I am not frustrated. There's a lot to learn. I just want to correct. Um, there is not an adequate board budget for litigation. Um, in our board budget, I believe it's about $6,500 that we have um, allocated for legal fees, and that would be for um, the times when we need to have an attorney come in and advise us on um, a policy or something that would be outside the scope of um, what our in-house counsel could provide. The $6,000 is certainly inadequate to provide for an entire lawsuit. Um, so I just want to make sure we are being cost effective and being very, very aware of our fiscal responsibilities. So what happens to Holland Evans? <laughs> Yeah, this resolution, as I read it, just has two councils, at least for now, we would have to admit, or you could amend that, um, but it has two councils. Part of the reason to appoint a lead council is to shore deconfliction that we are not having two sets of attorneys work on the same action at the same time. And my understanding, and, and it's not just an understanding, I know that Hall and Evans and Gessler Blue have very comparable rates. One is not well in excess of the other. So as long as they are not working on similar issues, thus appointing a lead counsel, uh, it would not be any additional cost to have two sets of attorneys, three sets of attorneys, one set of attorney, as long as they were charging similar rates and not working on the same issues. What is the benefit of having two law firms if um, they're not working on the, I guess I'm just confused why we need two law firms for this. And to be totally honest, I've been really hard on Holland Evans and over the last um, month, I have been genuinely appreciative and grateful for the increased communication that we have received. I have felt very much in the loop. Um, so part of me is <laughs> concerned, <laughs> where, where are they going? They are who is communicating with us right now. Um, but there's no way to have two law firms involved in this and not have an increase in fees. They, they have to communicate and um, an attorney picks up the phone and they turn on their timer, fact of life. Um, it, there's no way that we are not going to have increased fees by having two law firms on this case. Okay, other director comments or questions? Um, just a comment on the budget, if I may, Director Peterson. Go, go ahead, Director Weininger. I believe that the both lawyer, attorney fees would hit the um, legal department budget, not the BOE budget, because I think that's just when we seek outside counsel outside of a lawsuit, but I just want to confirm that so it doesn't have misinformation, because that's my belief, but I could be wrong. Yeah, that at, is. At, the, at the present time, the legal department has set aside um, a budget for outside counsel legal spend relating to litigation, which has been brought against the district as well as the Board of Education. And so it is within our budget that we take care of expenses for outside counsel. It, 
outside of the board budget for clarification, correct? It is within the legal department's budget, okay, thank correct. You. Director Williams. So just a, f a follow-up question to you, Director Hansen. So then is it re your recommendation to take one or the other off of this resolution to only have one? Um, like I said, I'm conflicted because Holland Evans has actually done a great job of communicating with us over the last month, and I've greatly appreciated that, and I feel like I'm in this limbo um, because I mean, something was filed without the board even knowing, and um, it's pretty common practice to have someone review a document before it's filed with the court or at least have a heads up as a client. Um, I like that communication aspect, but I'm very conflicted about the increased cost. I, I don't... Um, I do not see value in having two law firms. I also would like to have confirmation just to know that we didn't miss a deadline. However, this wasn't unexpected because we as a board did direct this particular motion. I would certainly be very surprised if anything else were done, but this was a specific uh, action and motion that we did direct as a board to tell our council to do this. So uh, I'm not concerned with the filing because we authorize it as a board. But again, I think the main issue that I'm hearing across the board is around frequency of, of communication going forward, regardless of, of who is retained uh, as a lead counsel or even retained as a firm. So do we have, before we entertain motions, do we have other suggestions here? I'm hearing a couple of options here. I'm hearing um, go through the resolution as written and insert a single name of either Holland Evans or Gessler Blue as a lead counsel, or I'm hearing a potential to modify the resolution to appoint as the sole counsel. That could be a simple change and we could retain one law firm in this matter to save funds for inner uh, council communication would be the other option. Um, I don't know if individual directors have preference on just naming a lead council or selecting one of the two councils which currently represent us going forward. We've seen, uh, final comments here by me, we've seen the performance of Hall and Evans both in the courtroom and in coordination with the board. Um, we have yet to see Gessler Blue's performance in the courtroom other than uh, you know, an administrative filing of a motion. So if there is a decision to be made as to uh, abilities as law firms, we may not have all that information at this time. That would be my only uh, thoughts on maintaining two sets of uh, councils for the time being until we go forward, but I could be persuaded otherwise. D Director Myers. Well, as I read through it, I just, whereas the board retained Hall and Evans to represent, so would we not therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education of the Douglas County School District that do we not now name a law firm? Am I wrong? I mean, would we not do that tonight, name the law firm? We have a couple options, Director okay. Myers. As, as presented, we would, if we named either of the current law firms, Holland Evans or Gessler Blue, if all we did was modify this document to say we name one of them as the law firm, it would be appoint them as a lead counsel. That would still maintain both firms under contract. Just one would be given the lead. Um, the other option that I just briefly mentioned is to modify this and you could change this that the law firm of blank insert here is hereby named as the sole counsel which would basically make them the lead counsel and it would basically be saying we no longer need the services of the other counsel if we modified it as such either option is on the table I guess I just read where it says, whereas the board retained Hall and Evans to represent it with the understanding that the board's insurance would pay. Then the next one is, whereas the board's insurance company has refused to pay. And we know with talking with Hall and Evans that they're, I, we, maybe I better not say that, uh, in executive meeting. And so then I guess it just reads like, and then we name our counselor. We name our lead. So I'd. I guess I'm not seeing anything that needs to be changed. But correct me, because you're the 
lawyer. <laughs> no, I, I was just trying to um, clarify why we needed to, because two costs. So if we more. name one, then are, does that still mean we still have two? Yeah, if, if, oh, okay. all we, if all we do is where it says enter law firm name, if we insert a singular name of either firm at that point, all we've done is made them the lead counsel, there will still be a secondary counsel. If you want a singular firm to represent you and not have another firm, then you would enter the name and modify or uh, amend the document to say, hereby appointed as the sole counsel to litigate. And we, the board, would basically be saying, we want a singular firm to represent us going forward. Director Meek. So I have so many reservations on so many levels, but you know, going with the sole attorney, should we ask Mr. Blue if there is a value to keeping the second um, firm on board because perhaps there's a reason that they might be needed? Like, I would hate to make a change without having conversations. I also, we have never even met with Gessler Blue attorneys um, as a board, so. Yeah, if, if we wish, we can go because that would be legal advice in my mind if we're asking one attorney, what do you believe the value is in this case? What we could do, we only have a board of education reports and then we have the option to adjourn and go into an executive session on the matter of Douglas County v. Marshall. And Mr. Blue is actually here to give us an update in executive session on things going on in that case. We could table this, go right to the Board of Education reports. We could enter executive session without adjourning. And then we could come out after that executive session and modify, vote, do whatever, and handle this resolution at this time if you think that would be a better sequence of things. I move that we, oh, I'm sorry. Yep. I'm, I move that we uh, amend the agenda to place this item um, after executive session, item number 36. Second. Motion by Ray, second by Meek. I will call the roll, and this is to amend the agenda to move item 32 after item 36 and take it up at that time. Uh, Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. No. Weiniger is a no. Motion is passed six to one to amend the agenda to place item number 32 after 36. At this point, I will move on to item number 33, President Reports. And I am very happy to announce that we will be conducting our Board of Education retreat on Tuesday, the 14th of June after, and, and I would really like to thank Secretary Sandy Marsh for multiple polls of all the attendees to finally arrive upon dates where we can get all seven directors, superintendent, and other folks uh, there. So Board of Education Retreat, thank you again, Mrs. Marsh. Um, Tuesday, the 14th of June, and we will get that uh, officially noticed prior, and I will work with the board members and the superintendent to lock in an agenda. That, that is a uh, roughly eight in the morning to four in the afternoon all day affair. Superintendent Kane, do you have any comments on the uh, board retreat? Um, it is all day, but I would like to make the suggestion that perhaps we consider having dinner together. You're all, all day plus <laughs> dinner. Hosting. <laughs> As a after event? Mm -hmm. Okay, we will attend, entertain that in the agenda and we'll see what availability and, and desire is. Uh, Board of Education study session is planned for 10 May. That'll be the next meeting. Agenda planning for the 10 May uh, school board study session is scheduled for 1130 on Thursday, the 28th of April. Uh, tomorrow evening, the 27th of April, there is an English language development celebration at the Legacy Campus at 6 p.m. 
uh, directors Meek, Myers, Ray, and myself will be in attendance, so consider, uh, and that has also already been noticed. So anyone that can come out and see the beautiful Legacy Campus and support our English language development uh, folks, that would be um, highly recommended. I'd like to personally thank the Fiscal Oversight Committee for their work and recommendations on the bond refunding issue. I know a lot of work went in, both by our consultants Hilltop and uh, really appreciate the work uh, that the FOC put in and um, their ability to offer alternate points of view, very much recommended for such a critical issue to the board. And then my final comment is to thank Gordon Mosher, Christian Schmidt, and all the members of the charter application review team. Uh, the board decision on the three charters that were briefed tonight, Novastar, Lehman, and STEM is to occur at the 7 June meeting, uh, again, as briefed earlier tonight, following the CART and cabinet recommendations. So thank them for the work they've done so far and their future work getting <coughs> recommendations to both the cabinet and the board. With that, uh, we're on to item number 34, Vice President items for Vice President Williams. Uh, so everyone had the opportunity to listen to MBEC today, so I don't need to go into great detail about that, but they do some awesome work and I'm super appreciative. Um, the other thing is Director Myers and I had the opportunity and privilege to attend the Girls and Women's in Sports Luncheon on Monday, um, where Douglas County um, honored a lot of, of girls in sports, both students and then also coaches, um, that are retired and, and have, have moved on, but have inspired a lot of, of girls and athletes in, in the district. So huge shout out to all those um, girls that got the awards. That's all I have. Okay, I'll open it up to other directors for their comments and uh, committee and liaison reports. We'll start with Director Meek and come this way. Sure. <clears throat> so we had a DAC meeting. Um, when was that? Last week, I see. I think it was last week. Trying to remember. Um, Superintendent Kane was there and everyone really appreciated um, hearing her remarks and having an opportunity to chat with her. Um, after she left, uh, we did our board reports and then there was, there was a bit of conversation on the, the media issue with the fair organization. So I appreciate that we had uh, representatives here tonight speaking to that, trying to address the comments and kind of walk back the statement that was made in their post that said, if you or someone you know would like to have a conversation with the teacher or school regarding this, then we can send you more. So I think that was the statement that really made people feel uncomfortable on social media. And so um, I did talk with um, Superintendent Kane about this and I think it is really important that we clarify our policy and make sure people understand. If anyone has a concern with a teacher, the process is to go directly to the teacher and the school directly, and that is the right way to address it. So I think it's really important that we emphasize that and make sure that everyone is following that policy. Um, otherwise, I do think we're creating an, an an environment of intimidation and fear and you know reporting on other people and I think that's absolutely the wrong thing that we should be doing as we're talking about trying to bring our community together. So Dak talked about that for a while and I'm happy you know we've clarified that some. Um, one other thing with DAC, uh, they are looking to incorporate student voice on DAC. And so they were asking uh, Director Myers and myself, you know, to weigh in with our thoughts, but I thought I would bring it to the board to get everyone's opinions on this. I know long range planning has a student voice and some of the other board committees have student voice and there's different ways to go about it with asking for a student advisory group. Um, I was saying DAC, wasn't I? Yeah, yeah sorry, mm -hmm. student. Student advisory, so student voice. Um, so I wasn't sure if anyone would oppose adding student voice to DAC, but I think there's just different ways to go about it. And I don't know if anyone has their own opinions that they'd want to share on that. Well, just a thought, Director Meek. 
Uh, no, I mean, I have no, I think that's, the more student voice we can have, the better, absolutely. I think one of the things I'm concerned about, though, is that we're over taxing student advisory group by always using them as kind of our launching pad to say who wants to volunteer. I mean, Josh Ladima, who is on MBEC, I mean, he kind of got the short straw because nobody else volunteered. And bless his heart, he's a senior. You know, he's, he's so busy, but just an incredible young man. So, I, so if we could figure out a different way to recruit students than just through SAG, um, and I think we'd also be able to, ta you know, to, to actually bring in some other diverse voices because uh, SAG tends to be kind of the cream of the crop at times, you know, the students that really are good students. And I'd sure like to see DAC even have some of those students that maybe, you know, aren't so thrilled about school sometimes because I think DAC needs to hear that voice as well. So I would just say if we can figure out a different way to... And that was things. a conversation topic that they were thinking as well. And so I don't know if Superintendent Kane might have ideas. On DAC, they do an application process for everyone else. So perhaps um, DAC would want to have an application process for their student representative. And, and they would go through and interview just like they would everyone else. It's just a thought. And the other idea was potentially having two student voices with maybe a two-year term, but you know there's almost a rotation that can happen. So anyway, um, we will get back to them, Director Myers and I, and just kind of help them brainstorm a little bit. But I totally agree with Director Ray. The more student voice, the better. Um, and then I guess the last thing I just wanted to bring up, you know, I, I feel like the tone during public comment feels like we are allowing intimidation and bullying and kind of a, an environment that we would never allow in a classroom. And I know it's a quarter to 11, we still have more on the agenda, but I would love for us to really think a little bit about what can we do to foster a more positive environment that is safe and welcoming and we don't have people being targeted and so that's something we've been challenged with for, for a while now. But I think as a board, it's up to us to set the tone and to try to figure this out. And if we are talking about going out for an MLO and bond and trying to bring our community together, we really need to be modeling that kind of environment. And so don't have answers, but I think it's something that we as a board should talk about and hopefully sooner rather than later. And I think that's something definitely we could talk about at the retreat. Because what we have a work session and, but you know, that's some things that you're exactly right, Susan. Yeah, I agree that may be a, a great retreat item to put on there. Um, and, and I'll wait and save my comments for that. I'm a, I know that some of it even borders on hateful. I mean, certainly the tone that it's delivered. I was almost, I was talking with Director Ray. I said I wasn't keeping score, but uh, I don't know who, who got targeted more this evening, him or him or me personally. Um, that being said, um, I think that's worthy of a discussion. The balance between free speech, even if it's disagreeable versus uh, an environment in, in trying to build trust. But I, I think that's a great discussion for the retreat. Uh, Director Myers. Yes, uh, so I was with Christy yesterday and uh, last night was a phenomenal uh, Douglas County Youth Initiative. 10 kids uh, were awarded $300 gift cards and they got to tell their story and whoever nominated them and just like Marcia said, uh, there's not a dry eye. So it was a I, I don't want to say it's a favorite committee because I like all my committees, but it was it was really nice. So that was great. Director Ray. Uh, no, I don't have any uh, things to report. We had student advisor group, and they're raring to go and looking forward to meeting with us at our work session. So I'm excited for you guys to, to get to see them in action. They're, they're just incredible 
uh, young people that are articulate and are passionate, and um, I can't wait for for them to have the opportunity to have us as an audience. One of the things I'm wondering about, though, um, I know uh, Director Williams and I kind of exchanged some emails around communicating uh, on behalf of MBEC um, and and how to get that done. And we heard them present tonight that that would be um, it would be helpful for us to think about an OPED um, that shows that, you know, that we're leading up to something that we all are passionate about and agree on. And, and so I, I don't know, I, I know that there's, there's some real caution in terms of how we proceed because of the injunction, you know, and I know Director Williams was concerned about timing as far as, um, you know, how do we do that because we need board approval if we all sign off on it. Um, but I, I think it would be appropriate for a couple of us to draft and send that draft to individual directors to get feedback. I don't think that that would be compromising uh, some of the concerns around um, open meeting law. But more importantly, I guess, I, I, I want us to think about what that message would be, because I'm a little uncomfortable with us going out in the paper and saying all seven of us support an MLO bond when we haven't actually taken formal action to put that on the ballot. So I guess, you know, I would really rely on MBEC to give us some ideas about what kind of message would be helpful. Is it is it just for us to describe the current fiscal circumstances of our district? Um, I know uh, a couple of, you know, when Superintendent Kane was interim Kane, uh, she did a lot of groundwork of just kind of saying, here's the current circumstance, here's the current financial circumstance in our district that kind of validated the need then to then say, oh, and you know what, we'll solve that, will be putting a bond and MLO on the ballot. So I'm kind of thinking that, that might be a message that we might consider is just to describe to our community uh, our current circumstance, um, as well as acknowledging the community for what they did for us in 2018. But I just wanted to put that out there in terms of process. Um, I think I just want to check to see if we're comfortable, if, if a couple of us kind of take the lead to do a draft, are you comfortable with that? Um, and then we send that off to you individually to give us individual feedback. Um, is that a process you're comfortable with or do you feel like that that is compromising the injunction message that you've heard? Um, so that's, I'm just playing that out there yeah. for consideration. <laughs> If there were not an injunction, I would say that's exactly how we should operate is get two people that want to take a lead on something, throw something out there, kick it to the other board members, individual thoughts back to whoever's assigned the lead. Um, I'll have to maybe confer outside of this forum if that is in, in compliance or not. That being said, we certainly know that Two individual members can get together and talk on any one subject that has never been uh, in doubt, even with the injunction in there. Um, and it may just be something where two directors that are inclined get together and present something and we can attach it and discuss it in a uh, at the next meeting and just have an open discussion. Um, Director Williams. So I think we can do both. Um, I think that we can have two members write something sooner than later so that we can just show where the two of us individually are. Um, and then again, once perhaps we choose to vote or not vote for one moving forward um, on the November ballot and, and then do an all seven, let's, let's vote and put something out there. But I know that MBEC really wants to see unity on on this board around the MLO and the bond potential. So there, what they said was, why would we support something like this if that's what we chose to do and what are the needs of the district currently? And they felt like we should do it sooner than later. So waiting another two weeks, um, I, I just feel like we can do something sooner and then do something again later, so. I know that back in 2018, we had a lot of 
strategizing with communication and really kind of pacing out, you know, what's the message we want to convey now? What's the message we want to convey next? What's the message we want to convey once the resolution of the board says, let's put it on the ballot? So I, I think part of me feels like we need to rely on the experts to give us that skeleton or the communication people. And, and I don't know if there's plans to bring on more communication support for our department to, around this issue. Um, but I, I'd also hate for us to be too far ahead of the game in, in making statements that maybe look like we've already uh, made up our mind before MBEC gives us the final report in June. So I, I just think timing and the message is gonna be really critical. Uh, Superintendent Kane, if you have any comments on the communication or yeah. allocation of folks to support. A couple of things. Um, that framework that you experienced in 2018 is what has been set up over the last three weeks. So um, we're actually really, really far along with that um, to include all the pieces like uh, one pager and all of those things. Um, so that, that framework is underway. I, for what it is worth, I'm a little out of my lane here, but I was in that MBEC meeting where the suggestion was made and my understanding of the suggestion was that the important piece of the messaging that MBEC was desiring was something along the lines of our district has very real needs and um, you know we'd like to set aside our differences to pursue our district's needs together. I think that was a little bit what MBEC was looking for. And again, I'm, I'm out of my lane. I'm only speaking as a witness to that meeting. Um, but on the communication side, actually I do want to address the second question you asked, Director Ray. Um, we are getting more communication support because it has been for the last three weeks, it's just been Stacy and I, and she has a whole other job too. So um, she is uh, filling it a position that has been open and someone starts, I believe next week, which will be really helpful. And then um, you saw in our org chart that we're finally filling a position that has been in the superintendent's budget for a couple of years. So those two um, pieces should really be able to help us facilitate the outreach effort that, that you experienced in 2018. Yeah, and I would just reiterate that I would love, I mean, I would love for, if, if it's possible for communications to write a skeletal framework for that very message, you know, and, and two of us then personalize it with putting a board perspective to it. Um, but I think staff has a better understanding of the critical talking points of what is it that we need, which is what you just said. And I, and I think that'd be the message that I wanna, would wanna do sooner than later is validate the need first, and then we can message more about the MLO and bond afterwards. But um, so yeah. So, so if I understood you correctly this time, sorry, I missed it a minute ago. Um, are you asking if staff can maybe draft something and then hand it off to, to, to the two board members that are interested to go personalize and do whatever they would like to do, because we would be happy to do that yeah. if that's the case. I, just, I mean, that's what I think just- it's fine, you know, happy to, uh, okay. to get all the numbers right and all the stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and just as one guardrail, as long as it has nothing around decisions, we, we do not want to be making any mm -mm. decisions or yeah. inferring any decisions or positions that the board may or may not take in the future. If it's around need and intent and to collaborate and message okay. of cooperation, I think that is uh, would be allowable because it would not be inferring any future policy decision the board may or may not make. We would be happy to draft something to get you started. I think CFO Kataska certainly has a lot of those talking points because she's yeah. unfolded the story for yeah. us, you know, for several months now. So I just think capturing that summary of the talking points of how we validate the need would be what I would want to see. Thank you. We have it all. Director Williams. So does that mean you're going to co-author with me, <laughs> Director Ray? <laughs> uh, sure, okay, Director Williams, you. as long as you bring the talk that I will do whatever you want me to do. That is part of the official record. Um, thank you. Director Hansen. Yeah, I was just going to ask Superintendent Kane. I believe you mentioned earlier that a date had been set for a community training or committee. Um, I have foundation on Thursday morning, and I um, am certain that there would be some individuals that are a member of foundation who would like to attend that. I was just hoping I could get that. Yes, let me have um, Chief Communications Officer Raider 
send that to the foundation board as well. They they would certainly fall into that category. Um, we, we did set a date an evening next week, um, and we will also record it for members who can't make it. Um, so yes, thank you. We will do that. Thanks. Any other committee or liaison reports, Director Hanson? Okay, at this point, um, I'd like to take up item number 36, knowing Director that we- Director Peterson. I'm sorry, oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Go ahead, Director Weininger, thank you. <laughs> we had to complete going around the, uh, the, the room here. I know, sorry, I'm missing, so I threw it off. Um, I just wanted to talk about how the, I asked the FOC to write a memo about the bond refunding resolution. Um, overall, the FOC gave their go ahead as it starts the motion in refunding, which they agree is needed. Um, and going forward, they do have a strong desire to put in a district bond policy. And some reasons they gave in their memo, I'll just read them off, are one, parameters establishing district bond redemption fund levels, two, debt service tax levies that generate excess debt service funding, three, refunding bond language on annual payment limits and total payment limits, and four guidelines around when refunding will be considered. And um, I actually think a bond policy is a great idea. It's recommended by the Colorado Department of Education. It'll help provide structured and agreed upon guidance and processes um, when we want a future bond and on our current bonds. And so unless there's some objection from other board directors, I'd love to have the FOC um, start drafting that along with staff. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I wasn't out of my lane and um, the rest of the board felt like that was a good idea as well. Just to understand that you're asking if you could have them start drafting a policy, which of course would be presented to the board to become a board policy, to be approved by the board. Is that the intent? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion by other board members on that recommendation? Director Ray. Go ahead. Director, I think Sorry, Director, Director Meek, go ahead. Smiling first. <laughs> yeah, I just wasn't sure if that's a board policy or an administrative policy, like a superintendent's policy. I believe it's a board policy. I will double check on that, though. Yeah, or we could certainly take a recommendation from the FOC on whether it should be a district superintendent policy or whether it should be a board policy. But that that's... That's a good question. Other comments, questions for other directors? I was, I was gonna ask something similar because I think it could be a regulatory policy from one of our policies in the D section, which deals with all the fiscal policies. Um, and then also it might, we, we should probably take an opportunity to look at CASB model policies to see if there's something that might uh, line up and match to what Director Weiniger is suggesting that we need to have in place. So. Um, I similar question and but no opposition to move forward with looking at a policy like that. Any other directors have any reservations? Okay. Thank oh, sorry, Director Meek, go ahead. So not to belabor the point, I just think it probably is something that falls within the superintendent's realm. And if that's the case, I, it's really not our it's not our responsibility. So perhaps if I can, if, if staff can help support you by doing a little research um, around this issue and, and if it is typically something that is expressed in a superintendent policy versus a board policy um, and get back to you all on that. And then if it is indeed typically a superintendent policy, we can work that internally. And if it is indeed a board policy, you guys can proceed with your process does that sound reasonable that, that for us sounds to support re that sounds reasonable and the foc being a board committee we could ask them to support even if it is a superintendent policy with their recommendations so either either way but we appreciate the clarification first okay thank you okay any other liaison committee issues okay and then we will move on <clears throat> excuse me to number 36 which is convene in executive session. The recommendation is that the Board of Education convene in executive session, a closed session, for purpose of conferring with the district's attorneys to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS 
246402-4B regarding pending litigation in the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education at L. Douglas County District Court Case Number 2022-CV30071. The requested members would be all directors, all excuse me, all board directors, uh, including Director Weininger virtually, Superintendent Kane, and Jeff Blue from Gessler Blue. Do I have a motion to enter executive session, session for the reasons stated? I move we convene an executive session. Motion by Myers. Second. Second by Ray. I'll now take the call needing two thirds to enter executive session. Hanson. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed by a vote of seven to zero. We will now proceed to executive session. Uh, following executive session, and I do apologize to Mr. Player and staff, we will reconvene to take up item number 32, the resolution naming uh, lead counsel, and then our last item would be adjournment. But we do need to come out of executive session as we can take no action in executive session on the resolution. Uh, we are hereby moving to executive session.
come out of executive session. We will now take up item number 32 from the amended agenda. Item number 32 is, excuse me, the resolution identifying lead counsel in the matter of Robert Marshall versus Douglas County Board of Education. And the recommendation uh, is to uh, approve the resolution as presented. Uh, we had previous discussion. We will now open it up for additional discussion before entertaining any motions. Um, without going into uh, details of executive session, um, I personally believe it would be in the interest of the FISC, as cited in the resolution, uh, to name a singular council uh, in this matter to even avoid coordination um, uh, charges where we have to have attorneys confer with each other. Um, so I would be happy to entertain a motion or make a motion uh, to modify the resolution to name a singular law firm uh, and not appoint as lead counsel, but is to, to appoint them as a singular counsel in the litigation on behalf of the board. Any questions or comments from other directors? I will make a motion that we accept the resolution with the following modification. In the last statement, therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education of the Douglas County School District, RU1, that the law firm of Gessler Blue, specifically attorney Jeff Blue as point person, is hereby appointed as the sole counsel to litigate the lawsuit on behalf of the board. He's writing. Sorry, um, go ahead, uh, Director Williams. So I, I don't think we can say specifically Jeff Blue. I think we just have to say the, the law firm's name, Gessler Blue. I would ask you the question why. Well, because I, I, they're, they're a firm. <laughs> and I put the firm in there, but specifically, I think we want to note that our expectation is that Jeff Blue be the appointed attorney. And, 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 I have some, and I have some editorials around that, why I feel strongly about that. Be, before we do, if I may, and I can just indicate to anyone listening, uh, Mr. Blue, since you are present in the audience, um, if we appointed as recommended in the motion, uh, the law firm of Gessler Blue LLC would you, in fact, be the sole attorney representing us in this matter if we did so? And could we name you as such? I'm just, basically, I'm asking, would you be our sole representation um, from the firm? Well, no. Um, I wouldn't be the sole representation from the firm. We work together on everything, almost everything, I should say, because um, there are always cases that we don't work together. Most of the time, we work in a way that one person runs the case and the other person is support. Um, overflow, um, proofreading, you know, bouncing ideas off of. I mean, that's one of the benefits of having a firm is that you can do those kinds of things. Um, so saying that I am the sole attorney would not be an accurate description and frankly would hamstring my representation of you guys because it would indicate that, he, that my partner couldn't even participate. So it, it let me, let me repeat my words to check with you. My, my words wasn't that you'd be the sole I, attorney. It was that you'd be the point person. And, and I feel like that is an accurate okay. representation because all things would go through you. It, Regardless of whether you work with your other colleagues, that you're our point person and that no other person would, would serve as that point person. It, that, that is fine. The, what, what made me nervous was after there, you also then said as sole counsel or something. And, and while that, I, I know your intent was to say the firm was sole counsel. Gotcha. The, 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 it could get mo the modification could be misconstrued. Yeah, may, may I offer a friendly amendment mm -hmm. uh, that we modify or amend the resolution 
Therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education of the Douglas County School District RE1 that the law firm of Gessler Blue LLC is hereby appointed as the sole counsel to litigate the lawsuit on behalf of the board and specifically Jeff Blue be named as the primary point of contact for the board. Does that separate those and distinguish? Right. That works just fine for me. I accept the amendment as well. Because that's frankly how it's happening anyway. Yeah. We just described it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Thank Blue. You. Um, we have a the motion as uh, the, with the friendly amendment by Ray. We have a second by Hansen. And unless there is further discussion, I will call the roll. Uh, and this would be to pass the uh, resolution as written with the friendly amendment uh, made by Hansen and modified by myself. Uh, Hans, uh, Director Hansen. Um, just a quick comment. I was trying to decide whether to say anything or not at 1215, but um, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. It made all of the difference in the world. It was wonderful to get to know you. I found Mr. Blue to be um, very rational, very um, uh, practical, uh, very up to speed on the issues, and feel very comfortable um, with this being in his hands. And so I would like to vote aye. Aye from Hanson, Director Meek. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Uh, Director Peterson, and before I vote, I would like to thank Mr. Blue for coming in person rather than attending virtually. I think that was absolutely essential to meeting and, and being able to discuss in person with the board. Uh, and I definitely appreciate his attendance at now 12, 13 in the morning. And without going any further, I will vote aye. Director Ray. And I would just comment that I want to thank fellow board directors um, for allowing us to have a sole legal counsel. And I want our public to hear loud and clear that that really is, um, in our belief, to be fiscally responsible. So I want to just say thank you, uh, board directors, for willing, being willing to do that. And my vote is an aye. And thank you for your comments, Director Ray is an aye. Director Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. The motion is passed as amended on a vote of seven to zero. I will now move on to item number 37. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> I am going to go with Ray, and because I stole it from Director Myers, I will give you the second okay. earlier from earlier. Director Hansen. Aye. Meek. Aye. Myers. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Ray. Aye. Williams. Aye. Director Weiniger. Aye. <laughs> Passed seven to zero. The meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>